Well, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, boy, that, that's an interesting introduction. You know, I, I have a couple questions. I this is research, okay? Uh, how many of you are like Gons that you before today, or even? We'll give it a little history. How many of you have heard of me before today, or maybe before? Let, let's just see today. Okay, that's pretty much everybody. Okay, how about? the last couple months. Okay. At least a year. <laughs> See, there, there, there's your research for you. Anything you want to add to it? Because we, I mean, we're all, I'm, I'm always curious, you know, you know, who, this is the, I think the 10th one of these that I've done. So there's always a mixed crowd. This is probably the biggest concentration of people who've heard me in, in, in all of that I've done. And so we might, it, it just depends. You know, we might shift gears a little bit in terms of what I usually do. But since I always have sort of like a 50-50 mix, I end up going through a, a good bit of the book content, at least as much as you can do in a, in a couple hours, uh, the book Unseen Realm. And so the plan is typically, and if you saw the schedule for this one, it's, you know, this is why it is the way it is, at least up until this point. Um, trying to go through the book, hit the high points uh, in a few hours, and then leave at least an hour and a half for Q&A. That's kind of been the norm. Uh, we might be able to change a little bit of that up uh, and have more Q&A, but we'll, you know, we'll play it by ear. So the other thing that I, I like to ask, just out of curiosity, and, and since Gans brought it up, how many of you have read the novels as opposed to... Facade, okay, so at least one of them, all right. So that's, that's maybe half, creeping up a third of half, okay. That's a good, good representation, too. Um, my usual intro, therefore, I could just throw out the door. I usually warn people right about now. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to say, you know, will, will perhaps trouble you, rattle your cage, yada, yada, yada. Um, but I'm one of the good guys. We use our powers for, for good here and not, <laughs> not the power, not powers for evil. Um, one, of the, one of the white hats in Middle Earth, if you've heard Gons, is the, I, I got on this Middle Earth thing, you know, on his, <laughs> which I find really useful, actually. Um, but those of you, you know, since we have a, a lot of exposure here, you're, gonna, you're already going to know that a good bit of what we say here is not going to be the kind of thing you hear in church. And I view that, again, as a good thing, because I crossed the Rubicon years ago of no long, deciding. I, I actually remember, like, like, having this thought pop into my head. You know, Mike, because I, I had taught biblical studies on the undergrad level for a number of years, but I, I remember having the distinct thought, you need to stop protecting people from their Bible. And I said, yep, that's what, we're no longer going to do that. And that hurts, depending on what, depending on what group of people are sitting in front of me. <laughs> uh, there's there's a price to be paid for that, but it's a good price, at least in my experience. Um, but for a number of you, you've already sort of either by experience or you kind of you kind of already know that. So what I want to do here is I'm I'm going to go through some Old Testament stuff, and I'm going to go through quickly because we might be able to compress time or again switch gears. Don't freak out if you can't keep up with me in terms of slides. I will give you the slides. Email me, okay? Put something in the subject line, because I get lots of email. Put something in the subject line like, I heard you in San Juan Capistrano, or I was there, or I was a witness. <laughs> okay? I will send you the slides, so don't worry about that. Um, it's getting recorded. You'll have the audio. Okay, you should have everything you know you, you you need. What you should be doing is, you know, as you pay attention, and some of you probably already came with questions. Write them down. Okay, we will make an effort to get through all the questions uh, to the best of our ability as we go through. So, with that said, this is what I typically try to hit in the first you know session: divine counsel. Cosmic Mountain, 
cosmic rebellions, cosmic geography, they sort of go together. And again, if you're a reader of Unseen Realm, you already, you already have a, a good feel for what this is. Cosmic, another word for supernatural, again, the, the, the other world, not the world of men. Cosmic Mountain, again, we'll, we'll just go through real quickly when we get there. And the rebellions, I'm going to present this a little bit differently uh, than I have up to this point. But Divine Council, you already, again, are basically familiar with it. But in case we have some who aren't or who have wondered about it, I had Psalm 82 there as a reference point. Psalm 82, 1, again, is the key verse, and I'm not going to you know, rehearse sort of my epiphany on this. Again, if you've heard me on, on podcast or radio or read the book, you know that. But the, the, the thing to take away from this verse in Hebrew is that you have the word Elohim occur twice in the same verse, and it actually matters. A number of English translations will obscure this. So in the, in the course of what I'm going to go through, I want you to start thinking about Okay, how do we look at our Bible? What is the supernatural worldview? You're going to have counsel ideas. That is, that is, God is not alone in the animate spiritual world. Now, as Christians, we're used to hearing that. You know, oh, yeah, there's angels and demons out there and Satan. Yeah, okay, there is. But there's a whole lot more going on than that. And there are, there's some terminology that, are, that is used that describe, again, if you know, if you can sort of speak the language, uh, if you can look at what, what a verse says, again, and have the Israelite in your head, the ancient Near Eastern background in your head, it will telegraph certain ideas to you. So we're going to talk, talk about that. But God isn't alone. He works in, in a bureaucracy. And we're, we'll talk about, well, why does God need to do that? Short answer is he doesn't need that. Okay, that's just the way he does things. But you need to be thinking about what goes on in the spirit world, how an Israelite would look at it, not how someone who is a Reformed person, John Calvin or a modern evangelical. There's a disconnect there. And by virtue of that, there's going to be talk in the Bible about where God lives. And where God lives is where his counsel is because that's where he conducts business. And that is going to sort of bleed into what God intended with Eden. And that, of course, is going to morph into the problem of rebellion, both human and divine. So just that short list of things is what we're going to talk about. But it all sort of starts here. Because this is, the, this is a passage that lots of people read the Psalms. They've read this Psalm maybe 50 times. But you never kind of see what's going on because of English translations. So we have God has taken his place in the divine council. I've clicked on God here. I don't know if, if you can really see the, the shadow in here. Over on the, right, you Over on the right, you can see this column. Again, this is the word Elohim. Very common word for God, no big deal. This is an easy verse to translate. Elohim, Nitzah, Ba'adad El, God takes his stand or takes his place in the divine council. We know it's singular because this word here is a singular participle. Okay, grammar is actually important. I know most of you hate it or hated it. So I'm sorry for the grammar spasm, but it actually comes in handy with respect to biblical languages. We know the Elohim here is one person because of the verb, subject-verb agreement. You say, well, why is this controversial? Well, it's because of the next occurrence of Elohim. In the midst of the Elohim, Bekar of Elohim, Yishpot. In the midst of the Elohim, he, the first one, passes judgment or holds judgment. So we have God doing something that sounds like really important in the midst of other gods. Now, we have been trained as evangelicals reflexively when we see the, the, the words G-O-D-S or the letters G-O-D-S in our Bible, when the, the English translation doesn't put it in scare quotes, when it just leaves it alone, we, we're, we're trained to think, oh, idols, those are idols. And if you actually sort of drill down in, into some Bible study, you get into some sources like commentaries, oftentimes you will be told things like, oh, the gods, they're, they're, just, they're really just people. They're really just, you know, like, like human rulers, human elders, that kind of thing. Like the, the, if I had to, well, I might as well just stick it up here since I'm in the software. If we put the uh, <coughs> NASB here, God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. Well, thank you. Nothing to look at here, citizen. Move along. <laughs> you know, it, I mean, in, English translations tend to obscure things. Now, 
you know, look, look, you know, I, I'm an academic. I know the people who produce these translations. They're, they're not like evil, sinister beings, okay? They're, they're, they're not, you know, I mean, everybody's human, but the, the goal is never, you know, I'm going to go through my portion of the translation and obscure everything that I don't like. I mean, that, that, that's never the goal, you know, with, with translators. They're, they're good people. But yet there are passages where they get nervous because they think what they put will make you nervous. Okay, or their publisher nervous. <laughs> or the editorial committee that they hand off their work to nervous. Okay, this just happens. It is what it is. Um, but nevertheless, you don't, you, you don't get to look at sort of the inside baseball, you know, of what goes into this sort of thing. And this, this does happen. You will get translations that will obscure some fairly important things uh, for you. And this is sort of a you know, just a, a lockdown, you know, no-brainer kind of test case for that. If you keep reading through the passage, you know, God is angry with the gods for being corrupt. Let's just turn this off for a second. You know, how long are you going to essentially be wicked, you know, judge unjustly, so on and so forth? You know, you've really ruined things. Verse 6, I said, you are gods. So let's turn our inner linear back on. There it is again. You, all of you guys, you're Elohim. Sons, guess what? Again, this, now this you might want to write down. I'm going to make a few profound statements during the course of the day. This is probably the first one. Sons is plural. Okay. okay. That means there's more than one. Should I slow down? <laughs> okay. Sons is plural. So you can't cheat here. It's sons of the Most High. Okay, well, we know who the Most High is. That, that's, you know, that's not a brain teaser, all right? Sons of the Most High, you're Elohim, all of you. Again, I, there are translations that do a really, make, do a masterful job of kind of, you know, obscuring this kind of thing. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. So there's a point of contrast. He's not walking, he's not, he's not speaking to a bunch of Jewish elders that says, hey guys, someday like men you're going to die. Like, duh. You know, like, well, that's profound. We needed God to tell us that, like we couldn't figure that one out. Uh, again, if you're, if you're the New American Standard and you're doing this ruler thing, you're already, again, trying to skirt, you know, some of the things that are, that are quite evident in the text. This is the ESV. The ESV does a pretty good job here. It, you know, it, it does questionable things in other passages, but this is pretty straightforward. By the way, if you go back to a passage like the King James, King James will have gods. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a pretty literal translation. It doesn't, it doesn't mess around with it. So, you know, what do we have going on here? Again, this was the, kind of the fundamental question. And when I, I, I first actually, you know, it's, it's embarrassing to admit it, but I first actually looked at it in Hebrew while I was in graduate school. I mean, I should have done it before that. But again, that, that was sort of a jarring moment. And it became kind of this thing that I became obsessed with. You know, I, I have to resolve this riddle here. And so, you know, I, I'd been to a couple of years of seminary. I you know, had a strong, you know, Bible background in the evangelical tradition. So I went to the, the sources that I knew about. And I was really dissatisfied because so many of them cheated. So many of them would say things like, well, these are just the, the, the Jewish rulers. Well. You know, that, that was sort of, okay, I, I guess I'll put that on the table. That's a possibility, even though lots of other people I'm reading who were not evangelical were like, this is a no-brainer. These are the gods of, of the assemblies, of the councils. Everybody has one of these. Everybody has this conception of an, of an active, animate, spiritual world that involved other gods. But then the, the, the critics would use that to argue that, oh, the Israelites were polytheistic in the beginning, just like everybody else. And then all of a sudden they figured monotheism out, and boom, you know, there you go. And that, I, I came to real, realize pretty quickly, was based on a lot of circular reasoning. And it actually became, a critique of that actually became my dissertation, which was really interesting. I was at an ultra-liberal school, Wisconsin. I had a Jewish advisor who bought all of it. And I was, I was the little evangelical twerp, you know, like trying to get through the graduate program. And I had to pick this really, you know, this thing where I'm saying, you know, I don't, I don't buy what any of you people are saying, you know, because this is just ridiculous. But to his credit, he let me do it. And you know, I, I, have, I have some great stories about 
him and me, you know, through the, through the graduate program. But I have to give credit where credit's due. But I was quite dissatisfied with both options. And the, the rulers think, okay, I, I guess that's kind of on the table. I, mean, I felt that way until I hit Psalm 89. I said, boy, Mike, you were busy that day. You read like seven psalms, you know. <laughs> okay. okay. Psalm 89 just destroys it. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Well, there's that assembly thing again. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings, and this is B'nai Elim. You can show this here. Again, B'nai is sons. Again, back to my profound statement, sons is plural. Elim is a plural for El, just like Elohim is a plural for Allah. Again, two different words for deity in the Hebrew language. So who among the heavenly beings, the sons of, of God, is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones? Now, second profound statement. You know, the last time I looked in my Bible, the skies were not filled with a bunch of Jewish guys ruling the nations. Okay, the council is not a bunch of people. I've also never seen an idol floating around up there either. And frankly, if, well, that's just the spirit world, Mike. This is just spiritual rulership. Well, that's great because now you have Yahweh, the God of Israel, ruling everything along with idols. It just doesn't make any sense. But these are the reflex answers, the reflex positions that she'll run into all the time in published sources by real scholars who are good people and but you know why 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 you know and that, that that's what was going through my head why are we doing this you know why are we are we fudging here when it just seems that you know it seems really obvious that the, the text is not hard here we have god and we have plural elohim divine plurality as i like to say god is angry with them and you know, he's punishing them. They're, they're, going, they're going to die at some point. Okay, we're not really told when. So what do we do with that? And I'll admit, it sounded like polytheism to my ear. Psalm 89 didn't let me have the Jewish ruler thing. It didn't let me have idols. You know, idols. Then I got to 1 Kings 22. Eventually, as I'm reading, I mean, I had to discover all these things myself. I didn't have anybody, I didn't have anybody write the unseen realm that I could just go read. I mean, this was all like just walking in the dark, uh, but I couldn't let it go. So I came across 1 Kings 22. And again, just to, you know, the quick version of that, Ahab, again, wicked Ahab, wants to go conquer a city. So he tries to convince the king of the south, Jehoshaphat, hey, come with me up to remote Gilead. We're going to conquer this place. Everything will be great. So he and Jehoshaphat have a meeting. <clears throat> and Ahab, of course, rolls out the prophets, you know, his prophets, prophets of Baal. And they all say the same thing. They sing the same song. You know, oh, Ahab, you're great. You know, go up to remote Gilead. You're going to, you know, kick their butts up there. You're, you know, you're wonderful. And Jehoshaphat turns to him and says, hey, don't we have any prophets of Yahweh around here? Like, like, I don't trust these guys. And Ahab actually says, oh, yeah, there's one of them, but I hate that guy. <laughs> this is this wonderful line. I hate him because he never tells me what I want to hear. Well, I, okay, that kind of tells you everything you need to know. So they, they roll out Micaiah, and at first Micaiah is kind of poking fun at him. And then he, he finally says in, in uh, verse 19, he says, I saw the Lord. We should just turn to it. It's, just, it's a neat passage. 1 Kings 22, he says, I saw the Lord and, you know, around him on his right hand, on his left, he has company. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right and on his left. The Lord said, who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at remote Gilead? Again, God is not talking to a bunch of Jewish guys. Okay. One said one thing, and another said another. Then a spirit, oh, here we find out who they are. They're spirit beings. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I'll entice him. The Lord said to him, by what means? He said, I will go out. I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And God more or less says, yeah, that'll work. I mean, you know, if, if, if a spirit would have come forward with a dumb idea, I mean, I, you know, God would have said, look, just, you know, go sit down, you know, <laughs> Just try tomorrow. Next meeting, I might call on you. Okay, I mean, God isn't fishing for information. 
Okay, he already knows, you know, what the options are. God knows all things real and possible. But he wants to hear from his counsel. Okay, what do you guys think? I'm going to let you participate. If I hear a good idea, yeah, let's go with that. That'll work. I know it'll work because I'm God. Okay, I also know if it's not going to work. I also know if it's stupid, and I'll tell you that too. So here we have a divine council meeting. You actually get a glimpse into one where God allows his intelligent beings who are loyal to him, he allows them to participate with him in carrying out something he wants done. It is time for Ahab to die. Now, how do we want to get that done? I'll let you guys choose the method, choose the means. And they do. Now, there are other, other meetings like this in Scripture. You get one in Daniel 4. Okay, the watchers, when you know a, a watcher, that is a holy one, comes down and he speaks to, to Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar's had this dream. You know, it, it, it's, it's, the, it's the dream about Nebuchadnezzar going insane for a while. And the passage actually says, the, 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 the angelic being, the watcher, says to Daniel, this is by decree of the watchers, plural. And then a few verses later, it says, this is by decree of the Most High. So they're working together. Okay, God didn't like take a day off and said, you handle the cosmos for a while, I'm taking a vacation. Okay, it's, it's not that picture at all. But God allows participation. Daniel 7, the four beasts are going to be judged. We know that they're world empires. We know the story of the book of Daniel and all this stuff. But what, is the, what does the passage say? It says that, that thrones were set up and the court, the council, sat to render judgment on the beasts. Okay, you, you have this stuff sprinkled throughout Scripture. You even get some of these that are kind of neat in the New Testament as well. So as, as, I'm, as I'm going through this, it's like, okay, you know, God works. He has, a, he has an administration. He has a bureaucracy. What's the problem? Well, of course we know what the problem is. And <clears throat> we'll come back to that. The problem is questions like this. Well, what about none besides me? What about the polytheism question? And again, I'm, I'm just going to summarize things to, to move up, move through it quickly. I think what we can get from this is, is actually kind of profound. Okay, we, we run into these passages, God of gods, God is above all gods, God is, you know, you know the, the best God, and all you know, this language in Scripture. I would submit to you that when the Bible says that Yahweh of Israel is the God of gods, the text means exactly what it says exactly what it says. That there are other Elohim, but none of them are Yahweh. But the reason we get creeped out is when we see the letters G, O, and D on a piece of paper, on a text, on a screen, whatever, our brain, because of the way we're taught, we're Western. Okay, we're part of the Judeo-Christian tradition, the Western tradition. We have, again, our own sort of subcultures within Christianity. Because of the way we're taught, our brain immediately when it sees G, O, and D, our brain assigns a specific set of attributes that are unique to that term, to those three letters. So when we see G, O, D, we think omniscience, omnipotence, you know, sovereignty, we th all these things. And so that's why it, it really feels awful and creepy and just sinister to put an S on it. The answer to this, though, is that the biblical writer when the biblical writer wrote Elohim, he did not think of a specific set of attributes the way we do when we write G, O, and D, or when we read it. Elohim to them is not about a specific set of unique attributes, but that's because they come from a different time and place. That's because their culture is millennia removed from ours. We don't think like them because we don't have the Israelite in our head. You say, well, Mike, how do you know this? Are we just supposed to believe you because you have a PhD? And no, 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 no. Okay. The way we know that is actually looking up Elohim in the Hebrew Bible. Now, I'll grant you it's boring. If you want to really know how boring it is, go up to my, my website, sitchiniswrong.com. The Elohim tab, I have a PDF there you can download with all the occurrences of Elohim in the Hebrew Bible. Again, it's dull, it's boring, but there it is. Because there's a point to be made. The biblical writer uses Elohim of half a dozen different entities. Now that alone, that alone should tell you 
that the biblical writer is not thinking of a specific set of unique attributes if he's using the word of six different things. That's really all you need because that wouldn't make any sense. You, you can't have six unique things that are yet different. Okay, you, you don't, it, does, it just doesn't work. So the list, I think I have the list in here somewhere. We'll get back to the denial statements in a minute. I just want you to see the list, yeah. So who are they? I mean, who, who is Elohim? Who are Elohim in the Hebrew Bible? We have Psalm 82. You have the God of Israel. That's the easy one. Gods of the council. Psalm 82, 1. Gods of the nations. If you look up 1 Kings 11, 33, you're going to get various gods of other nations called Elohim. Kamosh of Moab is called Elohim. Okay, Asherah is called Elohim. It's, it's interesting. The Hebrew Bible, it, the, the biblical writers don't have a, they don't use the feminine term for goddess. They use Elohim, actually, even when it refers to a goddess. Uh, you know, you, you have the gods of the nations who are Elohim. These gods of the nations are called Shadim, which a lot of English translations have as demons in Deuteronomy 32.17. Again, there's a disconnect there because what Shadim means is different than what the, the demon daimonion means in the Gospels. They're actually different, different beings. But you, again, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get that unless you looked up the terminology. But regardless, Paul quotes Deuteronomy 32:17 in 1 Corinthians 10, 21 and 22, when he says, hey, you better watch out you know, about eating meat that was sacrificed to the idols because you don't want to be in fellowship with demons. And he, he has a, a quotation of Deuteronomy 32:17 in that discussion. So Paul believed they were real. If it's good enough for Paul. It ought to be good enough for us. Okay. But they're called demons, or Elohim. The, the, the Shadim are Elohim in Deuteronomy 32, 17. The disembodied human dead, this is my favorite one, because this is the, the, the story of the medium at Endor. You know, when Saul, you can't get his prayers answered. So he's kicked all the mediums out of the country, but yet he knows where to find one. And he goes to her and says, hey, I need to talk to Samuel. And she doesn't know who he is yet. She's like, oh, okay. We'll see what we can do. So we're not told what she does, but she does whatever she does. And then she gets a little freaked out because she says to Saul in the room there, I see Elohim coming up out of the ground. Okay, coming up from Sheol, from the underworld. And we know that she's focused on one because Saul says, what does he look like? It's, all, it's a great question. What does he look like? And she describes him, and then it, it kind of kicks into her head like, Okay, Samuel, I bet I can figure out who you are. You're Saul. And she thinks she's in trouble. She thinks she's going to be put to death. And he's like, look, don't worry about it. Nothing's going to happen to you. What does he look like? She describes it. Yet that's the guy. So Saul has a conversation with the deceased Samuel, the disembodied Samuel. And we know it's Samuel because of the conversation. He repeats things that Samuel said earlier. He has information that only Samuel would have. Okay, we, we know it's him, and, and basically it, it goes badly, you know. Samuel's like, okay, you're all going to die, now don't bother me again. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's kind of a real quick message, just let me alone, you're going to die, you're going to get what you deserve, so goodbye. So it doesn't work out real well. And of course, what he says happens, happens. Samuel's a prophet, he's still a prophet. But I love this one because no Israelite in their right mind would think that their dear departed child or their dear departed uncle or aunt or mother or grandmother is on the same attribute level as the God of Israel. Well, they're all called Elohim, Mike. That means polytheism, right? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And the last one is the angel. I think it refers to one specific angel, but again, we can talk about that later. So here's the grouping. Here's what gets called Elohim in the Hebrew Bible. And they all have one thing in common. And this is really what Elohim means. Elohim is a term you would use as a biblical writer of a being or entity, just say being, a being who by nature is disembodied and belongs in what we call the spiritual world. That is what an Elohim is. It has nothing to do with a specific set of attributes. That's why the biblical writers can use Elohim all over the place. Okay? Because they believe in, in, in a spiritual world that's actually got something in it. All right? 
Now, again, as Christians, we're used to thinking this way, but we don't use this vocabulary. And why don't we use this vocabulary? Because we're uptight? No, it's because we're not taught. Okay, that's why we don't use the vocabulary. Nothing I just went through here is rocket science. But even for me, it was difficult because I was never taught it. Yeah, I actually had to think about it. I had to go fair. I had to do boring things like, well, let's look at all the 2,300 occurrences of Elohim and see what that, you know. I mean, who wants to do that? Okay. <laughs> but, you know, you, at some point, you more or less just have to. And I justified it by saying it was part of my dissertation. So it gave, it gave me a little motivation. I mean, once you commit, you more or less have to do it. Um, but, but, I mean, you, this isn't difficult. Okay, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not something insurmountable to explain. So God lives in the spirit world. All of these beings, by nature, are in the spirit world. Now, they can come over here, and they often do. I mean, God comes over both in terms of an audible voice and in terms of a physical body. We'll look at that a little bit later today. You know, God can take people from here and transport them to that realm. I mean, this happens in the Bible all the time. But again, by definition, if you are disembodied, you belong in the spiritual world. You're a spirit being, a disembodied spirit being. Again, in, in the sense, you know, in contrast to our normal, our normal terrestrial existence. Now, we, you know, we know from the New Testament and the Old, you know, over there there's some kind of, you know, I get that. But well, we're talking about the human realm versus the spiritual realm. That's what an Elohim is. You don't call a person, you know, Elohim ontologically. Okay, you might give them the title or something like the king. You know, you're, you're now like the son of God to me, you know, that, that sort of thing. Again, because there was this conception in the ancient Near Eastern world that the king, okay, the king was somehow intrinsically related to the deity. Again, that's just common, you know, common knowledge, common for them anyway. So... This is, again, what, why it isn't polytheism. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. That's what an Orthodox Israelite would have believed. Now you have, you know, Israelite religion is, is like Christianity today. You have lots of people who call themselves Christians, but they don't all believe the same things. In fact, there's, a, there's an amazing amount of variety. And some of them don't like each other. Okay, because of certain things they believe. Again, you know, this, this, is, this is just easy to understand. Well, it's the same thing in ancient Israel. Not every ancient Israelite believed exactly the same thing. But the ones who understood, and the biblical writers, again, they convey this idea that Yahweh is unique among the Elohim. So where Yahweh gets his uniqueness is in the way the biblical writers describe him and never describe any other ones. This is where you get, he's the lone creator. This is where you get, he's the sovereign. This is where you get, he's almighty, he's omnipotent. This is where you get these things. They're descriptions given about Yahweh of Israel that none of the other Elohim ever get. So your theology, your, you know, your theology proper, to use the seminary term, is unaffected by this. So I, I try to you know, get Christians, again, to sometimes it's a bumpy ride because you're talking about gods. Well, I, I'm talking about gods because your Bible talks about them. You know, again, I'm not going to protect you from it. But that doesn't mean that you've been taught poorly in terms of you know, who Yahweh is, who the God of the Bible is. He is unique. Yeah, and they certainly would have agreed with that. So you get this issue, okay, what about none besides me? We sort of reflexively interpret these statements as being statements of denial. That is, when, when God says, there's none besides me, there's none like me, you know, besides me, there's no other, that means all of the other Elohim don't exist. Or that they're all really people anyway, or they're all idols, and idols don't, you know, they're just pieces of wood and stone and all this stuff. So they're typically interpreted as denial statements. We well, have a really hard time with that. Again, when you go to certain passages, I'm not going to take you through the whole tour of Deuteronomy here, but just Deuteronomy 32, let's just go out to 32.12. You have, you know, kind of a difficult problem here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the NLT since I'm going to wind up there. The Lord alone guided them. They followed no foreign gods. Okay? 
Now, if we look at this, this language, okay, there was no other gods with them. Okay, this is im with, that's the negative particle there. So basically, they're going through the, the desert, and they don't have any other gods there, you know, with them. Right? This is one of the so-called denial statements. If we go to, we'll just go back to ESV here. No foreign god was with him. Let's just switch back to NLT. Again, you get the idea. There's actually a dozen different statements about there being no other gods with, aside, besides, you know, the God of Israel. This is one of those phrases. So there's no other God there. At least that's what we're led to, to think. But then you get down to verse 17. They offered sacrifices to demons, which are not God, to gods they had not known before. Well, now, wait a minute. Again, if we click on gods, if I can find my mouse here again. There we go. Let's get rid of this. We have Elohim. Okay, so the Israelites end up sacrificing to the Shadim. The Shadim are not God. They're not the God of Israel, obviously. But they sacrifice to demons. They sacrifice to gods, to other Elohim they had not known before. So how is it? I mean, they're either gods there, present, or they're not. They're either other gods that are alongside Yahweh in the sense of existence, or they're not. You can't really have both. And if we, tr if we track through Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy has several passages that affirm the reality of other gods, but then it turns around and says, there's none besides me. So how do we do that? You know, unless we want to see a hopeless contradiction in Scripture. Again, these are not denials of existence. They are statements of incomparability. And the, the, the two cases I like to illustrate this, I think... It, it, the, it's the best illustration. Isaiah 47, I know these are probably somebody's memory verses or life verses here. Isaiah 47, 1, 8 to 10. Quote it for me now. <laughs> Zephaniah 2, 13 and 15. The Isaiah passage has Babylon saying this and the Zephaniah passage has Nineveh saying it. But they, both of these cities say, there's none besides me. Now, if you're, going to state, if you're going to take that language as a statement of non-existence, do you really have the city of Babylon saying, hey, I'm the only city that exists? There's no other cities in the world. I know you probably were born in one, but forget that. Okay. There's actually no other cities in the world. It doesn't make any sense. Same thing with Nineveh. There's none besides me. Well, of course there are. There's lots of cities in, this, in the Assyrian Empire. Like, are you, are you Ninevites idiots or something? I, again... The point is that they're claiming to be the best. They're claiming to be incomparable. There's none like me, period. I'm superior. So Babylon, again, the, the prophet cast Babylon as vaunting herself as the, the supreme, you know, the apex of civilization. And, and Nineveh during the Assyrian period, you know, they, they, they think of themselves as the same way. This kind of language, again, this is how we have to process it to avoid some pretty glaring contradiction. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not cheating that because I don't want to see contradictions in the Bible. What I'm saying is that just makes the most sense. And it does. Monotheism we talked about. Again, it's not a theological problem. It's a, it's a context problem because we don't... And when we see G-O-D, our brain just works a certain way. We are not thinking like the Israelite. And if you've read Unseen Realm, I mean, th this is the whole thesis of the book. I want the Israelite in your head. And I know it's going to disturb you at some points because it disturbed me. I get it. It's not always going to be comfortable. But you have to reach the point, I think, in, in, our, in your own study, if, if you're really, again, profound statement number three. We're up to three now. <laughs> the, the, the right context for interpreting Scripture is not yours. It's not your church's. It's not the history of Christianity. It's not the Reformation. It's not the Catholic Church. It's not John Calvin. It's not just fill in the blank. All of these contexts, as good as they are and as helpful as they are, are not the context that produced the Bible. I would suggest to you that that is the correct context for interpreting the Bible, the context that produced the thing. 
Because when a biblical writer writes, when God prompts someone to write something down that would wind up in what we call the Bible, there was actually a reason for doing it. There was a specific occasion. There's a specific agenda. An agenda is not a sinister word. It just means you had a reason to do what you're doing. Okay? They have a reason for writing what they're writing. And they're, they're in a, a specific time and place that is millennia removed from us. And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. They're writing to people who live at the same time. Okay? Because if they're not, well, I'm writing this down for someone that I don't know who's going to live 3,000 years from now. And, and Lord, give me vocabulary that a 21st century technocrat would understand so that no one here understands it because I'm not writing for my audience. I'm writing for some other audience. It, it just doesn't make sense. They're writing using what they know, the tools at their disposal, the knowledge they have, the context they're in. God knows that because God is pretty smart. Okay? God knows what he's getting. He knows what he wants them to produce. He's a big enough God to make sure they don't mess it up. And I want you to write this for these people right here, right now. Even if I know that what you're writing, well, part of it will happen now, but part of it's going to be in the future. They're still going to understand it. They can process it. Because if they can't, it defeats the whole premise of communication. So you either have a non-communicative Bible, that's the one I want, you know, that's, okay, or you have something that's like real. And I, I've, I've, you know, I, don't, I can't say I've often said it because I don't keep track of these things, but if you strip the humanity out of Scripture, you undermine inspiration. Now that might sound contradictory, but it's absolutely true. Because we, have, we define inspiration like it's an X-Files episode. And you probably heard me say this, because this is a hobby horse of mine. Pardon me, I'm going to go on it for a few minutes. <clears throat> but we have this, conce this conception where the biblical writer you know, wakes up, starts making breakfast, and then all of a sudden they're just zapped. Like their mind goes blank. They have no control over their limbs. They, you know, they just, the, the hand just starts flailing. And then they, they pop out of it, and they look down, and they say, wow, did I write that? Man, I can't, I can't wait to read that. I bet that's great. Because I surely didn't pick the words. I surely didn't like write it so that it would conform to any known genre. I don't know what I did. My arm just started moving, OK? You know, we, we have this weird x file -ish view of inspiration. And the reason we do is because we want to affirm verbal inspiration, that the words matter. It's not just the concepts. It's the words. OK, we get that. But we strip the humanity out of it in the name of, we think, preserving this idea over here. But it, it actually sets you up for so many problems in passages. Why do did, why did the Gospels all disagree on certain accounts? Why even when they agree, do they have things in different orders? Why even when it's in the same order and the same event, they use different verb forms in Greek? What, the Holy Spirit said, watch this. I'm going to throw him a curveball now. <laughs> oh, this will be fun. I, you know, 2,000 years from now, they're going to be scratching their heads wondering why I used an aorist here and a perfect over there. Okay, it's just, it's absurd. But this is the way we think about inspiration, that the Holy Spirit has to drop every word in somebody's head. It's absurd. And critics have a field day with it. A field day. It's easy pickings. <clears throat> you know, sorry for the hobby horse, but it, it, it's this thing that constantly irritates me. <laughs> Again, why don't we view inspiration like we view canonicity? It's providence. Why can't God be in control of this person's life from the moment they're born? Preparing them every step of the way. God knows what their life experiences are going to be. He knows what kind of home they're going to be born into. <clears throat> he knows what their education is going to be. He knows that they're going to make a left turn instead of a right turn. This is going to happen instead of that. Okay, God knows all these things about the way a person's character is molded and why they wind up where they wind up. Good or bad. Mistake or obedient. I mean, God knows all that stuff. But he's preparing this person along their path because God knows 
at a specific time, in a specific place, on a specific occasion, at a specific day, he's going to need them to write this thing down. And they're going to be prepared to do it. They're going to be the right person for the job. Why don't we view it like that? Well, because that isn't as cool as an X-Files episode. I mean, well, again, sorry. <laughs> because it's just a constant irritation with me. And, it, and, you know, frankly, it is because I've seen so many people damaged, you know, by, by again, what I, what I poke fun at as, as an X-Files view of inspiration. Where I, I mean, I get emails. I, you know, I used to be a Christian until, or I had to give up on believing the Bible because, and then they'll tell you, and it's like, really? Like, that's like a two-minute answer. But, but yet I understand why, because you were probably told this. And, and when you realize, the day you realize this doesn't work, this doesn't answer your question. In fact, it makes it worse for you. You just bagged it. That's what you did. And honestly, if I would have been you in the same set of circumstances, I could see myself doing that because I didn't know any better. So I, I tend to be a little ultra-sensitive to this one. Another question, what about Jesus? All these sons of God running around that are Elohim, well, what about Jesus? You know, I thought he was the son of God. Mike, this is heresy. Oh, oh, is it? Sorry, you know, but I didn't write the Bible. I just sort of make you look at it. It's my job. I mean, what about all these sons of God in the Old Testament? And, I mean, look, the biblical writers are not dunces. They understand that they need to communicate that Jesus of Nazareth is Yahweh in the flesh. They know that they need to talk about him a little differently than they would talk about something else. Okay, give them some credit. And they do that. Okay? John 3.16, we all know this. You know, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. We know because it's, it's this crucial, you know, creedal kind of verse okay, that articulates the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his what? Okay, see, now we got a, we got a, a variance, which is, which is the whole point. Only begotten, one and only. Then there's you know, some other options. What's the Greek term? You get a gold star for the day if you know the Greek term. Monogenes, yeah, a couple. I'm, I'm out of gold stars right now. <laughs> okay. Monogenes. Now, it used to be, I don't know if I have this up here. No, no, I'll just wing it here. <clears throat> it used to be that scholars thought monogenes came from monos only, okay, or one, and genao, which is a verb which means to beget, produce children, okay? And that's part of the, the reason why like, an old translation like the King James would have only begotten. And it was a term that allowed them to distinguish, it, to our ear, because we don't use this vocabulary anymore, but to beget something actually doesn't refer to the moment of its creation or conception. There are different words for conception. You know, they're in the Hebrew Bible, and, and you know you can beget a child, but the child's already been in the in the woman for nine months. You know all this kind of stuff. So they thought that this is the best way to express this. Well, it turns out, you know, 150 years later, again through paleographic research and archaeology, scholars find out, oops, it doesn't come from manas and genao. It comes from manas and gene, which is a noun. It's not a verb, and it means kind. So it means one of a kind. Okay, unique, only. Now, that's a good word. <laughs> okay, if you're describing Jesus and you want to distinguish him from the other sons of God, who are obviously more than mortal, they're, they're, they're divine, you use a word like one of a kind, unique. Again, if you go to Hebrews 11:17, again, this is, pro this is not another memory verse here. Let me just go to that real quickly. And, you know, if we did a search for you know, monogenes, you'd, you'd find out you know, there, there are other examples here. But I like this one because everybody knows the story of Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Who had, and he who had received the promises was in fact the, uh, was in, in the act of offering up his only son. So if we click on only, we get monogenes. Now here's the question. Okay, we know who Abraham was offering up in the process, Isaac. Was Isaac... Abraham's only son. No. He had Ishmael. He's not even the firstborn. 
So what does monogenes mean? It means he's unique. Well, what's unique about him? Right there in the verse, he is the son of the promise. Okay, that's what makes him unique. He's not chronologically first. He's not the only one. So monogenes is a really good word to use here because it pinpoints, it targets what's special about Isaac. Cosmic Mountain a little bit and then we'll break. And we'll just keep tracking through because I, I, I do want to get the rebel to the rebellion stuff, especially with, with this audience. But cosmic audience, again, refers to a number of ideas. Edenic vision, the whole concept of the image, you know, what's the image of God? Why do we have plurals in Genesis 1.26? You know, God said, let us create humankind in our image. What's the point? you know, of all this sort of language. Now, in the book, again, if you, if you don't have Unseen Realm, I recommend you getting it, obviously. I'd, I'd sure like you to read it. <laughs> you know, just read the book. So long. Let's <laughs> go out for lunch here. Uh, I, have a, I have a few charts in the book. This is one of them. Where I'm trying to illustrate here Council terminology, divine council terminology in both ancient Near Eastern texts and other texts that shows up in Genesis 3 and other Eden passages like Ezekiel 28. Because Ezekiel 28 refers to Eden, it calls Eden the Garden of God, and it also calls Eden, you know, the, the, the Holy Mountain or the Mountain of God. Well, why this language? You know, why do we have a watery mist? Why do we have seas? Why do we have gardens? Why is it a mountain? Again, it's because these are the, these are the, the elements of the stock description. This is stock vocabulary for places where in the ancient mind the gods were thought to live. Why do the gods live in gardens? It's an arid culture. So, of course, the gods live in the best places. They live where there's lots of water. They live where there's lots of food. They never want for anything. It's paradise. Okay, to the ancient person, this is paradise, the, the lush garden description, because that's a, a lot of them never see anything like that. You get an oasis, and it's kind of really small. We can't actually live here. We'll get kicked out because other people want to live here too. You know, you get this whole situation. Why, why mountains? Because mountains were remote. Mountains put a distance between the deity and the riffraff, which is basically all of us. <laughs> The gods don't want to be troubled with people. People are nasty. They're dirty. They're icky. You know, I don't want to touch them unless I have to. Okay. This is why the gods are, are, are described as living in these places where people aren't. Why do we get gods in the ocean? Because people don't live there. Why do we get gods in Sheol? Because, again, the normal terrestrial existence is not down there. Okay. You wind up there spiritually and you know, all that kind of stuff, the realm of the dead. But the gods live where people don't. By choice, okay. And again, the, the the more positive of these is the is the garden and the mountain. So this is where the divine council lives. So Eden is actually a description. It, it's a description of God's abode. But an ancient person reading it would would know. God, I mean, we can read it in English and okay, God lives there. God at least visited there. He lived there initially. We get that. But what we miss is again the trappings of this is cosmic turf where the divine presence is, it's a, it's a place that people ordinarily aren't and are kept away from and shouldn't be. This is the divine abode. It's not the human abode. Okay, humans don't belong here. But nevertheless, God comes to earth, creates this place, and plants in the garden, puts in the garden humans. Again, to the ancient mind, that telegraphs something. God wants people there for some reason. And when they show up, Okay. What's their mission? Okay. We take care of this place, but then we subdue the earth, the rest of the earth. Eden is not the world, by the way. A lot of Christians have this assumption that Eden was the whole world. The description of Eden gets applied to the whole world. Eden has geography, Genesis 2. Go look it up. Eden is a little portion of the earth. They're supposed to be fruitful and multiply and go out and you know, make, make the rest of the world like this place. Okay, That's your, that's your job. That's your task. You know, we, and we know what happens, but this is the divine abode. God wanted people there. Why the plurals? God says, you know, while well, he's in the business of creating all this other stuff, 
Let us create humankind in our image. Again, the reflexive interpretation, if you ask, well, why the plurals here? You know, most Christians, well, that's a trinity. Now, if this was the only passage where you had divine plurality language, okay, you know, we could live with that. You, you could guess, you could assume, you could read the New Testament back into the Old. It's not a really good method, but you could sort of live with it. The problem is it isn't the only passage in the Hebrew Bible that has divine plurality. And if you import the Trinity in some of those, like Psalm 82, you get really, really bad theology. But who's God judging in Psalm 82? Jesus and the Holy Spirit says they're corrupt, says you're going to die like man. Come on. You know, it, it just doesn't work. God is announcing his intention. There's, there's another disconnect. Well, if, if, the, if the members of the Trinity are co-eternal, and in every theology class I ever went to, they were, okay, if, if the members of the Trinity are co-eternal, why does God have to announce anything to them? Did they like, you know, dip off, you know? Okay, I missed that. Can you read? <laughs> okay. I mean, no. Okay, again, it, it, it's this little thing that just doesn't make sense. If they're co-eternal, they should already know. But God announces it. Okay, what, what, what's really going on is God is speaking to the, the beings, the members of this family who are already there. Well, who are they? They're the sons of God. Job 38. Sons of God are present at the foundation of the earth. You know, all this language. God already has an audience. He already has a family. And he says, i got a great idea. Let's make humankind in our image and in our likeness. But then when he actually does it, it switches back to singular. So God created humankind in his image. And his, you know. Why do we have both? God is speaking to an audience. He already has a family and says, look, I want a human family too. This is our home. It's where I live. It's where you guys work. You, know, you live here because I made you too. Right? I want a family here. So let's create humankind in our image, in our likeness. But then when it actually happens, God does it. It would be the equivalent of me walking into a room like this. Okay, this is just for illustrative purposes. <laughs> he knows what's coming. <laughs> and then I said, hey, let us go get pizza. Let us go get lunch. We're in California now. What does everybody eat here? Let us go get, I don't know, pizza works. Okay. It's the universal, it's the food of the gods. It's, Ambrosia, okay. <laughs> Let us go get pizza. So I announced that to a group. I'm the lone speaker. And then we all get into my car. Uh, we all go to the pizza place of my choice. I pay, but you get to eat. Okay, that's what's going on in Genesis 1. The plural language connects us all. It connects us to God. It connects us to the other sons of God. Because God made them too. And the whole imaging idea, again, real rapid fire here, is about representation. The image of God is not a thing given to us, especially if it's brain activity. You know, because the, the foundation of our ethics, you know, I think, is totally undermined by our own Christian view of the image of God half the time. <clears throat> because we want to say it's something like prayer and intelligence and sentience and self-awareness. Hey, hey, the little four-celled zygote you know, that's in the, in, the, in the woman's womb there, Guess what? It ain't praying. It ain't thinking. It ain't doing anything. But it's there. Okay, the image is about being human. By definition, God creates a representative of him, of his, on this planet. That's you. That's humanity. Regardless of your intelligence, regardless of how long your lifespan is, regardless of any property, any quality, to be human is to be God's image, God's imager. I, I like to use it as a verb because I think it, it, it conveys the thought. We represent God. We, are, we, we do what God would do if he were here in a body. Okay? We are him in that sense. We function as his represent, representatives. That's why Jesus is called the express image. He's the ultimate image. It's why we are conformed to his image because he is the perfect image of God. Okay? All this language in Scripture actually means something. It's not just random. It's connected back to Old Testament ideas. So what Eden is is the place where God lives, where God runs his affairs. His divine family is there. His human family is there. And he wants them all working for him together. He wants a blended family. That's what he wants in Eden. This is why Christians 
are talked about in glorification language later on. It's why we become the cloud of witnesses. It's why we become divine. It's why we are partakers of the divine nature. It's why creation travails awaiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's why any, as many as believed him or received into them, he gave the authority to become the sons of God. All the sons of God language, all the adoption language of the New Testament, it all goes back to this. God wants humans to be in his family and in his counsel. It's why we are the reconstituted counsel of God in the eschaton. Again, all these concepts in the Old Testament, we'll hit some of them as we, as we continue through the day. I'm just throwing a lot of stuff at you. But all these things have a history. They all have a reason. God wants his intelligent beings, just like 1 Kings 22, get a divine council meeting there with Ahab. It's time for Ahab to die. What should we do? What do you guys want to do? Propose something. Okay, God wants humans participating with him in what he does. Okay, it's a simple thought, but it's a profound one at the same time. And I often get the question, well, why does God need this council thing? You know, God can do anything. Yeah, he can. He can. Okay, why does God need the church? Why does God need you? God doesn't need any of us. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need any group. He doesn't need any individual. He just likes to do that. He likes to let you, as his imager, participate with him in what he wants to get done. That's what it means. That's council language. And Eden is this place where heaven and earth meet and God functions with his family with his council members. I have this little, this little drawing up here, and we'll, we'll break with this. But the other, the other conception of the council that, that I think is important, again, just to plant you know, in, in your minds if you don't already have it, is this three-tiered thing. The terminology actually means something. Then you have Yahweh at the top, and again, we're, we'll, there's a Godhead in the Old Testament and all that stuff. You know, we can spend some time on that later. Sons of God is important because it's... It's the language used in the ancient world of the royal court, the important tasks, the inner circle, however you want to picture it. Because most kings would appoint people to these positions who are in some way attached to him as family. It might be a distant relationship, but there's some relationship. And that was done for accountability and it's nepotism and all that kind of stuff. But this is the inner circle, the sons, the family, the household. And I, I use the, the, the term pharaoh as an illustration. Pharaoh in Egyptian, per a ah, means great house. It's the whole entourage. They're the, they're the most important ones in the hierarchy. The bottom are the malachim, the messengers. But see, what we think of, <coughs> malach, messenger, angelos in Greek, messenger, angels in English, we're only thinking of these guys when we think typically in Christian circles of the unseen realm. We don't realize that that's kind of a low-level task. An Elohim just takes a message. Okay, any, any of them can do that. It's a job description. It's not what a thing is. It's what a thing does. It's just a job description. So you, you get a passage like this, and it really conveys not only these ideas, the participation, but later on, and I'll throw this out, we'll, depending on what Gons wants to do, we'll break for a certain number of minutes, but... This is why Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, when he's trying to convince the Corinthians, look, I don't understand why you people keep taking each other to court okay, before secular judges. Don't you know? Don't you know that you will judge the world? And then the next line is, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? Well, apparently they didn't. okay, Because he had a problem communicating this to them, but it, you know th this language of look, you outrank them. Okay, you will rule over angels. You will judge angels someday. Why? Because Paul knows that someday we will all be members of God's council. We are the inner circle. We are the great cloud of you know all, all these concepts. But he has to teach the Corinthians that because they just don't get it. So it's a throwaway line. Don't you know that you're going to rule over angels? That we think, oh, Paul, what a, po what a poet. <laughs> what a poet. What a neat guy. Oh, he's so eloquent. 
Well, I'm not saying he's a, a doofus, but I mean, th there's something behind it. Something important. So, Gons, if you want to, you're in charge here. Uh oh. Um, Let that go to you. Let's jump in here <clears throat> with the uh, three rebellions here. And I, I don't know if you've, if you've thought of what we're going to talk about next this way, but uh, again, may, maybe again, it just depends what, what you've heard as far as a podcast or an interview or something else. But I find it uh, useful to, to ask it this way. If you asked a normal Christian, again, just your, your average churchgoer, but again, somebody who's not you know, new in the faith, why is humanity so depraved? In other words, why, you know, why is the world the way it is? Why do we have all this wickedness? You know, why, why are things just so bad? The answer you're typically going to get is the fall. But if you asked a Second Temple Jew, and someone who's living in the Second Temple period, which is roughly, again, we'll just call it for round numbers, 500 B.C. through the first century A.D. If you asked one of them the same question, you would not get that answer. It would be part of the answer. What you'd get is you'd get, well, there are three reasons why the world is the way it is and why it's so bad. For sure, there's the fall. I mean, something did happen in Eden. We have the initial rebellion into God's good world. Um, we have an initial transgression, both divine rebellion, the Nakash, the serpent, and also a human rebellion. But that is not where the story ends. And typically, that is where the story ends for your average Christian. That's, that's the, only, the, the only answer they have in their head. But to someone else, they would say the, the, what happened in Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is also really serious. Because in their worldview, they believe that the sin of the watchers, the sin of the sons of God of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, had a direct impact on why humanity became as bad as it did and why the flood was a necessity, and why there's still an ongoing problem. So they would include Genesis 6, 1 through 4 in their concept of depravity. They would also refer to the judgment at Babel, which we're familiar with because of Genesis 11, but I would, I would dare say that if you've ever heard a sermon or had a Sunday school lesson on the Tower of Babel, you probably never heard Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9 brought into the picture. Therefore, you never really learn the rationale for what happens at Babel and, and the impact that has on biblical theology in, in, in a very broad scope. This is according to Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9, when the Most High divided up the nations, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. So we know who the Most High is, we know what the division of nations is, but God did all that stuff according to the number of the sons of God. But Israel, verse 9, is Yahweh's portion. Jacob is his allotted inheritance. So you have this allotment language going on. Now if we traced, and we will in our time here, these ideas through Deuteronomy a little bit, you come out with a totally different worldview. It's the basis for why the Old Testament, really the rest of the Bible, is Israel against the nations and Yahweh against the gods. And there's, there's an ant antipathy there. There's a hostility there. So the Second Temple Jew would say, well, there's, there's three rebellions. There's three kind of events that led to contribute to why the world is the way it is. And why we as believers, we who follow Yahweh or we who follow you know, Christ, Yahweh incarnate, what we're up against. It's not just the Garden of Eden. It's bigger than that. And that becomes a real part of, quote unquote, the unseen realm when we're talking about the black hats and the white hats. Okay, All of that matters in, again, the mindset of the ancient Israelite, the mindset of the first century Jew. So let's talk a little bit about each. Again, you, you, you can get the book for the details. The fall, of course, we're familiar with. I view this as a divine rebellion story. 
That doesn't mean that, you know, Adam wasn't there and Adam didn't sin and, you know, Adam's sin really had a, a profound impact on humanity. Of course, all those things are, are kind of no-brainers. But you would be amazed at how many evangelical Old Testament scholars do not want to put too much emphasis on the Nakash, the serpent figure, in the story and absolutely refuse to look at Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 as having anything to do with that story. Now, there are academic scholarly reasons for that. And I, I will, since I'm being recorded, let me be careful. That's nonsense, okay? <laughs> All right. There are really good academic reasons to not resist those connections. And what I try to do in, in the book is, again, make some of those accessible for you. Um, you know, I think I have two, yeah. There are two charts in the book, and these are points of connection between, again, divine counsel passages, divine rebellion passages, both in and outside the Bible, in all three of these passages, and even a little bit more. In other words, there's a lot that connects the three. And I, I can tell you, again, maybe in Q&A, why this stuff gets ignored. But here you have Nakash, you have serpent language, you have Halal ben Shakar, the shining language, brought down, cut down, cast down. The earth, the Eretz, which is another word for the underworld, Sheol. Okay, Rephaim, Malachim. Okay, all of these terms, again, they, they, they all show up in all three of these passages. And scholars will, will recognize that Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are connected. I mean, all you got to do is read them. You know, they're, they kind of sound the same. Just one, you know, Isaiah is, is the prince of Babylon, and Ezekiel is the prince of Tyre, and all this kind of stuff. My argument is at the, back, at the back of both of these passages, these passages aren't about Eden or about Genesis 3, but that story is in the background to both of them. And the story is a story of divine rebellion. Many evangelical scholars will say, you go to Ezekiel 28 where it talks about the anointed cherub. Well, that, that isn't a divine being there. That isn't Satan. That isn't, you know, that, that's, that's language, you know, that you can't take that way. Because what they don't tell you is they're following the Septuagint because they think the Masoretic text is messed up. They're following the Septuagint, and if you follow that textual tradition, Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, then you have the anointed cherub with someone in the garden, and the other someone would have to be Adam, and so Ezekiel 28 is really about Adam, because the prince of Tyre was a human being, so this is really about Adam. It has nothing to do with Genesis 3 back there. Well, that ignores all the places where Ezekiel 28 touches divine rebellion stories that some of it comes straight out of Ugaritic material. It's just word for word, point for point. And what I do in the book is I, is I try to take people through this, introduce you to the ideas. I get into it more on the companion website to the book. If you haven't been there, even if you've read the book, I recommend going there, snooping around a little bit, moreunseenrealm.com. I'll take you through the different views, but I quote at length there a dissertation by, I think he... I, th I think he teaches at Notre Dame now. No, that, no, that's where he got his degree. I don't know where he is. At. Um, Hugh Rowland Page, his dissertation was on the divine rebellion motif in Ugaritic and biblical material. It's, it's really good. Um, he does a nice job of laying it out, okay, all these connections. And he's not the only one. There's lots of stuff on this. So I'm, t I'm telling you, you know, just to be up front here, my view of this is not the mainstream view you're going to find in most commentaries. It is a view you will find in the scholarly, liter scholarly literature. I ain't making it up. I didn't just wake up someday and say, oh, I got a, I got a neat alternative. I need this for the book. Thank you, Lord. And, okay, that is not it. The dirty little secret is there is nothing in the book. There is nothing in the, in the unseen realm that is unique to me. I didn't have an original idea in my head. Okay, what my role is, is synthesizing all of this stuff. And I can take the scholarly literature and my bibliography, literally, I'm not embellishing now because I've collected it for 15 years. My bibliography, the real one, 
the one that I obviously didn't tack onto the book, <laughs> is longer than the book. Okay, I have almost 5,300 entries in my personal bibliography that I have you know, online in this Divine Council bibliography thing that I have you know, talked about a little bit. I'm not making it up. Okay, my job is to make that accessible to people who care about the content. That's it. That's end of mystery. Okay, there's nothing else going on here. It's that simple and dull and boring. Okay, but I'm just telling you that because you're, you know, somebody here could go off and pull a commentary off. Oh, this isn't what Doctor So and So says. Mike must be wrong. Well, there are lots of people that Mike can draw on to defend Mike's view. It is not Mike's view. Right? Just telling you. Okay, so honesty cuts both ways there. Now, Nakash, again, if you've read the, uh, the episode, you know, or the, and the book especially, my view of Nakash, again, is not that we shouldn't translate Nakash as serpent. That's evil. That's a sin. Mike says don't do that. Okay, that isn't the point. The point is that the term Nakash is actually a, a pretty layered term. It conveys more than one idea. Okay. Profound statement number four, okay? Any given word in any given language is capable of conveying more than one idea, okay? Nakash is like any other one. As a noun, hanakash in Hebrew, yep, can mean serpent. Just fine, works well, no problem. It could also be hanakash, just the consonants, could also be, sorry for the grammar spasm, a participle, which means it comes from a verb with a, you know, a definite article attached, prefix to it. And you could translate it, the one who dispenses divine knowledge, the one who practices divination, something like that. And certainly that happens in the story, doesn't it? Okay. If it's an adjective with a definite article, then you could translate it as the shining one and luminescent vocabulary for divine beings is ubiquitous throughout the Bible. It is a stock vocabulary thing. So that wouldn't be unusual either, especially if you think Isaiah 14 is drawing on the same story of divine rebellion against the Most High God, because there you get Halal ben Shekar, the shining one, the son of the dawn. Over in Ezekiel 28, we have the mysterious figure who the Masoretic text refers to as the cherub. There is no Adam in the Masoretic text version. It's just the cherub. He is adorned with precious gems and jewels. And they, they, they shine. What, a, what a, an odd coincidence. Again, nothing to look at, citizen. Um, again, it, you can read the passage in different ways. And my suggestion is that the ancient person would have read the passage and had all of these things floating around in their head. Because, again, they know the terminology, they know the language, they know the possibilities. They use all these terms in different ways. They're not reading it with only one thing in mind. And, you know, let's be honest, besides that point, they know, Israelites are smart enough to know that snakes don't normally talk. Okay? And so this is a, a very common way in ancient Near Eastern literature when you wanted to depict a divine being meeting a human being, having a conversation or whatever, it's very common to cast the divine being as an animal. Egypt does this a lot. Story of the shipwrecked sailor, again, the, the, the god is a, is a giant snake there. I mean, it, this, is, this is common stuff. So if you're a literate Israelite and, and you've read some other of your neighbor's literary stuff, these stories about their gods and their religion, this is going to be really normative to you. Oh, I know, I know who the, she's not really talking to a member of the animal kingdom. She's talking to a divine being disguised as one. I mean, it's just the, the simplest thing in the world to them. So why we as Christians, again, this is something I, I've had difficulty wrapping my own mind around. Why there's, there's resistance to Mike saying things like, this wasn't just an ordinary run-of-the-mill member of the animal kingdom. And, and, and maybe when we talk about Hanakash, we can talk about the alternatives. Why that all of a sudden is like, 
that's just ridiculous. That's horrible. Oh, I don't listen to this guy. Okay. Hey, the New Testament tells you who this was. Okay. It doesn't. <laughs> It tells you that this is the, the, you know, Satan, this is the devil. I mean, it uses other terms, not just serpent or snake. So what's the problem? Again, I, I don't really know what the problem is other than things like scholars know that the word Satan in Hebrew never occurs in Genesis 3. In fact, it never occurs in Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28. So we can't talk about Satan in the Old Testament in being in the garden because our scholarly comrades would just laugh us out of the room. They would think, don't you know your vocabulary? Well, yeah, I, I do. And guess what? Jesus knew that too. Okay? The apostles knew that too. But they also felt very free to identify, to use the term sat satan or satanas in Greek. Okay? They, they had no problem using the term of that enemy. The shoe fit, so let's wear it. Okay, Satan just means adversary, opponent. Okay, use a word like diabolos, liar, because he is. Again, the, the the fact that you don't have the vocabulary connection in one testament that means we can't talk about it at all. Well, I got news for you. In the intertestamental period, they're doing this all the time, and that's why the New Testament has it too, because these terms are being used to describe that enemy. And there's like, no, there's like no referee with a whistle. You know, he doesn't blow the whistle. Oh, you can't use this term talking about referencing Genesis 3 because it's not there. Like, again, I don't know why scholars think the way they do half the time because it's like, I can't say this thing unless there's a bunny trail everywhere that I want to go. Well, the people you're studying, the text you're studying, didn't need the bunny trail. They do it. So just, just kind of go with the flow. You know, loosen up. There it is. Just make the connections. They do, they do it too, and you'll be okay. Okay, like your degree is not going to disintegrate off your wall, okay, if you do this. It really isn't. I've tried. <laughs> okay, it, it's not going to happen. But, you know, scholars just think, they just think differently than normal people, I guess. <laughs> Genesis 6, okay? Again, we're all familiar with this passage. Sons of God, daughters of men. Nephilim on the earth in those days and also afterward. <clears throat> well, for sure, we need to strip the supernatural out of this puppy because this one just gets a little weird, you know? Just, so the sons of God have to be just normal guys and the Nephilim have to just be normal guys and guys and girls doing what guys and girls do. And, oh, it's just awful isn't it? Again, and if you've read the book or if you've heard me at, at any point, you know that I think views that, that try to strip the supernatural out of Genesis 6, and <clears throat> I have to be careful here, <laughs> are ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, did I use that word already? <laughs> you know, and what I mean by that is, look, <clears throat> you know, no, nobody, I mean, it, People who were reading the, these texts who were not sort of conditioned to not let them say what they plainly say um, took a supernatural view of this. They weren't troubled, you know, by some of the questions that, that pop into our heads. You know, well, how does this work? You know, and they're, they're, they're not there. They, they, they reflexively do this. And, and two of the people that do that are Peter and Jude. So now you've got a problem which is why you'll read all sorts of exegetical gymnastics that will say things like Peter and Jude, they weren't thinking about Genesis 6. Well, what about the angels that sinned? Oh, well, that was some other rebellion that we probably don't have preserved. Well, that's nice. So in other words, you're basing your position on something that doesn't exist in the text, right? Yes, that would be correct. Yeah, but you know, but they'll, be, they'll be content to do that. Well, what about the, the great rebellion of the, you know, the third of the angels and all this stuff you know, before creation and, and all this kind of stuff? I've tried really hard to find that in Genesis, but I can't. In fact, the only place you will find it in Revelation 12 associates, associates it with the first coming of the Messiah, which was a little after creation. Okay? So the chronology doesn't work there. 
The only, the only reference you get to angels sinning is Genesis 6. And not only that, but Peter will use vocabulary like, you know, having them being chained in gloomy darkness. Okay, tartarao, you know, sent to Tartarus, you know, which, again, our translations typically obscure a lot of hell or Hades or something like that. Well, that, again, that's vocabulary that comes right out of the, you know, Greco-Roman Titan story. And there are two, actually two Titan stories, but one of them has, again, cohabitation between divine beings and human women, and they produce kind of funky offspring. Okay, that, this is just what you get. And Peter and Jude are obviously familiar with that stuff, and they're not flustered by it at all. They embrace it. They bring it into their text. This, it just is what it is. So you can say that Peter and Jude were wrong. I mean, you can do that, but that's, that's basically what you have to do to eviscerate or, you know, you know, cut the supernatural out of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. But having, all, having said all that, what I think the, the real significant thing is, is the, um, the Mesopotamian context. Now, I don't, I don't have a lot of this in Unseen Realm. So unless you have read Anas's article, and I've recommended it several times on my website. If you go up to my website, and it is actually working today. It, hasn't, it wasn't working earlier this week, um, but we knew about that. Um, if you put in his last name, A-N-N-U-S, and put in something like Watchers, Okay, you're going to find this article on my site. It is available online. I don't know who posted it online, but it's there, so go get it. Uh, but the reason why this is important, I mean, Anas is not the first... <coughs> he's not the first person to draw attention to... Before his time, people would, would say it is a possible context for Genesis 6, 1 through 4. He is the person who's done the most work here, and it's very recent. So his article that you can get on my site is, was written in 2010. What that means is that every commentary that your pastor has, okay, that he's going to pull off the shelf to resist you and your ideas and Mike and his ideas, is by definition obsolete out of the gate. If it's not written past 2010, and if it doesn't interact with this material, it doesn't have a prayer of interpreting the passage in its own context. That's just the way it is. You may not like it, but that's the way it is. Scholars, scholars actually do stuff, and they learn things. I mean, I know that's kind of shocking. Okay, but, I mean, they don't, they don't just sit there and twiddle their... Th if they were like medical doctors, you could say, oh, they're playing golf. And what, what, like, what do the other ones do? They play asteroids or something. Or, you know, angry birds, you know, that's what they do all day. Um, some of them are at the asteroid phase. I, I mean, I would be. <laughs> you know, the scholarship advances. And Honest's article is a wonderful case of it. I'm going to take you through some of, some of what he says in the article. In the Mesopotamian story, there's, there's a backstory here that is very clear that this is what the this is what Genesis six one through four was shooting at. This is why these four verses even exist in the in the text. The writer was was shooting at something very very deliberate. This is a quote from Annas, the Mesopotamian Apkalus. Now Apkalu was a Mesopotamian. Before the flood, they were completely divine. After the flood, they're not. Okay. After the flood, they're a, for lack of a better term, they're a mixture. They're a hybrid between divine and human, and they also happen to be giants. Okay, if it gives you a little, a little idea where we're headed here. Okay, Abkalu were the, were the wise men. They are, they are cast as the culture heroes of Mesopotamia, the great divine minds that brought civilization to humans, dispensed it from, from their divine realm to humans, and this is the Mesopotamian explanation for why they're just so great. Why Mesopotamia is just so great, especially Babylon. Okay, this is why we're ahead of the game because the gods gave us all this knowledge. That's who the Apkalus were. Now the Apkalus are the ones who are going to get demonized as the sons of God and their sons, the Nephilim. And those figures in later Enochic literature appear as the Watchers and the Giants, illegitimate teachers of humankind. So Annas is saying 
this is the focus point, these Apkalu guys. Greenfield in DDD, Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible, if you're going to buy one reference book about this kind of stuff, this is the one, DDD. It says this, In Mesopotamian religion, the term Apkalu, Sumerian Abgal, is used for the legendary creatures endowed with extraordinary wisdom. Seven in number, they are the culture heroes from before the flood. Scholars of Mesopotamia, the scribes, Annas points out, you know, the, 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 the guys who were in charge of the professors of their day, if you will, in, in Mesopotamia, they wanted to align themselves with the Apkalu, basically saying, well, we're so smart because we're in touch with, their, with the divine knowledge. We inherited it from them. You know, and, and so they'd have an uppity student at some point in one of their classes say, well, how did you get that after the flood? Like, how do you... And so they, this is their version of, of how that knowledge was transmitted. The scholarly writings of the scribes in Mesopotamia are specifically linked to the Apkalu by a very deliberate tactic. The scribes would title their own works with names given to the Apkalu. This telegraphed the point that I'm your professor because I'm in touch with the gods. Okay, I, we inherited this information from them. So shut up and listen. Okay? We know what we're talking about. Other Mesopotamian texts actually provide evidence for four post-flood Apkalu. These Apkalu are key players, again, in understanding Genesis 6, 1 through 4. So to, to give you the story, the Apkalu are running around, and they're the heroes because they're giving humans knowledge. They're wonderful. But some of the other gods don't really like humans. They're just, again, they're kind of icky. They make a lot of noise, so we got to get rid of them. You know, in some of the Mesopotamian stories, that's like, they're too noisy down there. Let's just kill them off, you know. So, <laughs> so don't, don't laugh. You probably thought that with your kids, you know. It's just, <laughs> right? So they decide, okay, we're, we're going send, to send the flood. We're going to put a stop to all this. You know, we're going we're gonna to punish them. And, again, there are different versions for why the, you know, the, the flood comes in Mesopotamia. But the Apkalu, again, they, you know, there's this concern about, well, you know, we've taught them all this stuff, and you know, what, what's going to happen? You know, how, you know, how do, how do we, you know, deal with this issue now? And so, what you have is you have the story of the flood, and then after the flood, you actually have texts that list out the Apkalu next to the king that they they trained. Okay, <clears throat> and then then you have the flood, and then it, after the flood, there's a text that has four post-flood Apkalu, and they are specifically described from that point on in, in a different way than they are pre-flood. Before the flood, they're classified in, in, in cuneiform as completely divine, but after the flood, they are said to be of human descent. Again, the, the only possible impl implication is that they had hu at least one human parent. And more than that, one of them is described as being only two-thirds Apkalu. So you have, again, this sort of hybridized kind of language used of the Apkalu after the flood. The two-thirds description becomes important because this is the same description as our Gilgamesh expert, Brian, <laughs> can tell us. Uh, this is the, the description used of Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh is, is going to be linked to the Apkalu in, in some pretty specific ways. But presumably, this is Ann Kilmer now. She's another scholar who actually wrote before Honest. But this is about all she says in her article. She doesn't really run with it. She says, humans and Apkalu could presumably mate, since we have a description of the four post-flood Apkalu as of human descent, the fourth only two-thirds, as opposed to pre-flood pure Apkalu and subsequent human sages, the Umanu. So... You know, you, you have this mixture, but you, then you get this, this hybridization thing going on. Now, we're not told directly that Marduk is angry because of the cohabitation, but what we are told is that after the flood, they are of human descent, the Apkalu are, and Marduk is ticked. Marduk gets angry with the Apkalu and consigns them to the netherworld, never to return. Does that sound familiar? Okay, so we, we get that much in the Mesopotamian material. 
They violate the divine order, again, the way Marduk wanted things to happen in the Babylonian version. Somehow, some sort of cohabitation is part of that. Before they were divine, then we've got a mixture after the flood. Marduk's mad, sends them to the underworld. And again, back to the two-thirds thing. Let's skip ahead here. The two-thirds thing used of Gilgamesh is important because Gilgamesh is not only called master of the Apkalu, but he's also described as a giant. Now, that's the real quick and dirty version of every point, every point in Genesis 6, 1 through 4 has a counterpoint in the Mesopotamian Apkalu story. That ought to suggest <laughs> that, again, the, when the biblical writer writes Genesis 6, 1 through 4, it's not a coincidence that what is written there matches up to this Mesopotamian story. And not only that, but if we go back here, again, and we talk about where they're sent, the underworld, they're kept in a chasm, the Apsu, an abyss containing fiery pillars situated at the end of the great earth. Great earth is an unusual phrase. It's a name in the netherworld, for the netherworld in Mesopotamian texts. Kigal in Sumerian, the expression is found in the name of the Mesopotamian queen of the underworld, Eresh Kigal, the great earth, okay? They wind up in, for lack of a better term, Mesopotamian hell. Uh, you know, it's not hell like you know, we, we think of in the New Testament, but it's, it's the underworld. It's the realm of the dead. The Enochian material, the material written after the biblical stuff but before the New Testament, okay, intertestamental, Second Temple Jewish literature, for some reason, and there are academic explanations for this that, that make sense. But again, the quick version is, for some reason, Whoever's writing the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees and some of these other books, the Book of the Giants from Qumran, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, whoever's writing this stuff knew the Apkalu story really well. And they write their version of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 with the Apkalu story in mind. So this is why Enoch has the offending watchers being sent to the realm of the dead and bound because that's what happens to the Apkalu. We don't read that in Genesis 6. You only got four verses there. You get hints of it a little bit later with some of the Rephaim who live in the, in the, in the, in the netherworld and passages like Ezekiel 32. You get a little, little bits and pieces of it. But whoever's writing the Enochian stuff is really well aware of this. And they preserve the original context for Genesis 6, 1 through 4. That's what they actually end up doing. You know, we, you know, we can know about it because we can go back today and read cuneiform stuff. That's what Honest did. That's what his whole article is about. Let's go back through, look at all the cuneiform stuff. Can we find, you know, have an eye toward Genesis 6, 1 through 4? Can we find that stuff in the Mesopotamian flood stories? Let's take another look at it. And so he did in 2010. And the results are, are just awesome. I mean, he did a great job. So we, we can look at that and we can kind of know, you know, what, what, they're sort of, what they're sort of fishing for. Because if we know the Mesopotamian Apkalu story, we can read Genesis 6, 1 through 4 and say, okay, sons of God, daughters of men, Nephilim, before and after the flood. Okay, we, we know what they're shooting at. But it's the Enoch stuff that adds their punishment. And that's the stuff that Peter and Jude pick up on and winds up in Peter and Jude. So you have a, you have a, a connection here. You've got Mesopotamian, original context. You've got Old Testament. You've got Second Temple period Judaism. And you've got the New Testament. And there are threads that run through all four of them. It doesn't mean they're all canonical or inspired. Again, that doesn't mean that at all. But what it means is that if you go back to Genesis 6, 1 through 4 and say, I don't like this creepy supernatural stuff. I'm just going to take that out. You break the chain. 
you lose the original context. And you not only lose the original context, but you pit your interpretation of Genesis 6 against what Peter and Jude are doing. And what Peter and Jude are doing, they're doing specifically because they know all the other stopping points. You don't. They do. So when you take one away, you not only mess up the meaning of the passage, but you create sort of a conundrum. I'll say it negatively this way. You, you put your context up against theirs and assume yours is superior. That's what you do. And you might be doing that because you want to protect people. You don't want people to think the Bible's this weird book with all the... Think about this. You don't want the Bible to, to seem like it's a spooky, supernatural book. Okay. <laughs> like, what's so normal about the virgin birth? Like, what's so normal about the hypostatic union? What's so normal? I mean, come on. But, but this is... You'll actually, I mean, I've had conversations with people where they're, oh, that's just, that's too creepy and weird, you know. It's, like, have you read the Bible at all? I mean, a lot of it is creepy and weird. <laughs> like, I mean, it's, it's not like, you know, Anne of Green Gables or something. I mean, it's just not that all the time. It just isn't. And I, and I like Anne of Green Gables, by the way. So I'm not dissing that. It's not a negative example. But, you know, I, for the life of me, I... I, you know, even to this day, I mean, I know why people do it, but I still don't get it because it, it, you, you have to literally turn a blind eye to what is going on. And, and it, it, it gets even worse or even better, depending on your perspective. This is the coolest thing for me in Anna's Anna, article. Archaeologists have actually uncovered figures of Apkalu. There's actually a whole book where you can get illustrations of Apkalu. You know. And... Apkalu, again, realize before the flood, you know, they're, it's, they're neutral. Before the flood, they're completely divine. They could be good or evil, whatever. After the flood, then that's when they get punished. That's when Marduk doesn't like them and all that. But they used to be buried underneath buildings, underneath foundations of buildings, to avert evil from the house or whatever the building was. Well, they're given a name. The figurines are called Matsare, which literally means in Akkadian, watchers. Oh, well, that doesn't mean watchers like over here. It just, <laughs> that's just a coincidence. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, Annas goes in, and he's not the only one. There's a guy named Stuckenbrook who writes a lot about the, the term Vureen watchers. Um, you know, that's what they called them. And so whoever's writing Enoch, again, to make sure that we don't miss the fact that I'm, I'm writing this about those Apkalu guys, okay? He actually takes the term watchers and puts it into Aramaic so that you get it. You can't miss it now. Hello, oh, it's, right, it's right over here. When you read this, I want you to be thinking of that. And they were. They were. We aren't. Because we either, again, don't, don't, you know, we know about the Old Testament and the New Testament. We don't know about this Mesopotamian stuff and all that awful Second Temple stuff, that Enoch stuff. That's just a heretical. Don't read that. Okay. You know, we, so we know two of the four points. We don't connect them. And then on top of that, we strip the supernatural out of it and we go, now we understand the passage. Really? <laughs> really? Can you explain that to me again? Uh, again, they, they would not have made these mistakes, but we do. Now, part of the Watcher story before we get into the Babel thing is the Apkalu in Mesopotamia, and this is why the story's there. This is why it's important. It wasn't just about a bunch of wise divine beings who happened to make Babel great, okay? Well, that's nice. Well, if you're a biblical person, if you're a biblical writer, if you're an Israelite or a Jew you know, living later on, what do you think of Babylon? Oh, I love those guys. <laughs> no. No. You're, you're, you're sitting there like in Ezekiel 1 by the river Kivar saying, we are the people of God. What in God's name are we doing here? How in the world did this happen to us? It's the exile. You don't like Babel. Okay, you don't like Babylon. But the Babylonians are having a field day with this. Okay. Well, we, we know why we're better. 
our gods are better. Marduk, you know, he's just uh, he's just a great guy, you know. And you know, we're we're just we're just so far ahead of you, little you know, Neanderthals, to use an anachronistic term. We're just so far ahead of you because we have the knowledge of the gods. So of course we win. Of course we're great. Of course there's none like us. So, the biblical writers want to say, well, okay, we have we actually look at this a little differently. We don't think this was a good thing for the Apkalu to share divine knowledge with humans because it, it actually contributed to their corruption. If you go back and Anas's article actually lists this, the, the craftsmen Apkalu that are listed, oh, they bear a close resemblance to all the knowledge that the watchers gave that corrupted humankind. Okay. Warfare arts, arts of seduction, astrology, all of those are, are Apkalu guys in the Mesopotamian stuff. Again, the, whoever's writing Enoch knows exactly what he's doing. Exactly what he's doing. This is bad. This is evil. This is wicked. It made people worse. It made them wicked. It made them corrupt. It didn't make you great. It made you awful. Look at yourself. You know, and, and, and not only that, but this whole idea of, of your knowledge and, and these Apkalu surviving the flood, you know, in like Gilgamesh, the giants and stuff like this, not only did the knowledge make you bad and make you evil and corrupt humanity, but it actually resulted in certain people groups coming out of that that specifically we had to fight, we had to go up against in the conquest who were bent on our annihilation. This was not a good thing. And so Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is there to say just that. These are not good guys. This is not a good thing. You need to look at this differently. And then you get, you know, in the prophets, you get the whole Marduk versus Yahweh thing going on. That's, you know, there's a lot of that in the prophets. I mean, the, the biblical writers are constantly trying to say, God is still in control. We are still the people of God. We got our butts kicked because we're apostates. Because we deserved it. And yes, the innocent do suffer with the guilty. But that's why we're here. But it's also why, you know, because God is still in control, why we're not going to be left here either. So Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is, is again trying to awaken their own readers to the fact that, look, no matter what you hear from these Babylonian people, Okay. They are not inherently superior. Their gods are not superior to our God. This was not a good thing. Okay. You need to be thinking differently about this whole series of events. Because out of, out of what they think is wonderful, there were certain pe people groups, certain bloodlines that sought our extermination. We're still here. Okay, we're in exile, but we're still here. And we're here because God helped us defeat them. And he's going to do it again. It's why, you know, episodes in the conquest, Numbers 13 is connected back to Genesis 6-4. It's why we get the dimensions of Og's bed, which correspond precisely to the dimensions of Marduk's sacred marriage bed. Creating connections. Okay, that's what they're about. So the world is messed up, and we're in a bad place, but we're not going to be here forever. It's a very deliberate reason. And then the Babel event, again, Deuteronomy 32, 8, when the Most High divided the nations, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. If your Bible doesn't say that, it might say, well, it would say sons of Israel. And again, you can read my, my article that I linked to, or I, I linked to it on the website, on my Divine Council website, the, thedivinecouncil.com. You know, I have a journal article on this. You can get all the text critical stuff and impress your friends and all this. You know, talk about you know origins, hexapla, and all that. Okay, you don't need any of that. <clears throat> it's good because it's it's reality. Okay, you're, you're, you you, know, you you need to realize that the, the, what I'm saying here is based in textual information. But all you really need to do is think about the passage. Passages that say, when the Most High divided the nations, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of Israel. Okay, well, 
the division of the nations, if, if that goes back to Babel, why would sons of Israel make any sense? Well, it doesn't because Israel didn't exist yet. It creates a conundrum with the, with the flow of biblical history. God's not going to dividing, be dividing the nations up according to, to, to a nation that doesn't exist yet. It only exists afterwards because that's where you get verse 9. Yeah, Israel is Yahweh's portion. Now, this, this is a picture of the Dead Sea Scroll that reads sons of God. The correct reading is sons of God. I, can, I could fill your afternoon with text-critical reasons why sons of God is the correct reason or the correct reading. But again, you just need to think about what's going on in the passage. The division of the nations, Babel, Israel doesn't exist yet. Israel's not listed in the table of nations. The nations that were supposed to be the ones that got divided, you go back and read Genesis 10, go through the list, guess who's not there? Israel is not there. It's not there for a very good reason because God hasn't called Abraham yet. He does that in chapter 12. And, and what's, what's the teaching point? You know, the, the, the whole point is, what is Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 describing? Contrary to God's wishes for people after the flood to carry out the Edenic mandate. Okay, now let's, let's go make the world like, like Eden was. Let's restore God's good rule. Let's restore the kingdom. You know, let, let's tell the world about the true God and, and do all this Edenic original stuff. You know, let's kickstart the kingdom of God here again. But to do that, you got to go out there and do it. Instead, no, we, we, we congregate here at Shinar, at Babel, and we want to make a name for ourselves, so we're going to build this tower. Okay, we want to become famous. Well, you know, again, everybody agrees in Old Testament scholarship that this is a ziggurat, step kind of pyramid thing. You know, you, you get them in Mesopotamia, including one in Babylon. Well, what was one of those? They were part of temple complexes. So if you build one and you want it to reach high into the sky, because the gods live there too, and we don't, you know. The mountains, gardens, the sky, the ocean, you know, all this kind of stuff. What you're doing is you're building a house for the deity. You want the deity to come to you. You want the true God to come here. That's what's going to make you famous. If you want to talk to the real, the true God, you come here. We build him a house. God says, no, 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 no. I will not be tamed I am not on a leash. The idea wasn't for me to come to you. It's for you to do what I told you to do. Because we have this thing, this Edenic thing, the, the kingdom of God thing that I want to cover the whole earth. we got to get that started again, fellas. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And they're thinking, like, no, 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 no. no. Let, let's build one of these and God will come to us. And so God gets fed up. And he disinherits humanity. He divorces them. So when the Most High scatters the nations, he says, fine, you don't want me to be your God. You want somebody else to be your God. Maybe no God at all, but you don't want me or else you'd be listening to what I say. Let's try that out. I'm going to divorce you, disinherit you. There's no longer going to be a direct relationship between you and me. I'm going to assign you. I'm going to allot you under the rulership, under the authority of lesser Elohim. I'm going to put you under the authority of the sons of God. Now, we know what from what Paul says in Acts 17. I mean, Paul had an inkling that, okay, this is somehow, you know, what the, the, the fixing of the boundaries of the nations was somehow going to be part of God's plan for bringing people to the knowledge of the true God and ultimately to the gospel. And, you know, we, again, Paul has this inkling. Well, again, this... Think, think about the Old Testament logic. What God does is he divorces them. And then he says, okay, I'm going to show you how it was supposed to be done. I've divorced all of you, so now I need a new people. Okay, I'm going to go over to this guy, Abraham, in Ur, and I'm going to call him, and he's too old to have kids, and his wife's too old to have kids, but now watch. Okay, I'm going to raise up for myself my own inheritance. Jacob is my allotted heritage. Israel is my portion on the planet. I've consigned the rest of you under the authority of other lesser Elohim. Hopefully they will rule according to my justice. They'll be like me. Hopefully you will be able to look at my people now, Israel, 
as what life would be like if you were living in relationship to me. And if, if my people follow the law, they'll be happy. They'll have good lives. I will bring them to a land. They'll enjoy life. That land is now sort of a mini Eden or a new Eden. At least it's supposed to be because I'm there. I'm there. Heaven is going to meet earth again. I will occupy that space. That will be sacred space. They will be a kingdom of priests between me and you. And they're supposed to attract you back to wanting a relationship with me, not one of these other guys. So let's, let's see how that goes. Of course, it doesn't go well because according to Psalm 82, the gods become corrupt. They, get, they seduce the Israelites into worshiping them. The whole thing, you know, just sort of blows up because humans are wicked, because they are corrupted, again, by other forces, you know, outside of their own nature. And they got a lot, people, we have a lot working against us, okay? But this was the plan. This is, this is the rest of the biblical story. This is why it's Israel against the nations. It's why it's Yahweh against the gods, because this relationship deteriorates into one of hostility and antipathy. It becomes a turf war. This is why Paul, when Paul talks about the forces of darkness, yeah, he uses the word demons a few times. He does that when he quotes Deuteronomy 32. I don't know. But look at his vocabulary. Principalities, powers, rulers, authorities, thrones, dominions. They all have one thing in common. They are all terms used in other contexts of geographical dominion. Okay. Paul uses it because that's what the Old Testament worldview is. That's the worldview he inherits. You know, Daniel 10, attaching divine beings, princes, prince of, the, you know, prince of Persia, prince of Greece, to what's going on geopolitically down here. This is the Old Testament worldview. But it's rivalry, it's antipathy, it's hostility. It's not what it's supposed to be. And so ultimately the Messiah isn't, he doesn't just have to deal with what happened in the Garden of Eden, does he? The Messiah has to deal with the corruption brought by the watchers in Genesis 6. You've got to fix that problem too. See, the Genesis 3 problem is about the fact that now that you've aligned yourself to the Nakash, and I've cast the Nakash down to the realm of the dead, you went with him. He, in effect, owns your soul. You will die and you will not be in relationship to me. You are not only cast out of the garden, there is no more Eden. You are not only going to die mortally, but you will be forever separated from me. That's a problem. God wants to fix that. So that's what needs to be fixed out of Genesis 3. What needs to be fixed out of Genesis 6 is human depravity, just generally, broadly speaking. And what happens to be fixed, or what needs to be fixed out of Genesis 11 is the Messiah is not just the Messiah to the Jew only. I want every nation back into the fold. Every tongue, every language, every race, every you know, fill in the blank, it all has to come back full circle to me. So we've got three rebellions that the Messiah needs to take care of, not just one. And if you have that in, in, you know, in, your, in your head, you will read certain passages. And again, some bells and whistles will go off of what the New Testament writer is, is thinking. Now, a lot of that content you know, is, is going to be foreign. I'm actually, the, the book I'm working on now, you know, since you came here, I can tell you about the book, The Secret Knowledge here. <laughs> now I'm, I'm working on a book that's that's that is tentatively titled, and I, I like the title. So, I, of course, I lost my last title, but uh, I, I really wanted the myth that was true for the unseen realm. But anyway, I lost that battle. I'm not going to lose this one. Uh, it's it's tentatively called "Reversing Hermon." Hermon was where the Watchers descended, you know, to to do. They make their pact together to corrupt humanity. And the subtitle is The Importance of the Sin of the Watcher Story in the New Testament. 
because the New Testament trickles in, this trickles into the New Testament in lots of places, you know, that, that you wouldn't ordinarily just sort of pick up on. And I'm astonished, no, there's no book been written like this. All of the elements, I mean, I, I'm reading, I was reading a dissertation on the plane. It's going to be you know, part of a chapter. I mean, in scholarly, scholarly literature, this stuff is, is you know, commonly discussed, but nobody's like assembled it into one book, one book and talked about, hey, why is, why is Enoch important for New Testament interpretation? Okay, so that, that's where we're going with that. But there's, there's just a lot of it that bleeds into you know, things. Cosmic geography, again, we're, we're, we can stop here. What time is it? Is it a good time to stop or should we? 11.24, yeah, good, good time to stop. But yeah, the cosmic geography, again, we've, we've tried to track through the, through the three. I could, should I go to noon? We can just do some of the two powers stuff, okay. Cosmic geography, I mean, it is important because it not only, it not only sort of sets the tone for Israel and the nations and the whole gospel plan about the Messiah not just being for Israel, but again, the nations being a target of this. But there are also places in the Old Testament, again, that, that are more readily comprehensible if you have this cosmic geography thing rolling around in your head. I, I have a list here. We can, we can include some others. I've already mentioned Daniel 10. But in 1 Samuel 26, remember when David is running away from Saul, like he does most of the time, He's running away from Saul, and he, he has to leave Judah, and he has to go live with the Philistines for a while. And he says in this passage, you know, oh, woe is me, is Mike's translation. Oh, oh woe is me. You know, what am I going to do now? How can I pray to the Most High? You know, how can I, how can I pray? You know, how can I talk to God? And you're thinking, well, well, just talk, David. I mean, that's what we do, you know. Or, you know, is David denying omni, you know, omnipresence? Well, of course not. You know, what, what he's talking about here is David has a sense that for me to be in communication with Yahweh, my God, I need to be in Yahweh's turf. And I'm no longer there. I'm, I'm like living over where other gods are. And I, you know, he, he has this sense that I'm kind of cut off here. You know, is God going to listen to me because of what's, you know, my situation? So it gives you a little little feel for it. Nam and the leper, 2 Kings 5, is a, is a favorite story here. Again, you, you probably heard me go through this, so you know, again, just rapidly. For those who haven't, this is one of those Sunday school passages, Sunday school stories that we hear all the time. You know, Naaman has leprosy. The little slave girl that, you know, wound up in, in Syria, you know, says to him, well, what's your problem, Captain? You know, you, you got leprosy. Why don't you just go down and talk to the prophet? You know, he'll take care of that. And he looks at her like, you know, who are you? But, you know, she said, convinces him, go, you know, go talk to the prophet. You'll take, take care of your leprosy problem. So he gets his buddies, you know, his, his soldier companions. They go down. The prophet won't even come out to meet him. Yeah, I know who you are. Big deal. You know, you're not even worth my time to come out of the tent. Go wash yourself in the Jordan seven times and get out of here. Okay, I mean, again, paraphrasing. And he's insulted. And he's ready to go home. He throws a little temper tantrum. You know, doesn't this guy know who I am? And one of his, one of his uh, you know, assistants says, well, you know, if, if he had told you to do something spectacular, like, when, would you have done it? Well, sure. That's what I was expecting. Well, he gave you something simple to do. Why don't you just go do it? Okay. You know, so he goes, dips himself seven times, comes out clean. Okay, again, we, we all know the story. You know, he's making fun of the Jordan while he's on his way. You know, this little, you know, who peed in this thing? You know, just, it's really bad. So, but he comes out clean. And so now he's thrilled. Okay, he, he goes back to Elisha, and this time the, the prophet will talk to him. And he says, now I know that Yahweh is the God of gods. Well, that's a good thing to know. It comes in handy. And then what does he ask for permission to take back with him? Dirt. dirt. He said, can I load my mule with as much dirt as it, it'll carry? You know? And then he, even, he tries to explain a little bit. We only get a little bit of an explanation. You know, Look, I'm an important guy. And 
part of my job is I live in Syria, you know, I got to go into the temple of Ramon and the king, I take the king in there, you know, we do this little fiddle faddle thing. And, you know, he, he goes in there with me and he's old and when he bends over, you know, I kind of got to hold on to him and he holds on to me. And you get this whole rigmarole and, you know, we, we don't know what he wants to do with the dirt. Like, is he going to put some in his pockets, you know? Wear a little around his neck in a pouch. He's going to throw some in there, you know, the Temple of Ramon, so he can walk, you know, over, you know, holy ground. But, but that's the point. That's why he's asking for dirt. He wants Yahweh's dirt because it's Yahweh. It's either going to protect him or he just, he just wants Yahweh to know that, okay, I got to go into this temple, but I'm still like your guy. And he, he doesn't know much, but what he knows is that you know, that dictates his response. And Elisha says, yeah, that'll work. Go ahead, take all you can carry, you know. <laughs> Have fun, you know. I got an extra bag in the back, you know. <laughs> so, again, it's just this story. You know, that the, in First Samuel, you know, when the, when the Ark of the Covenant gets taken by the Philistines. Again, we, all, we love to laugh at this one in Sunday school and... Oh, they put, put, him in the, put the ark in the temple of Dagon. Dagon gets his arms and his limbs chopped off and his head. He's just a stump, you know, ha, ha, ha. And it, and it is funny. Okay, I'll admit it. It's kind of comical. But what we miss is that when, they, when, the, when the priests say, okay, we've got to get rid of this thing, you know, like just you know, send it on a cart and get it out of here. And we miss this little throwaway line in 1 Samuel. I think it's either 4 or 5. I think it's 4. I can't remember exactly, but it says, to this day... The priests of Dagon refused to walk over the threshold where they found Dagon. I mean, there they are. They're in their own temple. And it's like, oh, there's the spot we found Dagon. Let's walk around. Okay, why? Because they know it's under dominion. That is not Dagon's turf anymore. This is where Dagon was defeated. Right here. We aren't taking any chances. We don't want to end up like Dagon. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, they just have this sense that of, of this, again, just geographical kind of ownership thing going on. This cosmic turf war, it's cosmic geography. You know, after lunch, we'll talk about some, where Jesus goes in certain places and what he says in certain places actually matters because those places have a very deep history in some of this cosmic geographical stuff. And so Jesus goes to certain places and says things very deliberately. Uh, and again, he, he knows what this place is associated with, and he has some things to say. And again, his readers, his readers, the original context, they're going to know too. But we, we miss a lot of these things you know, as we go through. Anyway, we, let's just stop there. We can sort of create a new schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a, a little bit about the two powers stuff and then go into New Testament stuff because two powers... Uh, kind of gives us a nice uh, segue into that because ultimately it's going to be about Christology uh, and Jesus. And then we'll, you know, there, there will be some things that, you know, we, we could talk about that I, I may mention. But, you know, Q&A is, is not designed to be extra time for me to talk about what I want to talk about. It's actually supposed to be Q&A. You know, lo and behold, so we will do our best to do that. Now, again, a lot of you are familiar with the, the two powers stuff uh, that I do and talk about, especially, again, if you've read the book. But for those who are not, of course, you have the Shema, very familiar uh, creedal statement from Judaism, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. <clears throat> this is, I, I bring this up because how could a Jew affirm that and then write this? No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. Okay. How do you pull that off? He has made him known. Now, you know, John is a Jew. He knows the Shema. What in the world is going on here? Uh, at one time in, in Judaism, Judaism used to affirm something that they used to uh, talk about positively as the two powers in heaven idea. This is not dualism, one good guy, one bad guy, of equal weight. Okay, it's not uh, you know, Marvel Comics or anything like that. 
These were two good guys, okay, two powers in heaven. And that idea falls into ill repute, disrepute, at around the second century. Again, not coincidentally the time you know, when we have the advent of Christianity and a few other things going on. But Judaism at one point in its history essentially had a Godhead teaching. And they get it from their Old Testament. So when you have a, a Jew like John who writes this, of course, knowing the Shema, he, he's not thinking when he's writing this, oh, <clears throat> this is good. I get to deny my faith in the God of Israel now. He's not thinking that at all. So he's sort of the exemplar for just the average question, even for Jewish converts in the book of Acts or whatever. You know, how is it that the, these people, Jews, who refused even on pain of death to worship another god, how could they at the same time turn around and embrace Jesus as God in the flesh, worship him, sing praises to him, and talk about him the way they do. How, how could they do that and not feel like they were violating the formative creedal statement of the Old Testament? How, how does that work? And it, it's a big deal. I mean, it's still a big deal for, for Jews I've met. Um, again, we're going to go through this real quickly, but there's, there's a whole rabbinic discussion about the two powers prior to the second century. And just an example of one verse. The, the, the rabbis would, would pick up on, on different verses that they knew, looking at it, was a little bit odd. There was something odd in them. Genesis 19.24, this is the Sodom and Gomorrah story, which I'm sure all of you have read. But you look at this, and what's odd about it? You tell me. Yeah, it sounds like there's two Yahwehs. You know, Yahweh raining fire upon Sodom and Gomorrah, or, you know, sulfurous fire. And, and that sulfur, sulfurous fire happens to be from Yahweh. So how can Yahweh, you know, send this sulfurous fire from Yahweh? Just, it, it, just, it was just odd. And, you know, rabbis would, would notice these things and discuss them. Again, the major book on this, if you're interested, is still in print. It was printed in 1977, The Two Powers in Heaven, by Alan Siegel. Siegel uh, passed away a few years ago. He was a Jew, Jewish scholar, rabbinic scholar, and his book is about the history of this idea in Judaism. He goes through all the rabbinic material, uh, again, establishing the fact that, yep, we used to teach this. <laughs> and boy, it's a, it's heretical, isn't it? You know, I mean, because he, he was a Jew. He, he doesn't want to go along with it, but his book is just about, yeah, this used to be part of our theology. Again, until the second century AD. Other passages, Daniel, again, you have the Ancient of Days seated, and then you have, you know, the description, which is, you know, all familiar to us, hair like lamb's wool, thrown in tongues of flame, just like Ezekiel 1. I mean, we know who this is, the wheels, the whole bit. And then the court sat, again, divine council meeting, the books were open, one like a human being, you know, one like a son of man, a human one, came with the clouds of heaven, dominion, glory, and kingship were given to him. There's something else about this passage that I don't have in red. I don't even know if you can see the color there. <clears throat> this whole motif of the coming upon the clouds, okay, which I'm not going to get into specifically here. I'll get into some other two power stuff, but I'll mention this this much. In the ancient Near Eastern world, the epithet, the one who comes with the clouds or the one who comes upon the clouds or the one who rides the chariot in the clouds, something like that, that was a known epithet for Baal. Okay, Baal is not an underling. He's not just an angel. Okay, I'm saying this for like Jehovah's Witnesses because Jehovah's Witnesses like to take deity language used of Jesus and say, oh, he's just an angel and a created being and all this kind of stuff. Well... The coming on the upon, uh, upon the clouds thing is a big deal because of the way it gets used in the New Testament when Jesus is on trial because it goes back to Daniel 7. But anyway, you, you get this well-known deity phrase. The Old Testament writers use this deity phrase that everybody, Jew or outside of Judaism, you know, whether you're an Israelite or not, they know what, what this is because Baal was such a big deal in the ancient world. Baal was worshipped even in the Roman period. Okay, he's, He's, he's just a big figure. And 
the biblical writers in the Old Testament use the phrase four times of Yahweh of Israel. And the reason was Baal was a, was a storm god. He's, he was the god that was perceived as giving us rain. You know, Baal's a wonderful guy because he gives us rain. That means our crops grow. That means we get to eat. Okay, it means our, our animals get to eat. We're alive because Baal sends us rain and we can survive and always wonderful. Okay? Well, the biblical writers are like, no, 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 no. Baal isn't the one who controls this stuff. It's Yahweh of Israel. So they would take this label and stick it on Yahweh, you know, to, to make this theological point. Well, the only place they don't do that, there's one other occurrence, and it's Daniel 7. Here it's applied to a second figure, aside from the God of Israel. And so Jesus knows this. I mean, he, the Jews knew it. This was one of, their, one of the, the, the primary texts in Judaism for, to reinforce this, the two powers in heaven teaching was this one right here, Daniel 7. So when Jesus is on trial in front of Caiaphas, and Caiaphas says, come on, tell us who you are. You know, quit beating around the bush. And he says, okay, okay, you know, listen up, Caiaphas. You know, I don't want you to miss this. Said, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds, you know, in great glory. Okay, that, you want to know who I am? I'm the guy in Daniel 7 who's the cloud rider. And Caiaphas tears his clothes, says this is blasphemy. He knows instantly what Jesus is saying. And every Jew would have because they have this two powers thing. There's, there's Yahweh, but then there's like this other Yahweh. There's like two of them. And in the book Unseen Realm, I refer to it as the two Yahweh figures. But you have Tunis, you have Godhead going on there. And Siegel, again, spends a lot of time on this passage. But I want to show you some specific passages, just a handful, again, because I want to just do some other things, where you get the, the, the two powers thing going on. Now, we all know Exodus 3. Burning bush, we've seen Charlton Heston. Okay, we, we all know that. So who's in the bush? Well, God's in the bush. Well, he is. Who else is in the bush? <laughs> I mean, there's two in the bush, okay? Angel of, the Yah angel of Yahweh, angel of the Lord. And again, you know, Yahweh sees him that he had come to look aside. God calls it. You got at least two in the bush. I mean, some would say three, but I think it's two, okay? You have the God of Israel and this angel, guy. They're in the burning bush, calling Moses. Exodus 23, I'm sending an angel. You know, God says to Moses, this is after Sinai. They've gotten the law. It's time to start doing stuff, you know, to prepare for the journey to Canaan, the promised land, and all that. And God pulls Moses aside one day and says, hey, I'm sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses. Why? Since my name is in him. Now, in Hebrew, the name is Shem. The word for name is Shem. Hashem is the name. And if you have Jewish friends today, they still speak of God himself this way. Now, when I was in graduate school, we had one professor who, who would not allow us to, to say Yahweh in class. Um, when he, and he, you know, he told, he didn't like freak out too much. <laughs> if we forgot, <laughs> depending on what mood he was in, to be honest. Um, he would say, now when we're reading in class and we encounter the divine name, the four consonants, he says, you either say Adonai, which means Lord, that's, that's your substitute, or you say Hashem the name. And he was fine if we remembered to do either one of those two things. You know, if you slipped up, then he, you know, he would let you know. Uh, but, but Hashem, the name, is a way of referring to God himself. Deuteronomy, you get lots of these passages that where, where God talks about, hey, when we get to the promised land, there's this place that I have chosen to establish my name. Okay. The promised land is spoken of as the place where God will set up or establish his name. It doesn't mean that, hey, when we get in there, we got to go to this place, and then I need somebody to scrawl four consonants in the ground or on a rock. No, it's, it's not a spelling lesson, okay? The, the, the language is about this is where I am going to dwell, this place that I will choose to set my name. I will establish my name. Psalm 20, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. 
Some trust in chariots, some in horses. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. Again, the, the picture is not this. Well, here we have the Israelites. They're ready to go out to battle or their, their town is under siege or whatever. And they're not, you know, they're, they're not out there in the battlefield saying, okay, you know, bring it on, Philistines, bring it on, Assyrians. You know, the Assyrians are, I refer to as the Klingons of the Old Testament. <laughs> That's basically what they were, man. They, they were just awful. You didn't want to run into a Klingon. <laughs> Okay, and Assyrian. So, but the idea is not, okay, you know, you're coming to attack us, watch this. And they go out and Y-H-W-H. There, there. Do, do something now. Oh, yeah, they're going to run over it. Okay, on their way to killing you. I mean, the, trusting in the name is not trusting in four consonants. It's trusting in a person, an entity, a deity. Okay, the God of Israel, this is the way you refer to God himself. You know, this language, Isaiah 30, it's personified. Lips full of fury, tongue like devouring fire. So you go back to Exodus 23 when God tells Moses, look, this angel is a little bit different. You better obey him. He will not pardon your transgressions. He's not going to overlook your offenses because my name is in him. In other words, I am in this guy. When you walk around and you see this guy, that's me. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not over there. doesn't mean I'm not still in the heavens. Okay? It's just that I can be there and I can be right there at the same time. And this is an embodied human. Okay, this is the way angels are always described. Captain of the Lord's host. Remember that? Joshua encounters the captain of the Lord's host. What, is, what does he say? You know, Take your shoes off your feet. Because the place where you're standing is holy ground. It's exactly the same thing that is said at the burning bush. He's God in human form. This is not a New Testament concept. This is an Old Testament concept. The angel who has the name. The angel who is Yahweh. But yet he's also not. Because God's sending him. So you, you get this talk in the Old Testament about the angel and the name as being a, a figure who is... Yahweh, because Yahweh is the name, but yet he's not because Yahweh told, told him what to do. It's kind of the way we talk about Jesus. Okay, Jesus is God, but he's also not. He's not the Father. Well, if he's not the Father, can he really be God? Well, of course he can be God. You know, you have these discussions. Okay, it's the same kind of category conceptualizing going on. It goes on in our head when we try to talk about Trinitarian stuff, when we try to you know, kind of grok that, you know, just wrap our minds around it. Well, this is the language you get in the Old Testament in certain passages. This is but isn't kind of thing going on. And this prepares people, it prepared Jews, for things like high Christology. Okay, that God could, could come as man and still be God there. Which one's God? The answer is yes. Okay, they, they, they could understand this in, in terms of, of it's a familiar idea. I mean, they, they can't necessarily explain it logically or whatever, but, but they know what's being talked about. One's not less than the other. They're both the same, but yet they're still different. So this thinking, you know, is part of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 4, who leads the people out of Egypt into the Promised Land? Well, here it's his presence. It's the panim. It's the presence of God. Well, I thought it was just. I thought it was the angel back in Exodus 23. Is it the angel or is it the presence? Well, back here in Judges 2. Well, here we have the angel again. The angel says, "Well, I'm the one who brought you up from Egypt, took you into the land which I had promised on oath to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you." Well, is it the angel? Is it the presence? I'm, I'm getting confused. Genesis 31. The angel of God comes to Jacob in verse 13. He says, I am the God of Bethel. Now that's important for Jacob because Bethel is the place where Jacob first encounters God. He builds him an altar there. Okay, you know, in, in Old Testament theology, you're not offering anything and building altars to alternate deities. Okay, you just don't do that. And here the angel says, I'm the God of Bethel. You've seen me before, Jacob. My favorite passage for this is Genesis 48. <clears throat> this is Jacob blessing Joseph's children, and you know, by proxy, Joseph. 
So there, you know, Jacob's on his deathbed, and we know the story about J- Joseph brings the boys, and then you know he crosses the arms, and you know the, the firstborn, and all that kind of stuff. You know, we have here. But what we miss when we tell the story is the blessing. So verse 15, Jacob blesses Joseph by saying, and there's three stanzas to this. The God in whose ways my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. The word there is Elohim, specifically Ha Elohim. Second stanza, the God who has been my shepherd from my birth to this day. What do you think the third one is going to be? The angel who has redeemed me from all harm. And here's the kicker. May he bless these boys, these lads. In Hebrew, the verb is singular. In other words, it's not proper to translate it, may they bless the boys. It's may he. Like I'm, I'm hopelessly confused now. You know, who does, who does Jacob want to bless Joseph's boys? Is it the angel or is it God? And the answer is, yep. (laughs) You know, it doesn't make any difference. They're the same, but yet they're different. There's two, but they're one, but they're still really two. You know, again, it's this whole Godhead thinking that we're familiar with as Christians. You get Judges 6, Gideon, angel of of the Lord shows up, sits under the terebinth at Ophrah, under the tree there. Verse 12, the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and says to him, the Lord is with you. You Yahweh is with you, valiant warrior. And Gideon's like, yeah, right, look around, man. This is a mess. Don't you see what's going on here? Why has all this bad stuff happened to us? And then look at verse 14. Yahweh turned to him. Oh, no, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, we have the angel of Yahweh speaking about Yahweh in the third person. But now Yahweh's talking. Okay, so is is like is Yahweh here another way to refer to the angel? Or are they both there? Are they both one? I mean, and, and again, whoever wrote Judges six doesn't really care. Take your pick. Yeah. <laughs> They're all the same. Okay, Yahweh turns to him. Go in this might of yours and save Israel from from the demon. Do not I send you? Okay, Yahweh says to him, you know, I'll be with you, so on and so forth. And then verse seventeen. There's pronouns. We don't know. Who's speaking about who? Because it's ambiguous. But anyway, you know, Gideon says, "Okay, I, I think I got it." But let me go make a little, a little gift, little sacrifice offering thing for you. Don't go away. Don't go away. I'll be right back. And so he says, "Okay, I'll stick around." So Gideon does what he needs to do. Comes back and he brings the stuff to him under the terebinth. Now that's of course where we saw the angel. The angel of God said to him, "Take the meat, the unleavened cakes, put them on a rock." And, he, and he reaches out the tip of his staff that was in his hand. Oh, by the way, the angel is embodied here. This is a language of embodiment. Touch the meat and the unleavened cakes, and they go up in flames. So then the angel of the Lord takes off. The angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Verse 22. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of Yahweh. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But Yahweh Yahweh's still there. He's still there. So the one guy takes off, the other one's still there. Well, what, you know, okay, Yahweh's there, the angel of Yahweh, and, you know, the, and it, sometimes it's hard to tell them apart, like who's talking about who and to whom, and, you know, what, what's going on here? You know, the, again, whoever wrote the account doesn't care. Yes, he could have made it perfectly explicit. Who is talking to who, who's standing where, all this kind of stuff. But they're both in the conversation because this is like Exodus 3. They're both in the bush. They're both, you know, having a discussion, you know, with Moses. The angel's there, you know, so that, you know, we have this embodied, you know, Yahweh idea again. The word of the Lord, again, we're used to this because of John 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Very familiar language. Well, that actually comes from somewhere. And it's not Platonic philosophy. <laughs> I mean, I love commentators. Oh, play, you know, John obviously was influenced by Gnosticism. Yeah. And, no, he actually read his Old Testament. <laughs> it's just it's Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. 
profound statement number five, I think. Okay, you ready? Got your pen ready? I would suggest to you that visions are things you see. <laughs> Got that down? Okay, this isn't a voice out of the ether, not a voice in the head. He's seeing something. And what he's seeing is the word of the Lord. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. 1 Samuel 3. Now the young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. And again, I suggest to you visions are things you see. It's not that, hey, it's rare for people to be walking around and having the voice of God in their head. No, what's rare is that God doesn't show up in human form like he, used, like he often did with the patriarchs. That wasn't, that wasn't typical anymore. Now Samuel, again skipping to verse 7, had not yet experienced the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. He'd never been visited before. He's just a, just a young boy there with Eli, taking care of the Ark of the Covenant and doing priest stuff. The Lord called Samuel again the third time. Now, we know the story. I'm, I'm skipping around in it, but they try to go, to go to sleep. Samuel hears this voice. Okay, Samuel, Samuel. He thinks it's Eli, so he gets up, runs over to where Eli's sleeping. And, of course, it's not him, and after a couple times, you know, it dawns on Eli, like, hey, well, it's not me, and it ain't you, so it must be God. Okay, so look here. Next time it happens, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Let's try that. So it happens again. The Lord called Samuel again the third time. And the Lord, again, Yahweh, came and stood. I would suggest to you that a word like standing isn't what you would use if you were referring to an, an object that isn't visible or wisps of smoke or rays of light or something like that. This is the embodied God of Israel. He comes and he, it's the Lord, it's Yahweh, came and stood calling as at the other times. Samuel. Samuel says, okay, I'm listening. And then, you know, they have, he gives them bad, bad news about Eli. We know the story, but I, I like it the way it ends. Samuel grew, and the Lord, Yahweh, was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. Why? The Lord appeared again at Shiloh, which is where they're at in 1 Samuel 3. And the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by or as the word of the Lord. Do you realize the word of the Lord is a reference to, in some passages, and we would look at a few here, as God in human form. So when John's writing about it later on, in the beginning was the word, the word was you know, with God, the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Jews aren't like, oh, this is freaking me out, man. What's he talking about? You know, is he eating mushrooms? You know, the reference to John Allegro there. <laughs> no, no, he's not. And you don't really even have to wonder about what he's talking about because if you had read your Old Testament, you know precisely what he's talking about. Except for this time, it's not just God in human form. This time it's God made flesh, human flesh, incarnation. I mean, this, this even ups the ante from where it's been. But the concept is the same. Jeremiah 1, call Jeremiah. We all know these passages. The word of the Lord came to me. There it is again. Jeremiah addresses the word of the Lord as Yahweh Elohim, Lord God. And then verse 7, but Yahweh said to him, so it's Yahweh. Yahweh is the word of the Lord. And then in verse 9, then Yahweh put out his hand and touched my mouth. It's the language of embodiment. In this case, it's, it's, it's a tactile experience as well. Again, I'm not saying that every time you get the word of the Lord show up in these passages that it's, it's God in human form, but in some cases it is. Okay, you look for the context. Okay, does the context support it or not? The thing is, is, is we often don't even see these things. We, we kind of tend to think that the New Testament's doing something altogether different when it's really not. We talked about the cloud rider before. Let me skip down here. Again, Jesus against all this is kind of easy, you know, to see. We have John 1, which we've talked about. 
speak, and the Word became flesh. This is why he can say no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. Well, how has he made him known? Well, he, he became flesh. He dwelt among us. The angel. Well, is it, you know, in the Old Testament you get Yahweh delivering the people from Egypt, taking them to the, to the land. You get Panim, the presence. You get the angel doing it. You get Elohim doing it. Who is it, Mike? Is it God? Is it Yahweh? Is it the angel? Is it the presence? And the answer is all of the above. Yeah. But here for Jude, it's, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, I mean, he's very clear what he's thinking here. He's, he's putting Jesus in this slot, so to speak, this, the embodied deity idea. By the way, afterward, he destroyed those who did not believe. We tend to skip that part of the verse. <laughs> it's the same guy. Okay? So he can be angered. <laughs> uh, the name, Jesus. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer. You know, I, While I was with them, I kept them in or by your name. I made known to them your name. You know, Jesus doesn't show up and say, well, I'm the son of God. And I'm finally here. I've got a job to do. And everybody listen, gather around. I have an important message. God's name is Yahweh. Thank you. <laughs> it's absurd. When, when, it, when, it, when the language here says, I made known to them your name, Jesus isn't running around saying, hey, God's name. I know, we, I know God's name. Everybody listen. No, they have it a few thousand times in their own Bible. Okay, what he's, what he's saying is, well, I, I made known the name to, to, to people. When they looked at me, when they experienced me, when they listened to me, when they interacted with me, they know you because I'm you. Okay, I have your name. I have your essence. You know, the, the whole, it's the whole package here. So Jesus revealing the name to people. Isn't Jesus running around telling them what God's name is? They know that. They're not idiots. Okay? He's revealing who God is, what God is like in human form, in the flesh, incarnation. The writer in the clouds, we talked about that. There's a few references where some of this language goes into the spirit. When the spirit gets grouped with it, we'll skip that for now. But basically what you have, you know, you get this question, where does you know, Trinitarianism come from? You know, and, and you, you, you get these people running around like you know, like a Bart Ehrman or somebody like that and, and, and talking about how, oh, this Trinitarian concept, the concept of high Christology is late. You know, the Christian community originally didn't believe any of this. And then they, somebody came along and said, hey, this would be a good idea for a religion. So let's like invent it. <laughs> You know, and, oh, yeah, that is a good idea. Why don't we run with that one? You know, we'll make Jesus God, and won't that be nice? Look, <laughs> there's a whole discussion in the intertestamental period about who the second power is. You can read Siegel's book. You can read Pseudepigrapher. You can read something really boring like the seventh or eighth chapter of my dissertation. Okay. Um, there's a whole slew of candidates because Jews were speculating at will, frequently. It was fun. You know, when you don't have TV, this is what you do. Uh, who is the second power? And it usually broke down into you know, two categories. I have a whole lecture on this on, on YouTube. You could go up and watch where I go through the examples. But some people thought it was, a, it was an Old Testament human that was sort of had a special relationship to God that essentially gets deified. So some texts, Jewish texts, will have Moses sharing the throne with, G, with uh, the God of Israel. Some say, no, it was Adam. Some said it was Enoch. It was Enoch, you know, gets taken away. And, you know, some said it was Jacob. Some said it was Abraham because he was the friend of God. You know, if you were a friend, you know, God would let you have a seat too, you know, right here on his throne. You know. I mean, you get all this discussion. Another camp thought it was a, a special angel. Michael was a candidate. Gabriel was a candidate. There's an, there's an angel in Second Temple Jewish texts called Yahoel, both two names of God combined into one name for that angel. So they're speculating left and right as to who this was. This is hundreds of years before Jesus ever showed up in the incarnation. 
And when Jesus does show up, and you get the apostles doing some of this stuff, identifying Jesus with Yahweh in, in all sorts of ways. Some of it was two-power stuff. They do it in other ways, too. But they're like, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the voice in the back of the room, you know, oh, oh call on me. You know, I, I mean, we know who the second power is. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And they want to they communicate this idea. This isn't new. You don't need a new religion for this. You have the categories right there. And they're right, they're, they're using them left and right. You know, now, this is one of the things that drove a wedge between the Jewish community and the Christian community. Because, oh, okay, Jesus is the second power. Well, we'll just add him to the... Oh, wait a minute. This guy we just killed? <laughs> hold, hold, hold on. <laughs> because if, if that was right, we're just in a whole lot of trouble. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's like that's like more than trouble, you know. It, it was offensive. It was offensive to them that people could come along and say, "You just crucified the second power." But that's what Christians did, uh, and and so it, at the second century, this was declared a heresy by the Jewish community. That's what Siegel's book is about. They also did two other things. They standardized the Hebrew text into what we now know as the Masoretic text, and they outlawed the use of the Septuagint for their community. Because the Septuagint has some really curious things in it. I'll give you one. I, this is my, my favorite, you know, the Isaiah 9 one, which just, just floors people. Uh, you know, we, we all know Isaiah 9 because of Handel's Messiah. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, all this stuff. Septuagint doesn't have any of that. The Septuagint says, he shall be called the messenger, the angel, Angelos, of the great council. Ouch. <laughs> I mean, you don't want a Christian, or you don't want a Christian quoting that at you, and you don't want somebody in your own community coming across that one. Okay, because that's a pretty clear second power text of the Messiah. Okay, and then Jesus was running around saying lots of this kind of stuff, you know, and so, you know, we don't, we don't want anybody to run into that one. So there, there are just things like this going on historically that you know, create a wedge between the two communities. But the, the, the categories were familiar. Now let's talk a little bit about Jesus and the Gospels here. Go into New Testament a little bit. We didn't talk about Bashan, but Bashan is part of cosmic geography. And again, the, the, the big piece of cosmic geography is what happens at Babel. But Bashan is a place, a special place. Uh, in Old Testament thinking. This is where in the Old Testament day, let's see if I have a map here. I think I do at some point. I don't want to get too far into that. Um, I, think I, I think I do when I hit the, let me just take a, I'll, I'll cheat here and peek here in case you don't know where Bashan is. Oh yeah, there we go. Let's just go here. So you've got, I don't know if you can follow the, the arrow here at all. But here's Lake Hula, here's the Sea of Galilee. This region, all around here, of course, you have Bashan. And in the region, again, dominated by Bashan, you have Ashtaroth, and down here, a little ways, you have the city of Edrai. Now, in the Old Testament, this was the place where the conquest, for all intents and purposes, actually begins. Because if you remember the story, they, you know, Moses and Joshua go up the Transjordan, up the other side of the Jordan, and they encounter various, you know, people groups, giant clans, or at least places that were formerly populated by giant clans. The Moabites, they referred to the giant clans as the Amim. The Ammonites referred to them as the Zamzumim. And, the, and the Deuteronomy 2 and 3 says, hey, you don't have to worry about them anymore because your ancestors, at least the Edomites, you know, the people descended from Esau, they took care of these people. You don't have to worry about them, but there's still some left. So God sends them to the north, to Bashan, which according to Deuteronomy 2 and 3 were the last vestiges of the Rephaim. Og is specifically called you know, the last of the Rephaim. He and Sion, the two kings of the Amorites, that term is important because the Amorites, when, when the conquest account is being described in the book of Amos, 
in Amos 2, he refers to the Amorites as being unusually tall, tall and fierce, you know, uh, tall as the cedars, that kind of thing. So this is actually where the conquest begins. So Bashan is associated with, first of all, the wars under Moses, Moses and Joshua to get rid of the giant clans, the last remnants of them on that side of the Jordan. Now on, in, in the promised land proper, there are plenty of them still there. Because when the Israelites fail to cross in, remember Numbers 13, they send in the spies and the spies come back and say, oh, the place is just exactly what God's, it's awesome. But there's a problem. <laughs> the problem is the Anakim live there. And we're like grasshoppers to these people. The Anakim come from the Nephilim, Numbers 13, 33. There ain't no way <laughs> that we're going to be able to pull this off. And Joshua and Caleb are like, what? You know, what? You know, don't you remember any of this other stuff? Let's go. Let's get it. And they chicken out, and then they have to wander for 40 years. Okay, so there's this, there, there are giant clans living on both sides, but on the, the Transjordan side, they're, they're in Bashan. A couple of other things. Bashan itself as a term is a Semitic term for serpent. A bathon is how you would pronounce it in Canaanite. So you have that association going on, which again is kind of weird. You know, right away, they're, they're, they're not gonna, they're, there's going to be something to be said about that that doesn't sound real good. The place of the serpent, you know, this, you know, but that's kind of messy. But the worst part probably, I think, for the average Israelite was Ashtaroth and Edrei. In Ugaritic texts, Canaanite texts outside the Bible, these places were considered gateways to the netherworld, gateways to the realm of the dead. They were just spooky places. So you had all sorts of associations with this region that were not good. Later in Israel's history, there's going to be a cult center to Baal built at the foot of a particular mountain that's in the region of Bashan. Mount Bashan in the Old Testament is known later as Mount Hermon. There's a cult center dedicated to Baal there. In Jesus' day, it's dedicated to Pan, the god Pan. Before that, it was Zeus. And you have all these associations with this place. Hermon, again, Mount Bashan, was, was the place where the watchers descend in the books of Enoch, Jubilees and whatnot, where they, they collude together to corrupt humanity. All these things are present. I'm just going to skip ahead. Uh, we'll skip ahead the, the astral, astral stuff here. Come on. There we go. When Jesus shows up, part of his ministry is going to be in this territory. And he goes to Caesarea Philippi, way up here in the corner. Again, this is the region of Bashan. Right here, there's an important mountain. He's going to go to this place. Here it is again, Caesarea Philippi, Mount Hermon right here. Again, in Old Testament times, this is Bashan. Close up. This is the place where two events happen that I, I just want to focus on, then we'll move on a little bit into, into the book of Acts. Matthew 16, Mark 8, this is Peter's confession. So Jesus goes to Banyas, Panyas, okay, next door to where the cult center to, to Baal used to be in the region of Bashan at the foot of Mount Hermon. And he goes to this place, and it's at this place that Jesus asks the question, who do men say that I am? And Peter's like, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, that's pretty good, Peter. Bless your pointed little head. Okay. Don't get a big head because the Spirit showed you this. You didn't figure this out yourself. <laughs> but good job. Good job. That's, that's who I am. And you're Peter. Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. So we have Peter's confession. And the gates of hell I have here shall not be able to withstand it. Now, many of your translations have the gates of hell will not be able, or the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, something like that. The problem with that against it is if you looked actually in the Greek text, we might as well, I, I think we could rabbit trail enough to go, I'll just show it to you in the interlinear. 
Let's go to Matthew 16, because you have a pretty interesting problem here. Again, something that the translations, I think, obscure a little bit. Okay. Shall not prevail against it. So we'll turn on the interlinear here. And you'll notice against it, in the column, there is no Greek word corresponding to against. That means that that word is supplied in English. There is no preposition here against it. Now, the verb form is also interesting. Prevail. We have future active indicative third person plural. Okay, will prevail, shall not prevail, and then we have autase, it. You have, a you have a choice as a translator here. You can supply a preposition so that it's readable in English, or you can go with this suggestion. The gates of hell will not be able to withstand it. If you use that translation, it matters. Why? Because if you say the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it, that makes it sound like the church is there, you know, cowering in a corner, taking a beating from, from the gates of hell. But the gates of hell will never quite kill it off. Okay? It turns the gates of hell into the attacker, and the victim is the church. If you go with this, again, just what's in the Greek text, then the gates of hell shall not be able to withstand it. That, that turns the whole thing around. That means the church is the one administering the beating, not the other way around. And this, this is Jesus' point. I mean, where, where is, you know, the, we have this whole argument about, you know, upon this rock. Okay, the Catholics say, well, that's a play on words, you know, rock, Petras, Petra, Peter, you know, all this kind of stuff. And the, Peter is the thing that the church is built on, and he was the first pope, and so you should all be Catholic. And the Protestants will turn around and say, no, 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 no. It's, it's not Peter, it's... This language is taken from something like 1 Corinthians 10 where Jesus is the rock or God is the, st the stone or something like that. And, and so this is really a reference to Jesus. And so we shouldn't be Catholic. We should all be Protestants. All right? I don't think either of them have this correct. I think the, the rock is where they're standing. I think they're standing you know, at, at, at this region, this particular piece of turf. They're at the foot of Mount Hermon. They are in the place that is associated with the realm of the dead. Again, used to be a cult center to Baal, who was the lord of the dead in Canaanite religion. And lord of the dead, by the way, in Christian thinking is who? Satan. Satan Baal-zebul. Remember that? That's Canaanite. Baal-zebul in Ugaritic is Prince Baal. It becomes a name for Satan later on. And then and they, they, they tweak it a little bit. They, they change it to Baal-zebub, which is... You know, prince of the flies, like the dung. The flies gather around dung. It's a pejorative. But Elzebub is a slam. It's a slap in the face to this deity. But at any rate, this is all associated with Baal. And this is Baal's region. This is, again, his dominion. So I think what Jesus is really saying is not that I'm going to build this thing on, on you, Peter, and boy, I hope you're up to the task. Don't get married. Okay, because, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not stuff like this. He's saying, look, you know, it's up, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not be able to withstand it. I'm going to make Satan's domain his tomb. We're going to go, we're going to, we're going to just, you know, blow right past this guy. We're going to, you know, build right over top of him. Okay, we are going to defeat the Lord of the dead. He is ours. He belongs to us. It's him that should be afraid, not us. So then he turns around, and the, the, the account says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up on a high mountain. Well, there's only one high mountain up there. And, you know, church tradition has the mountain of the, this next event uh, as Mount Tabor, which is in a slightly different region. And the only reason it is that way be, is because of Constantine's mom. It, no, it is. <laughs> Constantine's mom was like 
an ancient archaeologist person. She traveled the Holy Land. and I mean, she was a genuine believer by all accounts, but she'd say, well, that's where this happened. It's like, okay, you're the emperor's mom. That's the place. <laughs> I mean, literally, this is, and it, it just became entrenched tradition. I mean, there's, there's nothing in the account to identify the mountain specifically, but they're at Caesarea Philippi, and they go up into a high mountain. Well, there's really only one candidate for that. If you're looking at the map, and that's Hermon. So what happens when they go up a little ways into Hermon? What's the next event? It's the transfiguration. So Jesus picks, you know, this, he picks Bashan, then he picks Hermon. They, they go up in there and, and he's transfigured. And again, it's, I like to imagine it that Jesus is like, okay, watch quickly. <laughs> you know, here's who I really am. So Peter, James, and John get to see, you know, him in, in, in his glorified state. But who else gets to see? And the powers of darkness. He's like, I'm here. Do something about it. Because after this event, the account says that they, they turn and they, they, you know, they, they start heading to Jerusalem. And it says, from this time forward, Jesus began to teach his disciples that the, you know, he has to go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man must go to Jerusalem and die. And they're like freaked out. Like, what? You know, <laughs> this is where you get the get behind me, you know, Satan to Peter, because, you know, Peter is, is opposing this. I mean, but wouldn't you? I mean, this is freaking them out. And, you know, again, in, in my imagine, I'm thinking, you know, Jesus is like, okay, look, it, it's fun to go up to Bashan. We all know about that place. It's fun to go poke Satan in the eye a little bit and say, basically, you, you know, you're, th this is the beginning of the end for you. It's fun to do that. It's fun to go over to Hermon and say, here I am, do something about it. But the Son of Man now has to go to Jerusalem and die. He's picking a fight because he knows this is what's supposed to happen. And I, I, you've heard me probably say it you know, before if you've you know, read the book or listened to the podcast, but I, I do take Paul seriously when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, had the rulers of this world known they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. And you know, this is a Pauline phrase. Yes, it can be used of people, but in other, other passages it's clearly used of, of divine beings. This is one of Paul's phrases for the powers of darkness. Had they known, they would have never done this. They're not morons. I mean, they're not sitting there thinking, oh, wait, well, let, me see, let me see if I understand. If we, like, kill Jesus, then that's the beginning of the end for us. Oh, sign me up. Okay, they're not doing that. They don't know. They know who he is. It's very clear from the Gospels. You're the son of the Most High. They know what the end game is. You know, why else would you be here? He's like, All right, here's Yahweh again talking about this kingdom of God thing again. You know, this is our turf. We're not just going to roll over you know, because and give him what he wants. So they, they know why he's there, again, in terms of the end game. They know who he is. But they don't know that the key to it all is them killing him. So that's, that's, like, that's like their solution. The very thing that has to happen is the thing they figure out is the best thing to do. And they don't get it. I mean, and the disciples don't get it either. Because like even after the resurrection, you know, the scene uh, toward the end of Luke where he's in, he's, he's with them in the upper room. Or, and I mean, there, there he is. He's the risen Christ. He's standing right in front of them. And the account says he had to open their minds to understand. I mean, they still don't get it. He's standing right in front of them. Well, it's not because, again, they're morons. It's because, you know, and this is, this is my whole view of prophecy right here. Prophecy, messianic prophecy, is deliberately cryptic. This is all deliberate. You know, do you realize there is no verse in the Old Testament that has these elements in it? Okay. A suffering Messiah who would also be God in the flesh, you know, who would die for the sins of the world. You don't have that. In, you don't have that, that in any verse in the Old Testament. You have all those pieces, but you don't have it spelled out anywhere. Why? Because God doesn't want anybody to know. Okay, you can only understand it after the fact. And so this is what they have to learn after the fact. You know, like I said, he's he's standing right in front of them, and they're like, well, "What do we do now? Like, what does all this mean?" You know, they, they don't get it, and he has to teach them. And, you know, the, he's going to send the Spirit. You know, by the way, the Spirit is 
just as the angel is but isn't Yahweh and Jesus is but isn't God, the spirit is but isn't Jesus as well. And that's actually where you get Trinitarian theology from. But I'm going to send the spirit. He'll teach you these things. Just don't worry about it. You'll get it. Got a job for you. So, you know, all of this, though, is deliberately cryptic. They're not supposed to be able to figure it out. It's splintered in a hundred pieces, scattered in a hundred places. It's only knowable after the fact. And it's all by design. So, you know, you get, you get critics. And the way I, I kind of got started on this on, online anyway was somebody sent me some email by some atheist or whatever. Oh, you know, Matthew screws up this passage in the Old Testament. Ha, ha, ha. You know, the Bible's just a bunch of malarkey. And blah. So I wrote, a, I wrote a, a piece on my blog called Were the New Testament Authors Hermeneutical Hacks? No, they're not. And I could tell by his response he'd never gotten my response before. But, but that's a shame because, again, I look at it and think, well, why aren't we taking Paul seriously? I mean, have you ever thought, I mean, if they could just go read it, they could have figured it out. It's not hard. You just read. You know, well, spirits can't read. Well, get, get somebody who, who can read for you and then talk out loud. You know? I mean, it, 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 it's discoverable. But if it's designed to not be discoverable, it ain't. And that's the whole point. So, you know, they're, they're not doing dumb stuff with it. It's just that's, that's the way it is. So what time is it? We'll do a time check here, too. Let, let's break for a little bit. We'll come back. I want to do a little more New Testament stuff. The, the stuff you saw me skip is if you've read the portent, how many of you have read either the facade or the floor? Okay. It's, that's the stuff that Comron does <laughs> in that one scene about the, 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 the astral theological symbolism of the birth of the Messiah. And that's actually tied into Enochian and Dead Sea Scroll stuff, too. So we, I mean, we can, we can do that, but we don't have to do it. Q&A is yours, but come back in, what, 10? We'll do 10, 10 minutes. Cosmic geography, again, a little bit on the book of Acts, again, just to sort of get our feet wet here. This is, this is one of those things that during the course of, the, uh, of, of writing the book, and the, and the book was, again, a putter project. So it took, it took, you know, over 10 years to write this thing because there's just a lot to wade through and, you know, you do a little bit here and there. And there are other things that get in the way, obviously, or that feel more entertaining at, at the, some point. But this is one of those things that I, I did not uh, come across specifically while in graduate school, but as I, as I kept, you know, keeping my head in this, uh, I, I just had this sense that there was, there was more to uh, the Acts 2 story than, than I, I suspected that we had been told. And what I'm going to show you now is you, you can find it in, in, a, in a couple commentaries. I've, I've actually found it in one. There's probably other ones out there. Um, Craig Keener's, if, if any of you are up to, up to date with evangelical publishing, Craig Keener has this massive, I don't know how many volumes, a four-volume commentary on Acts. He has one of the two passages I'll show you, but at, at least he has one. It's, it's one more than most anybody else. Uh, I'm going to make a point of telling him that this, <laughs> this will give him a little award or something. You know, he'll he'll like that. Uh, he's he's a great guy. Um, but again, how many times have you heard a message on Acts two? It's just it's such a common passage, and you think, you know, boy, you know, is is there something? You know, what what's what lurks beneath? And there, there is something here. So let let's just jump in. Uh, what, what I'm, what I'm going to introduce you to, I ho hopefully it's not an introduction, but New Testament writers are writing what they're doing intelligently. That is, they know their audience, here you go, doesn't have iPhones. <laughs> okay. They're not, they're not like hooked on technology. They're not, they don't have TV. Okay. So they can, you know, a lot of the, the, the things that we have in the Bible that are presented to them, they hear orally. Uh, but, you know, of course, they get exposed to it in, in terms of, of a literate culture reading it. But New Testament writers will assume a certain level of knowledge 
of other texts, namely the Old Testament, and specifically the Septuagint, since their Acts is written by Luke to a Greek guy, Theophilus. So he assumes some level of familiarity and literacy with the Old Testament in Greek, and that's going to become in, you know, that's going to come in handy here because they like to create hooks between one passage and another. They don't have a cross-reference system, but they assume that you're familiar enough with the vocabulary that if they start dropping things, you're going to pick up on them. You will notice the breadcrumb trail, and you'll go follow it. Okay, so here we have Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as of fire, again, so on and so forth. Well, camp here a little bit. I think you can see the highlighted column. I have divided, selected. This is a screenshot from my interlinear, reverse interlinear. And this informs us that, hey, the Greek term behind divided is diamerizo. You say, well, that's fascinating, Mike. I'll add that to my storehouse of useless knowledge. <laughs> you know, and, and away we go. You know, be warmed and filled. But if you actually search for diamerizo in the Septuagint, guess where you find that? Deuteronomy 32.8. Okay, when the Most High divided up the nations, it's the Amaritza. You say, well, that's kind of interesting. I mean, somebody who was familiar with the passage, you know, they, that might have clicked in their head. Yeah, it, it could have. But in case it didn't, Luke added another one. <laughs> Verse 5, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. At this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered. Because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. So bewildered is the Greek term sunkeo. If we search for that in our Septuagint, guess where that shows up? Genesis 11. It's the other passage associated with the Babel story. Again, what, what, what's going to happen in the book of Acts with these nations that are laid out is Luke wants you to think of the disinheritance of the nations. Because what happens here at Pentecost is going to be part, a big part of the program to bringing them back into the fold. Now, this isn't a very good map uh, to show you this, but if you could, if you could see the colors, um, the on the on the far right hand side, Parthia, Media, and Elam, they are in all caps and they are in red in the image. If you can see that. But basically, again, you don't, you don't have to see them to, to track through with what I'm going to say here. If you actually look at the terms in the book of Acts, they proceed from east to west. Now think about what's going on at Pentecost. These are Jews who are scattered throughout the known world. Okay, they, they do go as far as Media and Persia because, hey, that's where the Old Testament story kind of ends with the exile. Okay, the, the Persians take over. They allow the Jews to come back, but not all of them come back. Only, a, you know, actually a fairly small number come back. And you have Jews living either intentionally from that point on, or, again, if you're talking about the ten tribes that were scattered by the Assyrians, they're just anywhere and everywhere. You have Jews scattered all over the, the known world as a result of these judgments. And a few centuries go by, and, you know, things politically change. We become you know, part of the rulership of Rome you know, through the Hellenistic period and then the rulership of Rome. And by the time you roll around to the book of Acts, at the, the Feast of Pentecost, you have Jews living all over the Mediterranean. And once a year, they will come back for this festival. On this particular occasion, they come back and they run right into these crazy men called the apostles because they've just had this encounter. The Spirit has come enabling them to speak in all these other languages. And the Jews who have come from you know, all these other parts of the world here to Jerusalem, they're like, what in the world is going on? You know, and we know the story. Well, maybe they're drunk. No, it's only the ninth hour. You know, I mean, we, we get all this language. And so they figure out you know, that, that something special is happening here. And what God has just done is he has taken a, a terrible tragedy called the exile. And he has used it to plant believers throughout the nations. 
Because the Jews come here, 3,000 of them believe. They hear the message about their Messiah. And where do they go next? They go home. They go back to the nations. And so God has installed a bunch of little cell groups, kingdom of God cell groups in the nations. He has infiltrated hostile territory. Because it's, it's time to get the show on the road here. Now, we're starting with Jews. These are Jews. It's their Messiah. They're the ones who get this news out of the gate. And the rest of the book of Acts, again, Acts 1.8, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, you know, Samaria, other, other, the other most parts of the world and all that. And that's actually what happens in the book of Acts if you actually look at what's going on. In Acts 2-8, to eight, the effort is concentrated in Jerusalem and Judea. You get to Acts 8 and you get Samaria. Again, this is about pattern recognition. There's a reason why you have representatives of all the nations in the Mediterranean coming to Pentecost, believing and going back with the news of the Messiah. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, okay, you have the apostles, the early church doing their thing. And as Luke goes through the account, he hits certain places. Again, Acts is selective. It's like the Gospels. It's not an exhaustive repository of every event that ever happened. But you have to ask yourself, okay, why, do, why does he throw this in? And, and there are a number of cases where the, the reasoning is, is kind of striking. Samaria in Acts chapter 8, why would Luke want us to know that the news of the Messiah went to Samaria? What is Samaria? It, it was, it's Israel. It was, the, right, it was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, the, the ten apostate tribes. They weren't missed. They're, they're, they're not only allowed to come back. They're not only given the truth. God wants them to have the truth. Okay, Acts 8, Ethiopian eunuch. Now, we aren't told this specifically in the Bible, but historically, archaeologically speaking, there was a large concentration of Jews in what we think of as Ethiopia. Okay, even in modern times, this was the case, the Falasha Jews. And we, don't, we don't need to get into the whole Falasha you know, history and all that stuff. It has something to do with the Ark of the Covenant and Solomon and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's very interesting. But again, Luke wants us to know, hey, those Jews that wound up going down into Ethiopia through a variety of historical circumstances that I'm not going to bother to tell you here in the book of Acts, they got the gospel too. We're not missing Jews there either. We got all the tribes. Now we got this outlier here. Okay? And you start to see the patterning. You get into Acts 9, you get Saul's conversion. He's converted on his way to Damascus. You know, we know the story. He has a confrontation with the risen Christ. He winds up blind. Jesus says, go back. You know, keep going. Go to Damascus. You're going to meet Ananias and so on and so forth. And he goes there. And, of course, Ananias is a believer there. So the gospel has penetrated Damascus. Paul goes to Damascus, winds up you know, witnessing to lots of people there. Why Damascus? What, what's special about Damascus? What, what did you say? Capital of Syria. Capital of Syria. And, 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 there, and there you have a, you know, the, the connection with Naaman. And it's also the, the, Abraham, the Abraham thing. You, if you go back to the Abraham story, you know, when he has a, his, his little tussle with Lot, you know, and, and God says, look, don't worry about what Lot's going to do. Let him have the land he wants. And you know, he takes Abraham out and says, now look around. You know, every, everything that you see, you know, I'm going to give to you and so on and so forth. And that language there is repeated a couple other times in the Torah to other people, other patriarchs, Moses included. And, but but, but it's, it's actually stated a different way. It, it, it harkens back to Abraham with language like every place that your foot is going is, is gonna to tread, this land will be yours and all this kind of stuff. Well, if, if you think about Abraham, again, pardon the pun, the genesis of this thinking, when Lot gets kidnapped, and Abraham has to get some men together and go chase after him and rescue him. Where does he, where does he catch up to him? It's Damascus. In other words, that, that becomes now a, a northern benchmark for the, the land promised to Abraham. Again, this is patterning that, that you're seeing reflected now in, theologically in the book of Acts. So you, you keep going, 
you have Peter's, you know, vision, you know, don't call unclean what I've called clean. And again, preparing him to encounter Cornelius, who's the Gentile convert. So we've, we've reached the Jews now, the descendants of Abraham and all that kind of stuff. And now we're, we're transitioning now to, to Gentile inclusion. And, you know, that, you know, after the Cornelius episode, we, you know, transition to the ministry of Paul. By the, by the way, the, the, the other interesting thing about uh, when we're thinking about the, the boundaries of the promised land, and there, there's more than one set of boundaries in the Old Testament, which is one of the things that makes eschatology a little, little you know, hairy, a little confusing. But remember when Philip witnesses to the Ethiopian eunuch, then he, after he baptizes him, the spirit takes him and plants him where? Azotus. Say, what in the world is Azotus? It's what used to be called Ashdod, which is Philistine territory. But it's part of the, of the promised land boundary, but it wasn't part of the Davidic Empire. Okay, because you have this whole Philistine David thing going on in Solomon. But if you look at maps, it's this little like sliver that's kind of excluded because it's Philistine territory. Again, it, it's just messaging. Philip goes to Azotus. We're not missing that either. Okay, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's just patterning. It's pattern, pattern recognition. Well, let, let's talk about Paul a little bit. Because Paul has this thing about getting to Spain that I find really interesting and kind of fun. If you go to Acts 20, Paul says, Behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Which is kind of a happy tune. <laughs> it's like Paul's like, okay, you know, the, the Lord's been telling me you got to go to Jerusalem, and when you get there, it's going to hurt. But you need to go there. And so he, okay, that, that's where we got to go. I know it's going to be bad, but, but got to get to Jerusalem. You hit Acts 21, they're on their way, and this is where they encounter you know, not opposition, but, you know, other people who've gotten the same message. You know, through the Spirit, these disciples were telling Paul not to go unto Jerusalem. While we were staying there for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. And I, I imagine Paul said, Yeah, I know. Got it. Okay, the, the, basically, the Spirit has told me the same thing. He's told me that I need to go to Jerusalem, and it's going to hurt. And I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that you care about me, that you don't want this to happen to me. You don't want me to go to Jerusalem because the Spirit's telling you the same thing. But I already know. I already know. I have to go there, and whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Now, a little bit before this, in Acts 19, we, we get a little, a little hint of what, you know, what else might be in Paul's head. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Now, I'm, I'm not going to suggest that Paul knew, okay, when I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to cause a riot, and then I'm going to get beat up a little bit, and then the Romans are going to rescue me, and then I'm going to get in, put in chains, and I'm going to go through this appeal process, and I'm going to wind up in Rome. I, mean, I don't think he knows that. But he has this sense that, that I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm supposed to be there. It's going to be bad, but the Lord will, the Lord will help me. But after I'm there, I'm going to get to Rome. Now, Rome, if you recall the Acts 2 map, is the westernmost part of the description of the book of Acts, the westernmost point in the Mediterranean. So Paul you know, has this thing about getting to Jerusalem and then getting to Rome, but that isn't all. He has his ambition set even further west. And there's, there's a reason for it. If you go to Romans 15, when he's actually writing to the Romans, you know, sometime during his, his imprisonment and his, you know, the whole appeal process, he's on his way there because he's never been there. He says, Thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But now, since I no longer have any work and any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you, you Roman guys, you Roman girls, I can't wait to see you, in passing. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be there long. In passing as I go to Spain. Like what? 
Who cares about Spain? Like, do they have good food there? Like, who, who cares, you know? What's Spain? When, therefore, I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, because he refers here to the collection for the, the saints in Jerusalem, I will leave for Spain by way of you. So he has this sense that, okay, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. The Spirit is telling me you got to go there. The Spirit's also telling me it's going to be bad. But I, I need to get to Rome. And then kind of on the way, you know, say hi to those people in Rome. Do I really like them? Can't wait. And Paul says, I, I, I want to I impart unto you some spiritual gift. You know, I, I, he wants to see the Romans, but I'm not going to be there long because I have to get to Spain. And you think, what is what is with this guy? Who cares? Well, again, here's Rome, Italy, the westernmost point in the book of Acts. And this pretty well accounts regionally, and in many cases terminologically, for just about all of the territory of the nations that we can look at and see and discern and know about from Genesis 10. In other words, this turf, God has planted cell groups in all of the nations that were disinherited in Genesis 10, but there's one exception. If you read through the book of, or the, the, the table of nations in Genesis 10, there's one nation that's missing from this picture. It's the westernmost point of the known world, Tarshish. Guess where Tarshish is? Spain. Okay, you know, and again, you can read the book, you can get the data, get the documentation, get all the dry, dusty sources for this. Paul is compelled to get to Tarshish, to Spain. Why? Because I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. This is my job. This is what I'm called to do. Now, I, 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 I believe, I can't prove it, but I believe that Paul believed he would not die until he got to Spain. You know, when he hits Spain, it's like mission accomplished. I, I have, you know, I've done the job. I'm the, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. There's no more places left to go. It, it, it also draws on Isaiah 66, where Tarshish is mentioned among the nations that will, will come to Jerusalem and worship the Lord there. I mean, Paul has this Old Testament cosmic geographical thing going on in his head. When God says, I, I'm appointing you to be an apostle to the Gentiles, to the nations, we're not missing any of them. Every one of them needs to be brought back into relationship to me. And, he, and again, he's speaking to someone alive in the first century. This is the extent of the known world to the biblical writers. This is why Genesis 10 is cast as it is. And the message is very plain. I'm not, I'm not abandoning any of them. We are going to start with the Jew because Jesus is the Messiah to the Jew. He's the Jewish Messiah. This is the Israelite thing. But through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Okay? Through you, and you know Paul's whole argument about it's not many seeds, it's one seed. You know, the, the whole Messiah thing going on in Galatians. Okay? This is what he's talking about. All of the nations are going to be brought back. This is why Paul talks about he, he, he casts the return of the Lord in relationship to an idea he refers to as the fullness of the Gentiles. In other words, when all the nations have been regathered, when all the people from every nation you know, have, have believed you know, that, that God knows is going to believe or whatever, you know, when, when all that's done, the Lord will return. And so you know, Paul has this inkling that, you know, God, I've got to finish the job. I mean, I not only don't want to fail but I want the Lord to return. Mission accomplished. And so he's like, hey, I can't wait to see you Roman dudes, but I'm going to wave from the deck, okay, because we got to get to Spain. Got to get there. Because he knows his time is limited. He knows his, his days are numbered. He's been under house arrest once. And, it, you know, again, tradition has a really good, uh, good argument. There's lots of stuff you can... You know, you can do research here that Paul did make it to Spain, then was rearrested and put to death under Nero and all that stuff. You know, we, we, we know a good bit of this history. But Paul has this compulsion about this. This is his role. And I, again, like I said, I can't prove it. I, I think he had this sense that I'm not going to die. God is not going to let me die 
until I do this job. You know, that, that was where he was at. Now, we've talked about Paul's vocabulary for the powers of darkness. Again, it's, it's all this geographical dominion terminology. And I don't think that's accidental. Again, Paul is drawing on something here. One of these terms, or two of them actually, uh, archon and archontos, archonton, uh, you'll find in the Septuagint of Daniel 10, again, the, the prince, prince, of the, prince of Persia, Prince of Greece, Septuagint, these are, these are two of the terms Paul uses here. But, you know, conceptually, it's the same thing. The powers of darkness have geographical dominion. Why? Because the nations were divorced. The nations were disinherited. They're, no, they're not Yahweh's people. Who, who else would have control of them? Okay, it's the sons of God who were given, you know, authority over them and didn't do their job, either to rule according to the, to the goodness, the, the good law of, of, of Yahweh, they didn't do their job, you know, to to not, you know, to forbid worship of themselves. You know, they were they were supposed to be placeholders, like Paul says in Acts 17. Somehow this this was supposed to work so that the nations could quote find their way back to God and all this sort of thing. I mean, you know, the whole kingdom of priests idea. Israel would be you know the mediating force to attract the nations back. It, it, it doesn't work this way, but that that's what it was intended to do. You know, is God surprised? Okay, God knows what he's working with. Okay, when he picks people to do something, he's not surprised that hey, it doesn't work sometimes. Okay, because they may have my, I may share my attributes with them. I've given them all the status of imager. They reflect me, they represent me, or at least they're supposed to, and I'm sharing my attributes with them so that they can do these things, but they do not have my nature. In simple terms, they're not me. They will abuse things like their free will. They will abuse their capacities. They will abuse their abilities. They will abuse other imagers. They will not do the... They'll do all these things. Again, God is not surprised, but he is committed. I mean, think about it. You know, you get this question, well, you know, why can't God just fix evil? You know, why can't he, like, just, you know, take care of evil and there would be no wickedness in the world and all this kind of stuff? Well, God could do that. And my, my favorite, you know, it dates me now, but if, if we were back in the, in the late 90s or early 2000s, I could refer to the X-Files episode where Mulder gets three wishes from the genie. And one of them is, he says, world peace. And then he, he goes outside and there ain't nobody there. <laughs> I mean, even Scully's gone. I mean, come on, you know. <laughs> and of course, the whole point is that you can't have this if you have humans. Yeah, God could fix this if he if he would annihilate us all. But there there is no Plan B. Okay, Plan B is not. Oh, this was a bad idea. Let's just kill everybody. Okay, there there is no Plan B. Plan A is I want a human family living in my presence with my divine family and I want them both to participate with me in doing what I want done and enjoying the results. That's the Edenic vision. There is no plan B. In other words, God is so committed to the idea, to, to, to his love for humanity, that he is willing to share an attribute like freedom with us, knowing that we do not possess his nature and we will abuse it. And so will non-human imagers. He knows this is going to happen. But he deems that preferable to not having us at all. That is God's call. It is not your call. It's not our call, period. Period. There is no plan B. So why is there evil in the world? Because God would rather have humans than not have them at all. As bad as they are, as bad as we are, as, 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 as skillfully as we can mess up our own lives and everybody else's, he would rather have that and try to use both his non-human, invisible you know, unseen realm imagers and other human fellow imagers to intersect with your life and use your life to intersect with somebody else's. He would rather do that and work toward the desired end, 
the restoration of the kingdom. Okay, the restoration of the nations, the advance of the gospel, the, the, the defeat of the Lord of the dead. He, to, he wants to use all of them and all of us to do that thing. And that's better in his mind than just scrapping the whole thing. So that hurts. Okay, there's definitely pain. There's definitely evil, horrible evil. But the alternative is, is for God just to wipe the whole slate clean. And he's not going to do that. Again, you know, you, you know, if, if you if you look at your life, you know, in, in, in this sort of way, you know, that the whole thing, you know, this world is not my home. Well, if we really thought that, we'd be okay with God's decision. You know, even even though it kind of sucks here, you know, I'm in a terrible circumstance or whatever, I have this or that legitimate real hardship or problem. You know, if, if, if you view this as a way station, okay, that, that can help you cope with that. And that's how God wants you to look at it. Your mind, it's not going to be this way the, the whole time. You know, this is, a, this, is a, this is a way station. That's all it is. But he wants to use you. He wants to have you participate with him. And, you know, I love these movies that are, that are, I don't even know how we got on this. It's, it's the whole imaging idea. I just kind of like it. I love these movies where that, that feed off the whole Providence theme, where if, if, if the character would have made the left turn instead of the right turn, everything would have changed, you know, good or evil. You know, it, if, if, if you really believe that there's, there's a God who, who this is part of, of the way that, that he wants things to run, he, he, he actually gives you free will decision-making capacity. And it doesn't mean that he's surprised. It doesn't mean that his omniscience is impinged upon. Okay, foreknowledge does not necessitate predestination. That's part of the book. If you don't believe that? Read First King, First Samuel twenty-three, and come back to me. Okay, it just that, that's just the way it is. In that passage, God foreknows two things that never happen. By definition, foreknowledge did not necessitate predestination because they didn't happen. It's as plain as day. You know, God allows people to make decisions, allows them to participate, uses other images to try to get them to make the right choices. Because every choice they do make, God knows, because he's watching, will have a ripple effect. In, in lives that, that we know we affect and lives that we, we, don't, we, we can't possibly know that we affect. Everything we do has a ripple effect. And, and this is how God has intended it to work. So the more we consciously think about what we do and say, even if we think it's insignificant or small, if we approach it with the thought that, you know, God, is, God knows that what's going on down here and he's actually going to use this in some way, intentionally, over here, over there, over places I can't even imagine, would that actually change the way we approach life? Okay, why is it we can sit through a movie and think, oh, that's kind of cool? But when, you, when, you know, when we're here doing theology... You know, you should say, well, that's kind of cool, you know, because it's the same thing. Okay, I'm just not visually pleasing. Okay, I understand that. <laughs> but <laughs> it's the same thing. You know, just when you, if you get up and you think about that, you, in other words, you don't have to figure it all out. Just know that somebody else is figuring it out. And, and do accordingly. Don't get in the way. Try to do the best you can. You know, and, and God will deal with that. God's good with that. Okay, now you're giving me something to work with here. And again, other people that are going to interact with those people and you and this whole thing. This is the way it's designed to be. God is working the plan. He's not scrapping it. You know, and you, you get to you know, some of this end language. Well, let's just talk about, you know, some of the... the the believer terminology in the old, in the New Testament. I mean, sons and daughters of God, really? Well, I wonder where that language comes from. Could it possibly be this Edenic vision thing with the divine council and human beings all being one family here and sons of God and seed of Abraham? And Is all that language intentional? Does it all kind of fit together? Does it all kind of play off each other? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean... You know, John's not sitting there in John 1, 12 when he writes, you know, <clears throat> you know, to, to, you know, the one who, the one who believes I will give him the authority, you know, to become the sons of God, okay, the 
children of God. First John 3, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Then he adds, and that's what we are. And he talks about we shall be like him. Okay, someday, you know, rejoining the family. Why, why does Paul use adoption language? Why does Paul use, you know, sons and daughters language? Galatians 3, if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed, an heir according to the promise. Romans 8, the creation itself groans and travails, awaiting for the unveiling of the sons of God. You read Romans 8, the sons of God are, you know, men and women who have the spirit. Again, it, it, it draws on this Old Testament family community kind of thing. And it's not just the Israelites. It's supernatural as well. It's it's language associated with the direct presence of God, the divine family, not just the Israelite family. There's two families going on, and God wants them blended. Okay, He wants the Edenic restoration. You have become partakers of the divine nature. Hebrews 2. I love this passage. I've got to go to this passage. This is kind of a crazy one. Again, if you have divine counsel stuff in your head, let's just go this way. <clears throat> I mean, again, this is, it's, it's highly, you know, Christological. For it was, it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist. And this is language used elsewhere of the chief agent of creation, who is Jesus. It's fitting okay, that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, Council. In the midst of the council, I will sing your praise. Again, you, you, you know, you have this this situation, this passage where you know Jesus again has has become man. He is God as man. This is the plan between him and God, and and you have this scene where he's not ashamed to call humans siblings, brothers. I I got to be human. Wasn't that cool? Okay, I got to be human. Okay, he's, it's not something that he, he deems shameful. And I'm going to tell your name, you know, God, I'm going to introduce you to my human family. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. You know, it, it's just, it's a great council passage. And you get in Hebrews 11, I mean, I'm not going to go into it here, but this cloud language in the ancient Near East. I mean, Brian could probably, you know, wax eloquent on this too. You're, you're kind of into this covenant stuff. In uh, in ancient Near East, covenants were often ratified by witnesses, by heavenly beings in the clouds. You actually get this language specifically. You get it in Psalm 89, the witness in the clouds ratifying the Davidic covenant. The cloud of witnesses is the council, and the cloud of witnesses includes the people in Hebrews 11. Why? Because people become members of the council. If you become a member of God's family, you are automatically working for him. You are part of what we think of, what scripture thinks of as the divine council. This is your destiny. You know, all this heaven talk, you know, that we get, you know, so much of that I kind of, part of me wishes it would just go away. But this floating around and playing harps, you know, kind of nonsense. It, 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 look, I'll be honest with you, that just sounds boring. Okay, that, that just sounds downright boring. I mean, I'm not like asking not to be there, but it just sounds boring. But if you actually look at what Scripture says, some of it says, I mean, there's so much more. This is Jesus talking in Revelation 2. Nevertheless, hold fast to what you have until I come, and the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, I will give him authority over the nations. Who has authority over the nations now? Right. The, the, the rebellious Elohim. The one, and they are being displaced by the advance of the kingdom of God through the nations. It's a war of attrition. But in the end, 
in Revelation, in the eschaton, who inherits their status? Who, who takes their place? Who displaces them? You do. And look, here's the kicker. So I will give him authority over the nations, and he will shepherd them. The one who overcomes, this is Jesus talking. He, this other guy, you, will shepherd them with an iron rod. He will break them in pieces like jars made of clay. In other words, you're, you're going to bring them under, under dominion. Jesus has just quoted a messianic psalm and applied it to you. Do you realize that? He's quoting Psalm 2. But he's not applying it to himself. He's applying it to you. I mean, that's crazy talk. Okay, like, Jesus, do you know what you're doing here? It's just, you know, I will give him the morning star. Morning star was a Davidic, you know, it's a phrase associated with Davidic rule. 228, Numbers 24, 17 is sort of the, the source for that. A star will come out of Jacob. By the way, the Magi never quote this passage. Okay. That's something else. Okay. <laughs> That's something else. But the morning star language, you know, he, he uses it in Revelation 22. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. In other words, it, it's a messianic title. It's, a, it's language associated with divine royalty. But guess what? Jesus says, I'm going to give that to you. Revelation 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, indeed I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. The one who conquers, the one who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. As I also have conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. This is shared dominion. Paul, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? Don't you know this? You outrank them. You are God's family. These are task-related terms. They're not going to be put over the nations in the new heaven, the new earth, the new earth situation, the ultimate eschaton. The angels who are, who are running around being faithful to God now, they're not the ones who get to rule the nations. You do. Because you're the sons of God. You know, all of these things have precedent. They all have deep roots in the Old Testament. They're not just throwaway terms. You know, John's not, write, not writing Revelation. He's not thinking to himself, hey, is there an eloquent way I can write verse 2? Is there an eloquent? I've got to fill some space here. Like, oh, man, I've got to vary my vocabulary. I'm going to get a poor grade on this. <laughs> no, he's not doing this. He wants you to think certain thoughts. He's putting hooks back into Old Testament passages and even more importantly, Old Testament concepts and ideas. He wants very specific things running through your head when you read this. And for us, let's be honest, that, that, that isn't easy because we, we're removed. We are outsiders when it comes to biblical communication. We're not insiders. What, what I'm trying to do in Unseen Realm is, is to move us a little bit, at least get us to the threshold, <laughs> you know, push us through the door a little bit um, to kind of give you the lay of the land, so to speak, the things that you need to think about, that you need to have running your head. This is the starting point. And I, I say it in the beginning of the book. I don't know if people believe it or not, but, but this is the starting point. This is not the end point. This is the starting point. This kind of stuff. Because everything in there, you can drill down on. Everything in there has another layer or two to it. Uh, and and that, that's just as far as I can see at this point. I mean, there, there's so much to think about. that I don't, I don't have any you know delusion that I'm going to you know, run into it, <laughs> you know, accidentally in the course of my lifetime, you know, and even, even get to ponder it. I mean, there's just so much there. But this this much, if we just had this in our heads, I think it would give us, you know, the, the thrill of rediscovery. I mean, I use this little tagline, you know, re, you know, and people think it's marketing shtick, okay? There are people in this room that can tell you I'm not a marketer, okay? <laughs> Try not to laugh too loudly. <laughs> Right? There, there are people who would tell you that. And so this isn't marketing, but, but I, I, I don't have any qualms about telling people, if you read Unseen Realm, you will never look at your Bible the same way again. 
I know that because I lived that. That's what happened to me. So why would you be any different? I mean, we're all like human here. I mean, it, you know, we all have sort of the same you know, tradition context and all that. Um, there, are just, there are just things that there, there's so much to think about. So I'm hoping you will you know, share the book, get the book, read the book, torment people with the book. <laughs> <laughs> if that's what it takes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I want it to be useful. So, John's, we can break a little bit, go into Q&A right now. All right, let's get started. Uh, just for recording purposes, I want to make sure that all the questions get asked on the mic. So if you guys have a question, you can raise your hand. I'll bring the mic, and you guys can ask your questions. So, actually, I'm going to go first. And this, uh, <laughs> that's, that's an executive decision. <laughs> executive decision. Um, you know, early on, at the very beginning, you talked about uh, the Divine Council, a meeting of the Divine Council, and a spirit that came forward to uh, in, do, fulfill an act or a will of God's, which was the death of, uh, what was it? Ahab. Ahab, thank you. Um, now, when I first heard that, and, and my pastor, who's not here anymore, he, he was kind of troubled by it because he thought, okay, wait a minute, God's decreeing deception here. So is he, you know, is he the author of evil too? You know, is it, I think Isaiah forty-five seven talks about I uh, create darkness. I think KJV translates it evil. What What are your thoughts on that? How do you explain that? <clears throat> well, in, in that case, you know, God is. What's decreed is it's time for Ahab to die, and he he allows you know this suggestion to come forth and approves of it. So, you know, it takes you into this, this territory of, you know, God and not, not so much God and evil, but, but it's related to that, but God and deception. I mean, God does use deception in the Old Testament in a number of places. And what it comes down to is God gets to decide the means by which he will punish evildoers. If, if he wants to use deception as part of that, he'll do it. Uh, my, my favorite example of this is uh, 1 Samuel 16. And, and it, it's also something I, I used to I used to discuss this. I, I taught ethics class a, a number of years, and we'd, we'd always end up in, in a passage like this. When it came to you know questions like, is there a distinction between uh, lying, which is, would be the the utterance of a falsehood, something contrary to fact, you know, with with intent, uh, that sort of thing. I mean, there's in, in ethics, there's, there's always an intentional side to things going on. I mean, you can do it accidentally. It's not the same as deliberate, you know, high-handed intent. But setting that aside, there, there's also a difference between deliberately telling a falsehood and deception. So look at 1 Samuel 16 here. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord, you know, God doesn't say, Buck up, Samuel, I'm with you. And, you know. <laughs> he says, The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded, and he came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city, came, I love this, came to meet him trembling. It's like whenever Samuel shows up, it's like, who's going to die? <laughs> came to him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? We help. And he said, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited him to the sacrifice. Now, he only tells them part of the truth. In so doing, they are deceived. These were God's instructions, and he follows them very well. Okay, God is, is giving Samuel this, this misdirection to protect him. Now, we know the rest of the story. Samuel does conduct the sacrifice, so he doesn't actually lie. He did come, and he for, the, for that, this is one of the purposes, not all of them, but one of them. 
And he does the sacrifice, and so he, he never utters something that's false, but he withholds part of the truth. And when he does that, he deceives, and God uses that, you know, to anoint David, and you know, it's part of, it's actually part of the judgment, you know, of Saul. So, you know, when, when God tells Joshua, hey, I got a great idea for the battle plan, you know, you you know, go out to battle and then act like you're getting your butts kicked and, you know, retreat and then they'll follow you over here and then you circle around the back. And he's giving him a plan of deception. Okay. Is God allowed to do that? I would, okay, my vote is yes. Okay. Okay. I try not to put the words God and can't into too many sentences, all right? It, God uses this as a means on occasion to judge evil. God gets to decide how evil gets what it what it's due. Um, you know, in, in ethics class, you can have fun with this. You know, does does the Christian basketball player, you know, when he looks left and passes right, does he need to repent after the game? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, it, it's part of the game. Everybody knows the rules. Everybody knows the, the, the scope of what happens in the game. No one feels deceived unless you, know, you get to look, unless you break an ankle trying to cover the guy. You know, there are just things like this that that misdirection is built into the enterprise. Okay, that's different than you know some kind of moral act of evil with the intent, you know, to harm or to you know raise your fist against God and that sort of thing. You have this kind of thing happen a lot in, in scripture. You know, the, the whole Rahab thing. You know, like it or not, Rahab gets commended for her faith, yes, but she's also commended for sending the spies out in peace, which she could not have done had she not hidden them and lied about it. Okay, you know, and you can say, okay, she's a Gentile, she doesn't know a lot, she doesn't have the law, oh, that's all true. But the fact is, in Hebrews 11, she's commended for both things. And God certainly knows what's going on. So God does use this kind of thing on occasion to judge evil. And if that's what he sees fit to do, that's what he's going to do. And frankly, you know, neither myself or anybody here is in the position to judge God for it. So that, that's, that's the way I approach it. When, he, when he, he does it with Ahab, you know, okay, that'll work. That will accomplish the ends to which I have you know, decreed it is time for Ahab to go. This, this is adequate. Let's do that. So... Yes. My question uh, pertains to the number 70 mm -hmm. and the way it's, uh, it's implied in Deuteronomy 32.8. Um, the way I understand, uh, you know, how we use the Septuagint when, you know, when, uh, when we study the Deuteronomy 32.8 worldview is because it refers to the number of nations in Genesis 10, we get 70. But the Masoretic refers to a 70 that came from Jacob. You know, um, I think it says uh, Deuteronomy 10, 22, your fathers who went into Egypt were 70 in all. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if you agree with the interpretation that the Masoretes could have unwittingly been affirming the conquest of Jesus to liberate the world, just like in Moses' time, if you interpret the scripture in, in the context of the writer, he had a conquest ahead of him. Uh, do you believe that that's, that's a, I, a plausible interpretation? I, well, I, I think it's a possible, it, it's a possibility as far as, not, not, not what, interpretation is, I think, takes it a little too far because the, the, the wording suggests that when I look at this Deuteronomy passage, I'm supposed to think of the Masoretes later on. Okay, I, I don't believe that, but I think it's possible that they could have been, like you said, unwittingly sort of um, the, the way they handle the text may have become part of the thinking about the nations in relationship to the Messiah. If, if that makes any sense to put it that way, mm -hmm. so you know, to, to say that that's the interpretation or a a plausible interpretation, I, I think that takes a little bit too far. But I don't want to rule it out of the picture, you know, entirely. 
You know, Septuagint, of course, has 72. And it, it, it depends on how you divide one of the places, whether you divide it or not. You either get 70 or 72, which is why when, when Jesus, at, at, when the kingdom of God is being inaugurated during Jesus' first coming and he sends out disciples and he gives them power over, over demons and stuff like that, he doesn't send out the 12. He sends out 70 or 72 in Luke, Luke chapter, Luke 11, end of chapter 10, Luke 11. And the, and the messaging is, is pretty clear. I mean, he, there's this Gentile element to the kingdom. I mean, up until this point, you know, he's been, he hasn't been, you know, talking in those terms. But the telegraphing of, of this is, 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 I think, pretty transparent that, again, ev everyone would have known, again, it's either 70 or 72, what this goes back to. You know, this whole disinheritance of the nations thing. So the gospel, the kingdom encompasses the nations as well. And and they're like, they come back and they say, wow, we have power over demons and stuff like this. And, you know, well, yeah, that's kind of part of the plan here because as the kingdom begins, their, their, their control over this territory is going to shrink. And they are the Shadim, the demons of Deuteronomy 32, which is the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, which takes you back to the 70 and the 72, you know, all these things together. So... It, Either the Septuagint reading or the Masoretic text, 70 or 72, it doesn't matter. They both go to the same passage, Genesis 10. They're both part of the same worldview. And the, the difference between them is a textual issue and a, and a decision to either divide or keep together you know, some names in the table of nations. But it, it is kind of interesting because of the pointing. And I, I think it would depend on as well, some of this gets into... Is, th is this before or after Deuteronomy 32? And that takes you into Mosaic authorship, you know, all these sorts of things. So I think that idea deserves a place on the table to think about. But again, I, I, would, I would pull back from saying, you know, using terms like this is the interpretation of that thing over there. So. Thank you. Uh, kind of got two questions. Mm -hmm. One has to do, first of all, with um, Genesis 3. And I love your explanation about who the serpent is. It's one of the best I've, I've seen. The question I have, because you see it as a divine being, right? It starts off by saying, um, now the serpent was more crafty or subtle than any beast of the field. Mm -hmm. So the first, first question is, and I agree with your interpretation, but why does it mention that it's, why does it link it to the beast of the field? I think I think it links it in part because he does come as a serpent, mm -hmm. and you know culturally, it's 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 sort of a concession to this notion that you know the wiles of a serpent that the serpent is smarter and all that stuff. But I, okay. I think there's more to it than that. I think I think that sort of lurking behind that is well, if he's a divine being, he naturally is more crafty than any creature of the field. I mean, of course. Okay. And even, even the cursing, if you tie it into Isaiah 14, you know, I will be like the Most High. I will ascend above the stars of God. Well, actually, what's going to happen to you is you're going to be okay. even beneath the hooves. of the, of the not, not even the thing that crawls on the ground where the other animals can trample on it, but you're even lower than that because right. of the underworld. So I, I think there's, there's some, there's some wordplay going on there to communicate more than one idea. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Okay, the other one I had to do with... Um, the idea of, which I love, as you talked about, God wanting us to participate mm -hmm. with him. And I was thinking about that the first time in sitting here and thinking about Abraham. And I think it's Genesis 18 and the whole issue with Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, because God makes this pronounce, I'm going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, but he talks with Abraham about mm -hmm. it. Is there a connection there of the participating? And while there's no, we don't see a divine council present, but it's almost as if Abraham enters into that council yeah, and talks I, with God about right. it. I, I, don't, I don't read God as being offended by the conversation. I mean, he could have just told Abraham to shut up. Um, but, but he doesn't. And, it, you know, and he knows what Abraham is angling for. I mean, it's God. Okay? He knows you know, what, what's behind the conversation. Um, but he's, I don't see any sense that he's offended by the, by the conversation, the back and forth. Some, yeah, on uh, Jesus' statement in John 10, uh, where they wanted to kill him because he made himself out to be the Son of God or to be equal with God. Uh, I've read your stuff on it. I'm just a little unclear on something. I'm sure it's on my end. Is Jesus referring, when he goes back to Psalm 82, 
is he referring to himself as being the one who is leading the council in that or is it he's saying hey listen there are sons of god and look at what i've done and that that proves that i'm a son of god so what are you upset about or is it neither of you have, i think you have to understand the citation in light of what has come before it and what follows it it's a nice way of saying take it in context <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, look at it. Here, I have it up here. So, you know, Jesus, again, having this discussion about, you know, my Father who's given them to me, again, the, my sheep hear my voice. And then he says in verse 30, I and the Father are one. And the Jews pick up stones again to stone him. So they, I mean, they, they hear this statement. And minimally, they don't like it. But if, 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 if you actually read what kind of the, the specifics of the reaction, uh, and I love Jesus' sarcasm here, you know, Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Oh, it's just hard to pick one out. <laughs> the Jews answered him, it's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. So they interpret this, I and the Father are one, as, as sort of treading on this territory of a claim to deity. And Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? And of course, we know he, he's actually quoting Psalm 82 because it's, it's a word for word quotation. I said, you are gods. And by the way, quoting a psalm using the word law, that, that does happen elsewhere. Uh, in Jewish tradition, the, the, the whole Old Testament sort of became known as the law, you know, give, given to us. But anyway, and you can, you can go track that down at some point. It's a peripheral matter. Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? because I said, I am the Son of God. Now, now, Jesus has linked, I and the Father are one, with I am the Son of God. Of course, he's referred to himself that way in other contexts, so there's a wider context to this too. Now, what, what you'll find if, if you read, I, I have yet to find a commentary on John that doesn't land on the human view of Psalm 82. They will give you other options. But I still haven't found one that, that says you know, anything else that all, you know, Jesus is, is saying that the gods here are the Jews, are the people. And, and they get that by saying, if you look at the phrase, is it not written in your law, I said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came. Oh, oh well, who did the word of God come to? Well, it, it came to the Jews on Sinai. And so they will import the giving of the law, the Sinai event, into this passage. But of course, there is no such thing if you actually go back and look at Psalm 82. Mm -hmm. There's no reference to Sinai there. But that's that's the first way this is going to be argued. You know, it, you know, w without, you know, critiquing the whole thing. What I think Je what, what Jesus is doing here is he says, okay, you know, okay, doesn't it say in your law, and then when he quotes Psalm 82, they know what he's quoting. Okay, again, the, these are the rabbis, they know they're, they basically got it memorized. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, I think what Jesus is saying, okay, in Psalm 82, who were the ones to whom the word of God came? We're not talking about Sinai. We're talking about Psalm 82. The ones who received the word of God, you know, the, the God of Israel, are the other Elohim of the council, the ones that are getting judged. They're the ones that, that the words are directed against. They're the ones who are receiving these words. So if he, if he referred to those guys, okay, God, as gods, and the scripture can't be broken, why, you know, why is it? Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent in the world, you're blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. So prior to the statement, he says, I and the Father are one. After the statement, he has the Father's in me, and I'm in the Father. I mean, I, he's using this equative kind of language again. And I think the reason he quotes Psalm 82 is he says, look, guys, you know 
that there are sons of God in your own scripture who aren't just men. In other words, I think it's the opposite of what commentaries are telling you. You know that there are sons of God out here who are, who are divine. They're divine beings. They're Elohim. They're gods. Okay, right here it is. So, yeah, you know, I've referred to myself as the, as the son of God. And I've said, I and my father are one. And you know, now I've just gotten through saying the father is in me and, I, and I'm in him. So the claim is, when Jesus uses Psalm 82 here, he is inserting himself into the psalm. In other words, I am more than a man. And when I, when I talk about the Son of God, I'm the Son of God, I mean I am more than a man. And there's precedent for that because you have these other sons of God in the Old Testament. But I'm even more than that. Okay, I and the Father are one. The Father is in me, and I am in him. So yeah, on one level... Okay, I can use this phrase to talk about being divine because your own scriptures have sons of God who are divine. That's one level. But I'm going to up the ante and I'm going to equate myself with the Lord of the council, not just a being, a divine being in the council. I'm that, but I'm more. So I think he's actually using Psalm 82 to stick it to them. <laughs> in other words, th th this is Jesus' proof text for these other two things he's saying. So let's go back into Psalm 82. Here's the precedent for this verbiage that you don't like, son of God. Okay, There it is. It's right there. And it's plural. What do you do with that? You know, and it ain't you guys. Okay, So we have that. But he uses that as a proof text to even move beyond it. It's saying, you know, I, I'm God. You know, I'm, I and the Father are one. The Father's in me. I'm in him. You know, this is John. What else has John called Jesus? He's called him the monogenes. Okay. What else has, has Jesus said about himself before Abraham was? I am. I mean, you get all the I am statements. You, you can't, I mean, you, you look at something like here in John 10, you, you know, don't view it in isolation. Jesus has had a few conversations with these guys. There's a history between them. And so you need to take, you need to factor it all in. Because they, they know what he's talking about. They know what he's talking about. I mean, they've already said this is blasphemy. They, they know it. They're not thinking, oh, Jesus, what a funny guy. <laughs> you know, he's saying, I'm just like you guys. You guys get to call yourself sons of God, and so do I. So let's all sing Kumbaya. Okay, they know that's not what he's saying. He's not claiming to be one of them. But that's what you're going to read in commentaries. That's what you're going to read. We'll let, we'll let Gons be the bad guy. <laughs> How do you look at the authorities? Paul said uh, God had established in Rome that believers should submit them to, themselves to against the background of the principalities and powers being rebels from the divine council or Elohim uh, related to the 70 nations. What's the passage again? Um, when Paul said... Um, told believers to um, submit themselves to authorities. Oh, this is Romans 13. Yeah, yeah well, I, since the term, all of these terms, not just this term, you know, let every ESV has be subject to the governing authorities. You know, all of these terms that Paul uses, you know, dominions, powers, principalities, all this stuff, they are either used by Paul or in other Greek texts, you know, for, for normal rulership among people. So, you know, I, I, I'm quite sure that Paul isn't saying, all these bad guys that I've been writing to you and all these other epistles about, they're actually okay. Submit to them. Okay, that isn't what he's doing. I think he is re referring to, again, the, the authorities that they happen to be living under. You know, and, you know, if, if you go through this, it, it's I think it's, you know, the whole idea of bearing not the sword in vain kind of situates it in the human world, you know, the whole capital punishment thing. They're here to, to punish, you know, punish evildoers and reward those who do well, so on and so forth. Taxes, can, there aren't any heavenly taxes in the divine council world as far as I know. There you will escape taxes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the context situates it pretty clearly in the, in the human world, yeah.
Uh, yeah, I had a question. Uh, we really didn't touch on it, but um, as far as our status on imagers, I know in the New Testament it tells us we're to be imitators of Christ because he's ultimate imager. Mm -hmm. Are there any other passages that speak to our responsibility as imagers in the New Testament? Uh, there are. Let's just start with... I, I kind of like this one. 2 Corinthians 3. <clears throat> This isn't a command so much as a statement. You know, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And this is one of these, we could just do a, a quick search, you know, do a little discovery here. But this is one of these passages again that, that, that talks about your, your image destiny. <clears throat> Let's just limit it to Paul here. Since we... Okay. You know, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. I mean, that, that's one, the Romans 8 passage. Um, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we must also bear the image of the man of heaven. Again, that's really referring to the earthly body. But the 2 Corinthians 3 passage actually is a bridge to that because this whole notion of being being transformed in the image of his glory. I don't know if I don't know how many podcast listeners we have here, but we did an episode on on the, the quote unquote spiritual body, which sounds like an oxymoron, you know, from First Corinthians fifteen. But but the body language, the spiritual body language draws on the Old Testament glory language. And in the Old Testament the glory in certain passages is an is the embodied deity. Ezekiel 1. Okay, you can tell it's a human form on the throne. And it's called the glory. You know, it, it's, it's what, you know, scholars like to call it the divine man motif, you know, where God comes as a man. Okay, th this, is, this is the whole idea. So, you know, we are, you know, we're in this body. Our bo we're going to get different bodies. We're going to get bodies made of that glory stuff, that glory body back in Ezekiel 1. But, but ultimately, we're, we're, we're going to be conformed not only to the character of Jesus, because he's, again, this express image idea, but we'll actually become what he is. Again, that's, Paul, that's the whole point of Paul's getting this new body, this, this you know, non-terrestrial body. So again, here, here you have kind of the short list, at least in Paul. We have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Uh, so you get... You know, the, in some cases, I guess you could call them commands. In other cases, it's more or less like, well, here's the point. Here's, here, here's the point of, of sanctification. You know, you become like the ultimate imager. Um, and I hate to make it trite, you know, what would Jesus do? But that, that's, not, that's actually not a bad idea, you know. What would he do? What would he do in this situation? Try to imitate him because he is the ultimate imager. He's the ultimate representative and representation uh, at the same time. Somebody else. I was uh, asked by a friend asked this they had to leave. Um, it's a two-part question. Uh, does the divine council worldview help us to understand and fulfill the Great Commission um, in Matthew 28 and uh, Mark 16, specifically the call to make disciples, uh, the casting out of demons, uh, healing the sick and whatnot? Um, and I, uh, the second part with it. Um, does this worldview speak for, against, um, or have anything to say um, towards the idea of cessationism uh, of the gifts of the operating of the gifts of the spirit? Yeah, I, I don't think per se that it, it endorses one or the other. Uh, certainly, with the Great Commission, you know, the, the Great Commission is is advancing the kingdom of God. It is winning, you know, it is taking people out of darkness. It is releasing them from bondage, their enslavement to the powers that be. In, in a spiritual sense. So that, that part, I think, is, is pretty transparent. You know, since some of these things that are listed here, and if we go down here, uh, whoever believes is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons, speak in new tongues, pick up serpents with their hands, drink deadly poison, blah, 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 you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, the, the question is, well, are we all supposed to do that? The way I answer that is, is when you look up these things, other than the, the, the drinking deadly poison, they all show up. 
um, in other contexts, like in the Book of Acts, and the one about the serpents. A lot of a lot of scholars, and I would be here, think that the the reference to Paul, you know, at Miletus, where he's bitten by the serpent and all that kind of stuff, that that plays off this. I think there's something to that. But when you get when you run across these things in the Pauline epistles, Paul is very clear that not every believer has these gifts. They are distributed by the Spirit to whom He will. And so, I, 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 as much as I can, I like to let Scripture interpret Scripture. And so, I take this back and say, no, you know, this isn't something that every believer is supposed to do. You know, this, this is not a grocery list that we check off in our, our Christian lives. And you know, did we drink poison yet? You know, did we pick up a sin? <laughs> that sort of thing. Because for the, for the very specific reason that that the Spirit decides who and when this involves in the course of, again, the, the Great Commission. Paul's very clear that, that not all believers have every gift. That's the whole point of the body analogy. Uh, so it, it, it's selective. It, it, de- it depends on, again, providence and the Spirit and whatnot. So I don't think it's, a, it's an endorsement of that idea. Um, in, in, the, in the course of the Great Commission, my, my own view is that, again, I, like, I don't like to put the words God and can't into too many sentences. So if God wants to empower someone at a specific time and place to do a specific thing, he will do it. And that's up to him. Uh, I, I think, un- unfortunately, we have... <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm cautiously open to these things, and the caution part comes, again, from the context of Scripture itself. Not that, oh, I hope this never happens, because I don't want to see that, because then that will affect my theology. Um, I'm, I'm not cautious in that respect at all. But, you know, I think unfortunately we have seen the gifts abused so awkwardly and so frequently and frankly so dopily yeah. that we, we lump all these things into that bag. They, get every, they all get filed in that drawer. And, and that has contributed, along with, again, just our, our, our status as modern Westerners, that contributes to our skepticism, which is unfortunate. Again, and I'm, I'm not the one waving the flag to be either overly rational or irrational. Um, I, I think God can do what he wants to do. I mean, we, we need to let, let the door open. And we need to let, you know, let, let the events of providence as they play out in real time be the judge of whether that was real or not. But, but be open to either outcome. I mean, I, I've, I've heard all these stories too, like in Turkey. You know, the guy, the Muslim guy who gets confronted by uh, Jesus in a dream or Jesus in some sort of vision experience and Jesus says, you need to you know, get out of Islam and believe in me and go start a church. And, and, the, and he goes and does it. I mean, at great physical you know, peril. But he actually does it. And out of that comes a, a, a church, you know, and, and, and all, the, all the good and all the bad stuff that will come with a situation like that. But it's like, okay. You know, if, if that's what it takes for God to start the kingdom of God in this place, to prevent it from being extinguished, good. You know, that, that, that's good for God to do. I endorse that. Hope he, wish he would do that more often. And I'm not, I'm not just turning the spigot off there. Because I see some televangelist just act like a moron and, and you know, wants to drive around in a, in a Bentley. I mean, I, I, I know that stuff is there. It's, it's, it's painful to watch. And it, 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 I think ultimately it contributes to, to too much skepticism. But I understand the caution. So I, I, I'm, I'm quite open to, you know, to, to things like this. I know they can happen. And, it, you know, if you believe in, in that God is is who he is and that he has an interest in never letting the thing die, which is, is kind of my view of the church. You know, I, I, I link my thinking of the church to, to Old Testament remnant theology. God, God is committed to it and he will never let it go away. Mm-hmm. He will never let it die. And if he has to intervene in some dramatic way to keep the thing, you know, kick the can down the road, that's what he's going to do. And that's good. God intervened, and Gans has to change a battery, so I take the mic now. <laughs> I think he's afraid I'll just go into interview mode, and that'll be the end. Um, so, And then the end will come. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
there's a small contingency or community of Christians around the world who, at great criticism from the, the church uh, at, at large, who believe that this concept of, um, you know, us as human beings can or will at some point take place uh, or participate within the divine council, um, whatever vocabulary you want to put to that. Um, but this small group of people believe that, you know, it's not necessarily when we die, it's not at the age to come, although it could be for some, most people, um, but you can actually participate now. Um, is there any academic uh, info on that that you yeah, could... I don't, I, don't, I don't see any justification for that, you know, beyond, I mean, when you see the, the real-time human participation in that sort of thing, in the Old Testament, it's always the divine encounter, the call narrative, you know, the, which is the real proof of a prophet. Like, like Jeremiah says, have you stood in the council of God or not? Um, so, I mean, there, there is that thing in biblical literature, but to, to say it today, you have to bring along that baggage. You have to bring along the office of a prophet with divine encounter, which, since we're now transitioned to the New Testament period, you have to bring along the apostolic status as well. And again, I, I, I don't see any, any legitimate argument for Scripture for continuing... <coughs> those kinds of things because what what those were was those were the those were the voice of god for the entire community the entire believing community that's different than god you know giving some christian today some specific word or some you know in a dream or something like you know something really highly individual to direct this person's path you know the old divine you know encounter through a, a guardian angel i mean i believe that stuff happens but if I had a guardian angel experience, my reaction is not going to be, hey, let me show you this experience and explain to you why you ought to obey it and why every Christian ought to obey it. And I'm going to start a ministry around it and make lots of money. And, you know. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. In other words, there's, there's a difference between individual revelation, individual guidance, you know, God intervening in someone's life in, in you know, sort of an overt or, or a way that only they're going to know and making that message highly personal, that direction highly personal, as opposed to binding revelation on the entire believing community from this point on. That's, there's a big difference there. And I, I, see, I see plenty of room for the former, but I don't, I don't really see any scriptural argument for the latter. And you, know, you look at the, the, the council terminology uh, applied to believers, it, it's, it's overtly eschatological and it's repeatedly eschatological and that might mean personal eschatology and when you die okay there are other, pe other people still living here doing their you know their thing okay well you know I, maybe god has some plan you know for me like if you know when i die i get to do something here on earth that i have no idea what it would be you know maybe to come back and pester you <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I don't know you know can can god do that well sure god could do that but what God isn't going to do is he's not going to send Mike back with some binding word of revelation that the entire believing community is supposed to obey and follow. By the way, if that ever happens after I'm dead, you, you, you see me deny it right here. <laughs> so, so disregard that message when it comes. And this is even recorded. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm, I am highly suspicious of stuff like that uh, and, and actually highly critical of it without being too overbearing, I, I hope. I, I just don't see that as part of the picture. With the stipulation of it being highly personal and involving some sort of d divine experience. Yeah I, I, yeah, I certainly think God can do that. I mean, and we all know people, maybe, maybe it happened to you in, in your life at some point. And you know what? Maybe you're, maybe you're parsing it wrong. Maybe you had some experience and you thought God was doing this to that, and that's the way you took it, and it led you to make a really good decision. Or it led you to avoid making a really bad decision. Well, again, under the umbrella of providence, that's a good thing. God could look at you and say, oh, you just kind of missed the boat there. And it's not really what I wanted. But okay, you wound up in the same place. You're okay. Okay, I mean, God's not going to intervene. You take you back to that moment and say, okay, now here we are again. Let's see if you can field this one the right way. I mean, it, it just doesn't, it, you know, life just doesn't work like that. And God doesn't need to do that. So, yeah, I'm, I've never had any, I, I've had what I call 
uh, what I what I would call like certainly providential moments that I I think I think God got kind of a God was humored at my expense <laughs> uh, on a few occasions you know in, in graduate school but I that I really feel that if I had not had this experience it, it, you know I I would have missed the boat in, in some way doing what I was doing I've never had anything you know like X file ish or anything like that but I know people who have you know I, I know pastors who have told me that, hey, I was doing this funeral and the guy I was doing the funerals just showed up and he showed up and he spoke to this person over here and that person really needed that and that was it so we're not going to start a movement I'm not going to write a book okay and and you know start a, a new religion here you know they did I just want to let you know that this happened to me and happened to this person you know. And, I mean, my parents have had one of those. I mean, why would they lie to me? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. So I think God can do all, all that kind of stuff. But I, th I think it's really highly targeted. And, it's, you know, God has his reasons for, for reaching out and permitting certain of those things to happen to people. I had two questions. Mm -hmm. One was kind of playing off what you just said. Is there any scientific um, experiments or validation to any of the supernatural things currently, I guess, continually to go on that you know of? Is there any way to like... It, it's a hard question because as soon as you ask the question and start thinking about the question, you, you run into the, 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 the danger zone and, and, and quite possibly the, the zone of misunderstanding. Uh, that, that is, you, can we speak of the spiritual world as a material thing, okay, because it, it takes you back to, to the question, okay, if God is the only uncreated being, if by definition there's only one of those, that means everything else, including that which populates the spirit world, is made of something, okay? Now, if, if you're going to say that, then there are those, you know, who, who have, who, who don't want to go there, and, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, an instance, I mean, uh, Bill, Bill Craig, William Lane Craig, you probably, some of you have heard of him. You know, we, we've, we've actually chatted about this, and, and Bill was very hesitant to, to go that direction. I think in part, uh, you know, Bill's a philosopher, so I know he's got some philosophical problem with it. But I think in part, he's, he's troubled by the idea because he's afraid it would be used to argue that anything that we talk about in relation to the spiritual world, including God, is really just a material thing that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's the, the, the area of trepidation for him. You know, and and he, would, he would back up to the whole, must be made of something, and Bill would say, no, the spiritual world is different. It's not made of something else. We, we can't speak of it in terms of, of, mater of matter as we understand it. It's it's an altogether it's a category all of its own, and that and that's equally possible too. So going back to your question, there, you know, activities that we would let's let's put it this way: Are there activities that we would associate right or wrong with spiritual activity? Does some of that have any sort of scientific credence to it? The answer to that, depending on what it is, is is a qualified yes. In other words. There, there are studies that, that seem to suggest there's something going on, but it's always something, again, in the material world, even if it's quantum physics or something like that. It's still linked to the material world. So the answer would be a qualified yes, but, but a number of people, not just theologians. I mean, I, I know Christian physicists who, you know, they, they understand what, what the issue is here and, and how to, they have to be really careful. Um, there, there are a number of, of people who don't want to talk about these two things as though they belong together. But it's very easy to do that. You can have that discussion, and it, it's, it's not like an illegitimate discussion, but it's one that you have to realize, you know, even though I can build this argument to make this spiritual thing really part of the material world, here's the kicker. How do I know I'm parsing it correctly? In other words, how do I know that these two things really don't belong together? And what I'm seeing as a correlation is just a coincidence or something that looks like this other thing, but it only looks like this other thing to me because I haven't considered these other things over here that I don't even know about yet. 
so it, it you have to have a lot of caution in that. But I'm I'm obviously interested in it, which is why we we started the, the paranormal thing. We are going to have another episode of that, believe it or not. Um, that, that will happen. We're just having scheduling difficulties, and some people just don't like the topic. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. He didn't like topic number two. Uh, no, but we we will have it because I. It, it's it's real interesting, you know. But it, it it's a discussion that requires you know some caution. You, know, you don't want to you don't want to push it too much because ultimately you don't know. You, know. you don't know if you're parsing it correctly or not. Well, but but it seems like all through Scripture, God is interacting physically with our world, so we should be able to measure it somehow, or. The, the fact the fact that an uncreated God can interact with a created world does not mean that God is measurable and weighable and and all those things that you know you can't put him between the, the tips of a caliper. That's true. Okay, that is that is a conclusion that does not necessarily follow. That's even true. though we can see the path to to why you would ask the question. The second question I had, and this is a very the theological, was. When you're reading this Divine Council worldview, mm -hmm. and it comes to a lot of Reformed theology, especially like Calvinism, mm -hmm. the concept that we are all predestined into this sense that our lives, you know, who we marry or what we do, you know, mm -hmm. if we're a plumber or whatever, is part of a, like part of this cosmic plan, doesn't, I don't think, completely fall in line with this view, which is maybe not a bad thing, but I don't know what your take on that is. Yeah, I, I, I think the only the only theologically coherent notion of oh how do I want to put this? My I think we've fundamentally misunderstood Old Testament election, and I think that that affects our understanding of New Testament election. But I think we also need to understand New Testament election in light of two things. One is the New Covenant which involves the, the coming of the Spirit to take up residence in believers. And the other thing is remnant theology. I think both of those are, are in play when it comes to election thinking, especially when, when we get to the, to the New Testament. So what do I mean by that? Um, you know, typically, in, in, and I, I've, been a, I've been a member in, in two Reformed churches uh, in, in, you know, in the past, you know, not... You know, it's, it's not like it's the remote past. I mean, I'm familiar with, with the tradition. Um, and they invariably use the Old Testament for their election talk of Israel. But there, there are some really deep, significant disconnections here. You know, if you asked a typical person in a Reformed church, was Israel elect? Well, of course. You know, sure. You know, Deuteronomy, this and that. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to get that. Okay. So if they're elect, and, and we're like, we just got done reading Tulip from John Calvin, so the elect are going to persevere. Well, why did you have so many elect people go off and worship Baal and usher in the exile? Because like the exile is hard to miss. <laughs> I mean, that's really hard to miss in the Old Testament. Like it dominates the scene. So if they were elect, how could they become Baal worshippers and cause this thing called the exile? Do we have Baal worshippers in heaven? Well, they don't like that question. <laughs> but that's a serious question. I mean, if you follow the little rabbit trail, that's where you're going. Okay. So again, I don't, I don't think election in the Old Testament had anything to do with salvation. I think there's a disconnection there that, that is assumed by many. Election just referred to you alone of all the people on the earth. Again, Deuteronomy 32 worldview kicking in here. You alone of all the people on the earth, as Yahweh's portion, you alone have access to the truth. You alone have the oracles of God. You alone will know who the true God is. And this true God has, for some reason, really has nothing to do with your attractiveness, has decided to be in covenant relationship with you. And you need to believe that. And if you believe it, your loyalty will show. Your belief will show in the, in the way you are. You won't worship another God. So you either believe it or you don't. Okay, if you believe it, 
Okay, then you're saved, and we do not have Baal worshippers in heaven. If you go off and worship another god, then you don't believe, do you? Okay, so you're eternally secure if you believe. If you don't, you're not. All right, is is just what it's reducible to. So there, there's this heavy disconnect, and then they want to marry that to baptism and the circumcision and all this kind of stuff. And again, circumcision didn't do anything for a person's eternal destiny. It put them into the community where they could have access to the truth. So if you want to practice infant baptism now, that's really how you should articulate it. We're not, you know, this kid isn't getting saved because I'm sprinkling water on him. It's not like kick, you know, moving a little down the path of faith, you know. Circumcision didn't do any of that. It gave you access to the truth. You still have to believe it. And so do your parents. Okay, There's, there are no exceptions to that. You either believe or you don't. But, but again, the way this gets articulated and talked about really creates a lot of confusion, especially in reformed circles. You know, I, I, I've just been in too many conversations where, it's, you know, my, my baby died, or were they elect? You know, well, of course they were elect because we had them baptized. Well, what about Johnny over here? We baptized him and he just went off the rails like big time, you know. And, I mean, he's an atheist now. I mean, all these real life scenarios. And, and it, it creates real consternation and real I mean, people are really troubled by it because they connect all these ideas. And that's just the way they're taught to think about these ideas. And when you get to the New Testament, you have, you have this as a backdrop, but now you have some different things under the picture. God has decided he would preserve a remnant and also bring back the nations. And to make sure the thing never dies, okay, now he's, you know, the, the sort of the ace in the hole here is the spirit. The spirit is going to come up and reside in you to, to help you resist apostasy, to help you believe, to help you go down the path and reach the end that you know is ultimately based on your faith. You have more assistance now than, than somebody else did, and God's doing that, again, as part of remnant thinking, remnant theology. I am never going to let it die. There is no plan B. So that, that's a little bit different than what it was in the old. So you got a little sameness, you got a little difference there. But... You know, we, we tend to, again, just, we, we tend to build doctrines just on terms, you know, with, without kind of, you know, meandering off into, into some of these larger concepts that the terms plug into. And I think that's kind of the disconnect. You know, we, we run into problems there. So I don't have a problem with the notion of election, but I talk about it differently than, you know, lots of other people would. But I, you know, I have reasons for doing that. It's not that I just don't like Calvinists or I love Arminians or so. I don't, I don't care about the labels, which infuriates people. Okay, I, as I'm sure you can well imagine. I mean, it, it, because labels are are nice for people because they, they, they help people decide if they want to talk to you anymore or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they do. That's what they do. Well, I know I can turn you off now. You know, there, there goes the volume. It, it, People like them because they, they just they help they help them filter you in or out. <laughs> so if you resist that, it's just infuriating. <laughs> uh, who's next? Yeah. Wanted to shift back to uh, cosmic geography. Really appreciated your uh, discussion of uh, Mount Hermon and the rock and kind of the establishment of the church there. First time I'd heard that. Really really enjoyed it. Um, wanted to see if you could kind of bring it around to the eschatological view of Jerusalem and of Mystery Babylon and kind of discuss what the cosmic geography is there uh, for those two either cities or places or notions. Yeah, I think, I think that Jerusalem uh, does have a, a, an important earthly role in the eschaton. Again, I, I don't like any of the traditional terms, you know, because they're... I, there's just something that bugs me about all of them. <laughs> just you know, being being honest here. I mean, I I think that that uh, of course you know the, the Lord will return. We are going to have a literal kingdom on earth. I don't like the word millennium because it's too short. Uh, I I look I look at the earthly rule as the new earth, the, the global Eden. I think all that imagery is deliberate. It's not just limited to a thousand years. Uh, so I'm, you know, that doesn't really put me neatly into either the amillennial or the, you know, the premillennial camp. But again, that's okay. 
Uh, Jerusalem, I think, has an important role with this because it is the cosmic mountain. It is the place. It is Yahweh's abode. It is the place of, of, of counsel. And this is what Armageddon actually means. If, if, you know, those of you who have read the book you know, know this. But you know, John tells you Armageddon, this is in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. In Greek, it's Har-Mageddon. Okay, well, if it's a Hebrew term, Har means mountain. And that in turn means that we can't be talking about Megiddo because there ain't no mountain at Megiddo. It's flat. The only hill you're going to have at Megiddo is the city, what's left of it, overgrown with grass and a few weeds. Okay, There is no mountain. And, and it, the, the erroneous assumption there is M, G, and D must re- correspond to Mem, Gimel, Dalet in Hebrew. Well, there's actually another consonant that gets pronounced like a G, the, in Hebrew. Gamora is not spelled with a Gimel. Okay, it's spelled with Ryan. So, M, Mem, Ryan, Dalet, that is a word. Har Moed is the Mount of Assembly. It's from Isaiah 14. It's the place of the Divine Council. It is the place that Halal ben Shakar said, I want to rule. That's where the stars of El are. I will be like the Most High. All of that's pretty important when it comes to eschatology. So what Armageddon is, is, is a battle over the, over the throne. It's, it's the winner take all for all the marbles, final conflict. And that is Jerusalem. So I think that has a real important role to play. Now, this, the Babylon thing, you know, how many times have I, have I said the word Babylon today? A lot. There's this thing about Babylon. Now, you can argue, okay, the thing about Babylon is... You know, there's this apostate religion, there's Marduk, there's Bel, there's Baal. You know, they all you know, kind of six of one, half dozen of another. And there's a lot of truth to that. You know, who, whoever gets to sort of, you know, play the role of the, of the, great, the great adversary, the Satan figure. You know, and you, and you can make an argument for all these things. Um, you know, Baal, we got the Lord of the Dead and, and all this. You, you can find connection points to all of them. I, I tend to think that that Babylon is representative of all of that. So, you know, the amillennialist, the, 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 the premillennialist would cheer about what I've just said up to this point and say, well, we got to get him to a thousand years and cut that off and then throw something else in there and then he can have his new earth and, you know, all that. Well, that, the amillennialist would, would cheer when, when I say something like, I think the Babel language is really about cosmic evil, just as, as you know, the, the Zion language is cosmic, you know, goodness, cosmic, cosmic righteousness. I think this is ultimate good and evil language in a face-off together. But that is not to deny that th- these events take place on Earth. It's not to deny that there's going to be this person who spearheads, who is, who is the, the, the pawn in all this that we like to call the Antichrist. Um, I, don't, I don't see any reason for denying those things and having events play out on Earth. I'm a big believer in the answer is yes. Is it, is it a spiritual, cosmic, non-earthly battle between good and evil, or do, do things play out on earth? The answer is yes. Okay, as in heaven, so on earth. As in the spirit world, so in this world. They are linked together. I think that is the consistent pattern. How that plays out, I don't know. Okay, I, I know some pieces. I think, that, I think we can get some pieces out of, out of that. But my view of eschatology is that just as it, it, was, it was intentionally cryptic before, I don't see any reason to think it ain't going to be that way now. So if, if you want to you know, spend weeks and years you know, of your life doing eschatology, if that keeps you in a good relationship with the Lord, if that keeps you in your Bible, okay. I mean, you're, you're, you're missing lots of other cool stuff, but okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll give that the thumbs up. You're still in, you're still in the game. But... You know, you are going to miss a lot. And I, I think an obsession with eschatology is a waste of time. But if that's what you need to, to stay at the table, I'm, 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 I'm cool with that. It's just I'm not there. Because I, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with saying, I don't have any idea how this is going to play out. And I don't think I'm supposed to. I will not be doing things like setting dates. Like in the poor tent, I actually deliberately avoid that. That's intentional. Because I, one of my favorite New Testament subjects is astral prophecy. There's something to that because it's you can find that in Scripture. Okay, 
I'm not where Bollinger was. I'm not where Sice was. I'm not even where D. James, D. James Kennedy was, okay, <laughs> if you know him. But there's something going on there. You know, and Paul actually does quote Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and their voice goes throughout all the land. As, a, as his proof text for everyone should know about, you know, that Jesus has come, he actually does that. And I think there is something going on in Revelation 12. But all of that, you know, when I, when I put that into a novel, I know I'm going to get the question, well, when do all these patterns repeat? Do they ever repeat exactly? Have they ever repeated again? You know, the answer is no, they, they, they haven't ever repeated again, but they will. So... I mean, I, I can tell you the date, but here's what I'll also tell you. There isn't a verse in the New Testament that says it matters. I mean, there, there is no verse that says we're supposed to look for a repetition of this pattern in association with the second coming. Oh, what about the sign of the Son of Man? Well, great, great, I know that verse. Guess what? Nobody ever defines the sign of the Son of Man. So you're guessing. And I'm, I'm just not going to guess about stuff like that because I know what people will do with it. You know, again, if, I'm, I'm just a miserable cult leader. You know, what can I say? <laughs> I, 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 I was called a cult leader last week, so I'm, I'm, that's kind of, I'm, I'm riffing on that a little bit. It's like, I don't have a harem. I don't have any money. It's like, you know, I won't set dates. It's like, I'm just so inept, you know, when it comes to, what was that? Some, some man of the cloth. Yeah, yeah, so, so. I kind of liked it. It's better than disinformation agent. You know, just, <laughs> It's, I'm moving up the ladder. You know, it's just, it's, I'll be in the Illuminati next. So, so, okay. right. Who's next? Okay, uh, I'll, with, I'll know I've made it when I'm called an Illuminati member. <laughs> so speaking in tongues, where does that fit, or is that even does that still apply to this day? Hey, the way the way I I look at that. That actually has an Old Testament, you know, attachment. If you actually go look in 1 Corinthians 14 when Paul talks about it, he guess, he, he, guess what he does? Drum roll, please. He quotes the Old Testament. Okay. Silly Paul. Um, yeah, and he quotes a passage about, you know, people being able to speak the languages of the Gentiles. You know, the, it's part of the, the whole gospel thing, you know. And, and we see that play out in Acts and, and whatnot. So on the one hand, I, I view that as something very um, very tied to Old Testament thinking, very tied to the reclaiming of the nations, very tied to the New Testament period because of all those things. Um, I, I do not, you know, you know the, the whole speaking in tongues, again, as we sort of experience it or, or, or see it on TV or whatever, like, I don't put any credence in that. But I, I'm open to the, to the notion that if the conditions of the first century are present, where God needs to enable someone to speak in another language to again ignite the kingdom of God in this place, He is perf He has my permission to do that. Okay, I'm not standing in the way there. Now, some you know people wonder about you know the, the whole the whole prayer language thing, and I I have friends who that that's their when they think and talk about tongues that's their frame of reference for it. I I personally I I don't. Again, this is just me. I'm I'm kind of analytical. You know, I look at that and I think, you know, I, I, I don't understand why you would need that because you don't understand the language and God doesn't need the other language. So like, what, what's going on here? But at the end of the day, I don't really care because if, if, if that person, you know, I don't think they're sinning or they're going off into apostasy or anything like that. If, if that person, if that, that's part of their spiritual discipline, their spiritual life, and it, it really helps them draw close to God, fine. Okay, I, I, I don't claim to understand it. Uh, so, but when I think of known languages and tongues, that's how I think of it. I frame it in the way it happens in the New Testament, in that context, connected to the old. But if God wants to do that again, if conditions are the same, I'm not standing in the way. God doesn't need my permission to do that. And he doesn't need the permission of any other cessationist either. God's going to do what he wants. Okay, it's, it's up to him to get the job done. If that's part of it, fine. And this is more on the comical side. Uh, if if God made a rock so big, uh, could he break it? 
God is not going to do things inconsistent with his. See, that's the old theological answer there, right? You know, he's, he's not going to waste his time doing things that are inconsistent with his nature. So God would consider that absurd. So in other words, he wouldn't waste his time. So, yeah, he doesn't need to show off. <laughs> So uh, relative to your soteriology, um, do you think that uh, Solomon went to heaven? <clears throat> well, if, you know, it, some of it depends on, I mean, his, his heart did go after other gods. So that the question depends on, was Solomon repentant, you know, at the end of his life? Did he, did he come back and deny those other gods and, you know, affirm his loyalty, exclusive loyalty to the God of Israel? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know in the Old Testament that there's a whole lot to hang that on. I think there are there are some things you could hang it on. If you assign, for instance, the authorship of Ecclesiastes to Solomon, you know, Kohelet. I think there are some things you could draw from that that would sort of be an awakening again for Solomon at the end of the book. This is the this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. The God of Israel keep his commandments. So if that's Solomon at the end of his life, I'd say, yeah, you know, he, he denied other gods and he, he chose ultimately to who he was going to align himself with. Uh, he, he came back to the faith. Uh, I don't I don't know that uh, as, as a fact, but I, I lean that way. Um, but I, I, I would never say I know with absolute certainty. Okay. But I lean that way. So you would assume that if he didn't come back, that he would not there have are, gone to heaven? There are no Baal worshippers in heaven. I mean, you, 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 can't, you can't deny the God of Israel and expect to be in relationship with the God of Israel. Along the same line that he asked, if I may, is that uh, there's someone, who, uh, there's a famous uh, t-shirt saying that those who receive the mark of the beast can repent and still be saved. What do you think of that? <coughs> I don't, I don't see any indication of, a, <clears throat> of an open invitation to those people. I mean, take, taking the mark, of course, if it's going back to the name theology stuff that we talked about. There, there's a reason why um, people on both sides are, des are described as having the name. Okay, they don't just have the mark of the beast. Okay, they, it's, it's a name. I mean, it's, it's, it's the name of a man, you know, this kind of thing. So they are marked with that name as opposed to believers being, you know, those who name the name of Christ. Again, you, you get this name thinking going on, which has to do with, again, with not only, again, who, who you assign your loyalty to, but in that particular passage, it, it looks like a, it looks like a permanentized Kind of situation. In other words, I don't see any part of the passage that says you could you could deny the name. You could. Oh, I don't want this anymore. You know. And, and again, we, we have these little these little snippets. I, I tend to think it's it's the language of Revelation, sort of outlining the two sides and who's on the two sides. And I don't I don't see the writer intending to entertain the question of can you switch teams. Uh, I just don't see that in, in the picture. Now, d does that mean that they can't switch teams? I don't know because we're not told. It looks like you can't switch teams, but do I do I know that with 100% certainty? Well, you know, I don't know. I, th I think if you know if you if push came to shove, I would say that's who you are. You know, that, 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 that's what you got. But you know, I have to be honest with you and say. I don't know that that, that that situation is even addressed or spelled out, so I wouldn't teach anything about it. Um, I, I just need to ha have more than that to hang my hat on. Um, you know, the, the, the whole, we, we tend to, I think part of the problem is we tend to overly literalize you know, Revelation, where you know, we, and, and we skip things that, that sort of should telegraph to us that again, the, the two alternatives are not literal or not literal. 
the alternatives are literal, not literal, or more than literal. Something that transcends literalism, but is still real. And, and I think in, in our, especially evangelical circles, we have this, this propensity to, to think that something that you might interpret non-literally, that, that you're saying it isn't real. You might be saying it's actually more real than this sort of flesh and blood, space and time situation. And I, th I think in a number of these instances in Revelation, you, you, you're dealing with apocalyptic language that is designed to draw lines and, and have a cast of characters, good versus evil, and to try to extrapolate precise theological questions and answers from that, I think is... is it could be dangerous, but I don't, I don't want to use the D word.